Hey everybody, welcome to the Canada vs. Uruguay watch along show from the AT&T 5G virtual studios. I am David Goss and when you are watching Canada, there's only two legends you want to be around. Kalen Carr himself and Le Capitan, Patrice Bernier alongside us for this one. It is going to be a fantastic day of international soccer. We are here with you on the MLS Twitch and YouTube page for the entire Canada game all the way through. So jump in the chat, ask us questions, talk to us whatever you want us to talk about. And then, right when the Canada game ends, we will roll straight over to the USA-Saudi Arabia game. Susanna Collins, Charlie Davies, and Tom Bogart will have that one for you right here on the MLS YouTube and Twitch page. So you don't have to go anywhere for that game as well. I love international soccer. This is a feast for me. It is a great day. So I'm glad that you are all out there watching with us. And I'm glad you two are here alongside us as well. The second game of this window for both these national teams. The final game before the World Cup rosters will be set. Patrice for Canada. It'll be the first time on the men's side in 36 years. 2-0 win against Qatar last Friday. Now a few days out. How do you feel about that game? How do you feel about this team? Oh, it's a confident win. I think Canada, you know, they deserve it. It was uh, an opponent that kind of had no choice to play, if you could say, because for one, playing European teams to the standard of Belgium or Croatia would have been impossible because they're all involved in Nations League. But for Canada, they needed they needed that the confidence and the continuity of performance against against teams that are not in CONCACAF because they've been well to qualify but the last two years and a half have only been against regional teams. Now mm. it's playing another opponent that brought different realities into the game and they did quite well. It could have been four or five had the goalie of Qatar played well and and uh, and the guys miss out some chances, but uh, I would say for quite some time it would have been a, a good result, good confidence for guys like Larian, who has, is not playing right now regularly in Bruges, and Jonathan David always scoring goals. But uh, yeah, definitely a good uh, benchmark for the first game against a non-Concacaf opponent. Yeah, and they came out strong, right? They got off to a good start, so we'll be seeing what type of posture they take today. Um, but this will be a different test, right? And we, we've seen Canada for, for so long do um, so well in the region and, and really shocked the region um, uh, going through and finishing top of the group qualifying. But even Herdman has talked about this next step and having to take on bigger tests for the program. And this is going to be a big one today, Uruguay. I mean, just... You go through the lineup, and I'm sure we will in a second, but just uh, Darwin Nunez, uh, Luis Suarez, Betancourt, Valverde. I mean, there's just a wealth of talent here, um, and th that's no disrespect to Canada. They they've got a bunch of talent going as well, too, and none bigger than, of course, Alfonso Davies, who, Patrice, I want to get some stories from you because I know you guys were roommates <laughs> on the road in the past. So, uh, But, yeah, it, this is going to be a big test, and I think a, a big opportunity to test themselves um, leading up towards this this final stretch before the world cup so Canada yeah. talks about the uruguay starting lineup. patrice let's just throw up the uh, canada starting lineup and continue yeah yeah as you said you know, like they played qatar which is, was a different test but canada still dominated and i didn't feel qatar really threatened defensively and the biggest part for me for canada is i know offensively we all know they'll be able to create chances mm -hmm. but will the defense be able to manage top of the line players because Belgium, you have Lukaku, Kevin De Bruyne. And even if you look at Croatia, you still have players like Luka Modric who can unlock the, the uh, situations. So for Canada, this test, Uruguay, number 13 in the world, you mentioned it. You have Nunes up front. You have Valverde in the midfield. These guys are high-end players that could change things on a spur in a game. And Canada... Uh, to be honest, hasn't faced that because in CONCACAF, which number nine is really worldwide or a prominent scorer or, or offensive players, even though the U.S. is a good team off offensively, let's say they're missing a number nine and Mexico was good, but not as threatening as before. So Canada's facing something for the defense part that they probably will have not faced in a very long time. And it'll be a good challenge to see how they fare defensively and how David's David or Laren are able to create against maybe better defenders, or at least Uruguay has always been known for tough-nosed defenders and counterattack. So it'll be interesting to see the matchup. And Luis Suarez may be older, but he's still cunning around the box. So it'll be interesting to see how Miller, Vittoria, and Johnson 
or able to handle a player of that stature. Uh, shout out to Mom Sore Pop Check in the chat. He's got class for the game, but coming in here for the 15 minute pregame, we appreciate that. Uh, and shout out to Maryland. Rob Soccer in the Twitch chat asked us to do that. My wife's from only Maryland, Montgomery County in the house. I don't know anything else about Maryland besides that. Uh, we do have the starting lineup up here. Patrice, it was, it was put out as a list. So this is what myself and Anders sort of tried to piece together. Do you agree with where everyone's put? And what do you think of what John Herdman's decided to go with here? Yeah, I think Le Alfonso will probably be on the left and Larine and David are like central and uh, on, the, to, on to the right. But they have a little bit of freedom to m move around a bit in those positions because you'll see David maybe come inside the pockets and try to com combine with Piet or Estacchio around the sides with Laria. But mostly that's the lineup. Uh, at the back, things haven't changed. Vitor, Johnson, and Miller have been a mainstay. The the trio really works well together, and they, they've they been difficult to beat, uh, as Canada has proven in CONCACAF regional and uh, qualifiers. And now you we all know that there's been some players that are missing. In the midfield, Piet Ostakio. Ostakio playing at Porto now, playing Champions League. His game will... Uh, will he's all been, I, one of my favorites on the national team, and I think now that he's playing prominent high-level football, It'll be nice to see where his game level raises in the next few weeks leading up to the World Cup. And uh, from last week, uh, I mean, last Friday, you have Lario on the right where Hoylet was. And those are positions where Buchanan used to play. And you usually, I think, Herbin preferred a offensive-minded player that could maneuver that whole flank. But now he's got a team that you could say in a certain extent is five defenders uh, compared to usually it's been four. And uh, so, yeah, the lineup's pretty clear. Like I said, Davies probably operates a bit more on the, that left flank with Sam Adekube, but they can move him, Larin, and David because they try to be a, a havoc and, and unpredictable for defenses to, to find ways to score. Kalen, what are you most focused on? Uh, for anyone out there wondering, uh, Scott Kennedy was tweeted out as the starting center back. It was then corrected to Steven Vittoria, so that's why we have that in there. Uh, but, Ken, what are you sort of focused on when you look at this lineup and when you first saw it come out? Well, if it does come down to more of a, a five in the back um, and playing a little bit more defensive, which I think would make sense against um, a Uruguayan team that ha has so many weapons moving forward. Um, if you see Larea and you see Atacube sitting back a little bit, the thing about this Canada team is just with those three, they can get out and transition and and really hurt you. And I think especially when you talk about the way that Patrice was saying, you know, these players might interchange or move positions and it's hard to keep track of. I mean, if you get uh, these guys in open space, you can see what damage they can do. And, and that might be the chance or two that I think they're going to get those no matter who they're playing against. Um, and I think the more and more, even if they get back, sit back a little bit and take a defensive posture um, and they have to go out on the counter, that might be what we see them do when, when we see them in the world cup. Um, Cause there are going to be times. So when you think of the likes of who they're going to play against with Belgium or Kuwait, Croatia, or even Morocco, um, where you might have to take a bit more of a defensive posture and then take your opportunities with uh, Alfonso Davies in open space, which is, for me, that's still a good bet. Um, and I, I think this candidate team can do more with the ball. I mean, maybe we see Tejan come in later in the game. He seems to be rounding into health now, which is positive. Um, and then the other place to watch is the middle and midfield. And Patrice, I want to ask you about that um, because – Right now, we, we saw Piet play well in this last match, um, but there's no Atiba Hutchinson, and Jonathan Osorio is still injured as well. Um, when you look at that middle of midfield there behind Davies, um, how important are, are is that foundation and to protect that back line um, and then also to help try and get the ball and, and progress it um, in transition? Yeah, yeah Sam Piet is a solid uh, filling, if you could say, for Atiba Hutchinson, not the same players. We all know Atiba is quality. Sam, we know him from MLS, very defensively sound, recovery, plays the ball, good passing options. Uh, maybe not as offensive minded as an Atiba, but Atiba is still older and tends to stay more in the midfield to cover. So it's a good balance. But you said it, it's thin now because we've brought they've brought in Ismail Kone this time around. Uh, he's already been through the qualifiers. He's young, he's prominent profile, but is he ready to play 90 minutes? Not yet. So Sam Piet is the trustworthy that John Herdman likes, and he's shown it 
in the past. In the last two years and a half, John Herman in his midfield, Samuel Pitt plays a role. Now, what's happening with Tebow Hutchinson? Yes, he was injured, but uh, now he's feeling good and he's in the process of getting fit. Uh, getting that, he got that contract with Besiktas. His training, getting those games. He still has several weeks to get to match fitness and to be ready. So even if he doesn't play, he's 38. He's got experience. You just want him to be fresh and healthy for the World Cup. And I do believe that uh, part of the staff, the medical staff, will be heading to Istanbul to follow up with him to make sure that he is at his best and that uh, his process of coming back, rehab, is followed and that he's ready for the World Cup stage. Now, Jonathan Ozora, that's another question mark because he's in Toronto. And uh, he was on the list at the beginning to be part of this group. Mm -hmm. And then it was mentioned that he wasn't part of the group, uh, that his, uh, I think it's a dysfunctional neurologic problem that he has. Hopefully, he gets rid of that. It doesn't seem serious, but you know, Kellen, we've played sometimes little nimbly injuries take longer sometimes than uh, most common injuries that we know, and we know exactly how many weeks you're going to be out. This, he's been out for a few weeks now. So how long is it going to take? The good thing is they're not. there's two games left in the terms of the season for Toronto. So does he need to play them? No. So he can rest and prepare, but we don't know his time frame. It's not been mentioned, oh, yeah, he'll be back in two weeks or three weeks. So those are, for him, that's a question mark that we can't answer right now. While Atiba... I can say that he's on track to be there for the World Cup. Uh, will be totally fit, but he'll be fresh. And he's 38, so the experience will, will play a bigger role than if you could say how far the legs can, uh, can run. Uh, so those are good things. But you need a Samuel Piet, and you probably need a Ismail Kone to prove that he can step in during games. I don't see him being a starter, but he could be that fresh player that comes in and who's young, uh, audacious, and maybe turn things around because we've seen in MLS when he's on offensively, he can do things with the ball. He's a different profile from all the other midfielders because Ostakio, Piet, Atiba, they're passers. But uh, Kone, he, he can dribble. He can run with the ball. He can provoke offensively. So that's a player that I wouldn't be surprised we see more minutes from him today. Or uh, we, he runs into the 26th man for the final roster because, like you mentioned, it's a thin list in terms of the midfield right now. Uh, Ismael Kone growing in confidence. We have the Canada lineup up there. Let's throw the Uruguay lineup up uh, before we get this game kicked off. Just about a minute or so to go uh, before kickoff in Bratislava. Uh, a get, reminder, we will not be showing you the game here. We are watching with you. So you got to go find that game. One soccer up in Canada. Fox the Port is here in the U.S. as well. That's that Uruguay lineup. We've talked about it a couple of times. There's a couple Champions League winners in there. I don't think that's very good. Uh, arguably the most expensive striker on the planet in there as well. I don't know how good that is. But, uh, Kaylin, you mentioned this this jumping quality. Uh, Martin Caceres of the LA Galaxy shows you that quality in this team, but this is a, a pretty loaded squad for Uruguay, even missing some some key faces. Yeah, I mean, uh, that speaks to just, you know, I mean, this is a team that I think would expect um, and has ambitions to go deep into the tournament and has the potential to do that. Um, and you look at the, yeah, it's, it's hard. I, I tend to start in the back, but it's hard with this lineup not to start at the front. And you look at uh, Nunez and, and Luis Suarez, and I, I think, you know, Patrice was mentioning this idea of this guy that's like bursting onto the scenes and Nunez, who's, um, you know, now, now at Liverpool. And then you see, um, Suarez, who, yeah, is older, but has, you know, lethal qualities still, um, the way he moves and is able to kind of find space. And then if you give him an opportunity, um, so I, you go into the middle, Betancourt, Valverde, I'm just so many good players. Um, and I think this is the right test for Canada. Um, because when you look at Belgium or when you look at Croatia and you're going to go against players like Luka Modric, or you're going to go against, uh, Kevin De Bruyne and all these stars, you need to have a little bit more experience. That's a different proposition than playing in even the last uh you know matchups where they're playing against honduras or they're going and playing in Concacaf, and they've gone through that test and they've passed with flying colors um but there's this is a different question being asked of, of what do you do when you don't have the ball maybe or how do you how do you have to limit opportunities and i think that back line is definitely going to be asked questions today but if you go into the opening match of the world cup and you look back and you remember going against Nunez and Suarez and you were able to find some success or limit mm -hmm. them, that's going to give this 
relatively inexperienced Canada team, at least at this stage, um, a lot of confidence heading into the World Cup. So I think the, I think that's partly why we haven't seen a ton of changes from Herdman um, from last game to this one. And he stuck with this group to say, all right, the last one's preparation, pass that test. It's a World Cup team. Now you're going against a team that's going to maybe challenge uh, to go deep into the tournament. All right, so everyone watching out there, as I said, we are not showing the game. We're watching along with you. But if you want to get your timing clean with ours so you can react with us, we just kicked off uh, in that exact moment. So we are into the fourth second of action on my stream, which I have been told is God and law. And all of you can follow exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> Canada in their all black kits, which is a tight look. And Uruguay, of course, in the sky blue, which is one of the most famous looks in the world. Uh, Patrice, I did a little pregame this morning about this game, and it just feels like the win over Qatar, uh, while we could expect it, was important because we hadn't seen it yet. If Canada gets a result here today, it just feels like the reality of the whole country, all fans, as well as this team, would be on a whole different level going into the World Cup. Yeah, because you all know everybody said, okay, Canada qualified. Great. But some people said, who do we play? except for USA and Mexico, because a lot of people denigrate a bit CONCACAF region being tough to qualify from, but you don't really play against the top 10, top 15 teams. And now you want to see when you're playing against Uruguay, Suarez, maybe older, but still, you can find the back of the net. And Nunez, up and coming town in Liverpool, Valverde in midfield. And Uruguay, they've been there before. They have World Cup experience. They've gone to almost the, the final four. Uh, so for now for Canadian, the group itself, Canada, they want to measure themselves because their confidence is high. They've qualified. They've beat Qatar. They, they have the belief that they can go out there and play against anybody. But this is a solid test to say we can. Or what, what do we need to adjust playing against a higher level team? I compare Uruguay to Croatia. Not exactly the mm -hmm. same team, but I mean in a low block. I don't expect Uruguay to go out there and press Canada because they want to stay compact, manage the ball towards the midfield, and then expose with the, the speed they have with those types of players. And let's not forget, Cavani is not even here because he just signed and he's in La Liga. So he's another prominent player that they have that they're not utilizing right now. So for Canada, the country watching, definitely it's going to say, where do we measure versus those teams that are maybe not – Brazil and France, the ones that are favorite, but they're in that group of teams that should go to the second round and maybe go far and have the talent on paper. And Uruguay, let's not forget, they've won a World Cup. Like in terms of yeah. countries, they're part of those countries who have that star in their jersey. And they've had top players because they've had Diego Forlan in the past. We remember 2010 when Luis Suarez put that hand against Ghana. Everybody thought oh, it's over and it ended up being a, the smartest move and then they went in on further. <laughs> so, so this is for Canada. It's a true test because it's Uruguay. And it's 13th of the world. And for a reason. Because they're able in South America to perform right below the Argentina and the Brazil. And to manage themselves against prominent other talents that are in Europe or across the world. So for Canada, it's a big test. And it will answer some questions or maybe put some uh, exclamation points. Uh, or uh, so question marks in different areas where we thought we were great and maybe we need to fine tune things. So uh, this just will be able to show them where are you in that ladder between where you're top 40 and closer to, you know, the top 15 or closer to the 15 and 20, 25 ish teams that are ranked in the world. For both of you, because you've both been in places. Most of us have never, when you take that step up, you know, college to pro, pro to Champions League, European, international, whatever it is, what are the big differences in the game? Like what is an Alistair Johnson and Kamal Miller who have never played players probably like this? What is What are they going to notice first? What's sort of that experience? Oh, if I have to add on, having played internationally when you, and I got the chance to play Spain, Brazil. I played Czech Republic when they were number four in the world. And you realize the execution. Those guys are, they're, they're, you know, technically sound. They rarely make a mistake. And when you do make a mistake, you get punished quickly. It's not two or three or four when you're, you know, when you play MLS or club level, when sometimes 
a mistake is either a, a, taken upon by a defender or the goalie makes a save. This a Luis Suarez, you give him half a chance, he'll pull, he'll pull it back to the net. Uh, so mm-hmm. I would say the level of execution, how fast they see the game and the connections can be made. Uh, and uh, and the, those first few steps, not necessarily speed, is speed of execution and speed of thought. Usually uh, I realize that much faster when you play uh, at the international stage and against these high-level teams. Anyone yeah, watching, you can see Kamal Miller not scared, uh, debating that <laughs> foul with Luis Suarez right now, not happy with it at all. Continue, Kalen. No, I was just going to say, I, when I was 21, I went to, uh, I trained at Arsenal for two weeks and then went to Club Bruges, um, which is, uh, you know, where Tayshawn Buchanan and, and Kyle Lahren are at. And just like being in, in those environments and the pressure around them, and this was just in preseasons, um, it, it, it does make you raise your level. And I think we've seen oh, sometimes no. you, uh, what happened? Goal for Uruguay, direct off the free kick. Yeah. Oh, can't give them those Milan. chances. Then. Yeah, I Milan just found out I'm near a post. two seconds behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Kalen, I gave you the time when to set on. I was like, I was like, yeah, I was at Club Bruges. You're like, oh no, and I was like, what's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh, Nicolas de la Cruz goal. Uh, and That's tough. yeah, That's tough because you you want to put in a good challenge, and Kamal Miller goes in hard, but it's a it's a lesson that the quality is exactly, we talked about the margins where you normally think, okay, I make a tackle like that. Mm-hmm. I'm setting the tone, but on top of your box, you realize everything is a goal scoring opportunity with the quality of players around. So um, that's a tough lesson this early in a match. And uh, wow, that you took that well. So Kyle Laren picked up a yellow card off of it. As Patrice said, execution at this level for anyone. We know there's some issues with one soccer right now. Who's having trouble. Uh, free kick from the top of the box to the right side, right 20 yards out, uh, curled over the wall around the right side into the top corner past Milan Borjan, who was probably a step off because he thought the wall would be able to block that. Uh, so a gorgeous free kick there for De La Cruz playing down, I believe, in Argentina right now. And um, and uh, 1-0 lead for Uruguay. Kyle Laren picking up a yellow card off the end of that. He's also in a debate with Luis Suarez, so... It feels like there's already some tenacity to this game and physicality, as we said. Uh, Canada coming out looking fairly confident. Patrice, they pressed their numbers high when Uruguay's had it in the back, but not an ideal moment there for Kamal Miller or Boryan. No, you, like you, see, you mentioned it. Of course, Canada's going to show that, you know, put pressure, try to see what Uruguay is going to be able to do. Uh, you're going to see that, you know, it's a higher level team. They'll be able to come out of certain situations where Canada maybe had success in terms of press. And you, uh, we've mentioned it. Free kicks, corners, those fine details. That's what at the, <clears throat> the next level, pardon, you're going to see the difference, the margin, that you can't allow something around the 18-yard box. Don't forget, they're going to play Belgium. Kevin De Bruyne, one of the yeah. best servers of the ball, free kicks, uh, free kick specialists. And crossers of the ball, so because when he finds those pockets on the sides, he likes to whip that bin. And you're going to have Lukaku inside the box, big man post up, or you're going to be able to manage that. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, we, we've just mentioned it witnesses that you're playing Uruguay and just a little, little, little margin of hope for Uruguay. They made it. They made it happen. And now Canada, we'll see how they manage because now it's you're down 1-0. How can you uh, come back? into the into the scheme and uh, and stay composed i think this is where i'm going to see interesting of canada not over zealous and trying to compensate and trying to get the the draw right. of the one one right away uh shout out to all of you in the youtube and twitch chats uh, we appreciate you joining us Anders mentioned which i didn't even think of that if you have anything you'd like to say in french because we are of course bilingual here yeah, go in ahead. canada uh patrice can translate for us because i cannot as alfonso davies goes knifing into the box here um so and any questions or any comments that you have any thoughts you have the uruguay fans came out hard right when we opened the chat and then they showed up just again uh, a moment ago <laughs> after going up one zero so it's good to see that they're feeling good uh this morning as canada knocks it around patrice you mentioned it uh, you don't want to all of a sudden need to get it back all in one here 
to get it back to one, one, but for this team, this is a step they haven't had, right? They haven't really been behind in games over the last three years in general. So we're going to learn a lot watching this team now react to adversity. Yeah, definitely. Like you mentioned, They've always been on that front foot in terms of in CONCACAF and usually having the lead. There's games where they came back. They they were, in turn, but most of the time, they were in the uh, the driver's seat. They were under, under control. Now, yeah, you're playing against a team that's leading 1-0, but probably is going to play a medium block, low block, very compact, not give you too much space, and you got to be patient. And we'll see how maybe an Alfonso Davies with his speed, with his creativity, or that they uh, – Jonathan, David, Laren, what Estacchio can do in the midfield and uh, Piet now because you're also midfielders. You're two central midfielders. What are you going to do? That pass that break lines, that pass that goes behind the defense, being a bit more creative in your choices without risking too much, but in a sense uh, showing Uruguay that, wait, we're not just going to knock it right and left and hope for you to make a mistake. We're actually going to provoke things and, uh, and try to get on the final third and, uh, and see the creativity that I'm hoping in Estacchio, I think he has in his tool set. We've seen it in CONCACAF. Now, can you do it against a prominent team like mm -hmm. Uruguay who can defend well? And also, uh, those defenders and those midfielders, you know, they're a bit, uh, I like to say they have ruse. You know, they're, they're savvy. They know how to give you that little nudge, uh, get under your skin. Those are the types of teams that you need because they go, they go a little bit above the edge on the mental aspect of staying uh, composed because they're going to try to slow the game down, play to their advantage. So we'll see. First chance here for Canada. Alfonso Davies Ooh. breaking in the box. Jonathan David shot, knocked over the crossbar. So corner kick coming for Canada. Speaking of uh, having that mental edge or combativeness, and I, there was just a, a nice moment there with Richie Larea and uh, <laughs> Luis Suarez. <laughs> and Suarez was like, what's your problem, man? <laughs> um, so... I love to see that. I mean, I do think it is something to manage for this Canada team um, because I, I feel like at times they have been, the, like you mentioned, the aggressive oh, team. Sorry, corner kick went through the box just wide. No one got ahead Ooh. to it, but a good chance for Canada. Good, good opportunity. This has been a good response from Canada in the last, I think, since the goal where they've been able to get Alfonso Davies more on the ball. They had a nice little sustained possession around the box, looking for some combination play. You see him again level, trying to square that ball to Jonathan David and then now being a threat on set piece. So um, that's that's a positive response, I think, to see to, when we say how do they answer this question of being down for the first time. It's, it's been a good response so far. Alistair Johnson with the header. Uh, so Luis Suarez has gotten in an argument and fight already with Richie Larea, Kamal Miller, as well as Kyle Lahren. I think the common denominator there might be Luis Suarez, but. Uh, I'm yeah, just guessing. We all know, we've all followed his career. Luis Suarez can get under your skin, not just as the player, but, you know, he likes to come into your face. He's uh, aggressive. I think he, he plays better when he's under those circumstances where he feels that he's a bit of the underdog. When he's comfortable and quiet, that's where you need him. That's how you mm. like him. But uh, those are things that, yeah, Victoria and uh, Miller and – and Johnson will have to get accustomed uh, to because, uh, you know, this is a type of player that is the highest level of, of forwards that you're going to meet. Uh, even Lukaku is a different profile. It's still interesting to see the challenges that he presents being Luis Suarez. He's not tall, but he plays tall and he's definitely a, a havoc to be around when you watch, when you've watched him throughout his career. But Patrice, uh, I, I got to ask you this because one thing I really loved about this Canada team is, they have personality. And I think at times we saw with the U.S. national team where after the last match against Japan, everybody came out and even the, the manager, Berhalter, came out and said, where's the personality on the team? Yeah. And sometimes we've seen it and sometimes it's been lacking. I would say amongst this Canada team, it's been consistent. Uh, the team yeah. has personality. It has fight. It has bite. They're not afraid of anybody. They, that's why they finished top of the group. They weren't afraid to go to Mexico. They weren't afraid to beat the U.S. Um but I wonder as you go up against these bigger teams, and we've seen it early on against uh, Uruguay where they've had that same personality, do you expect them to carry that forward 
uh, to the World Cup against the likes of saying, hey, I don't, you know, Kevin De Bruyne might look over and be like, I don't even know who you are. Like, what club do you play for? You know, some of these guys, Luis Suarez, who knows what he's saying. Yeah, no, but, definitely. You're, you're right. But, but I think one thing that John Herman has brought in is maybe mm. you've heard of it. Is called they they call it the brotherhood, the mindset that these this team has has developed into having uh, belief. And you've mentioned it every game when somebody's knocked the player, a Canadian player, the rest of the group, the players on the bench, the players on the field would would sw swarm that player. It just mm. to show how now they feel they're, they're that togetherness. They've built that, and they have that personality, that that brashness to say we're not afraid of anybody. They've mentioned it in CONCACAF. Maybe in the past, us Canadians, we would have probably never mentioned, oh, we're playing U.S., Canada. Yeah, we know we can believe them, uh, but we, we'll see. We'll go. We'll see how the game goes. Now they're like, no, we know we can beat you. We know mm -hmm. we can beat you at home or away. And we, uh, we're we not afraid of mentioning it, not to be arrogant, just mostly just saying we're confident in our abilities. So I think that personality and that group togetherness, that team spirit, is something that will allow them to come up uh, to surpass the tough moments they'd have. But they do need to play it against a team like Uruguay leading 1-0 because if you don't, you know, Kalen, as a player, when things are smooth sailing or you have too much success without really, I can't say challenges because CONCACAF was a challenge, but they dominated CONCACAF. So nothing was put to say adversity, okay, what do we do now? Because they do have somebody that or players that could do something different. Because you mentioned you're going to play Kevin De Bruyne and you're going to have to stick together when he's knocking out passes or shooting, taking shots from distance or making those crosses or Lukaku is dominating your defense or Modric is just make, making your head spin because he's passing the ball hundreds of times and you don't know where, he at, where he's at and how he's playing. And even Morocco, because we don't talk much about them, but they have several players playing in League One or prominent top leagues, and they're technically sound. So uh, Canada has that personality, has that mindset, but you need to play teams like Uruguay to challenge it because you, you're not always going to be the dominant. You're not going to be the dominant figure, and you don't have the World Cup experience. You mentioned it before. It's 36 years since going to the uh, World <laughs> Cup. So even though those players are good, being in a tournament, it's just like MLS. Teams who've gone to the playoffs, want, once they get there, it doesn't matter where you landed, 7th, 6th, 5th, or 1, the experience go, takes over. Now you know what it takes to win that game. And so for Canada, you're going to World Cup, but you've never been at that stage. Even though you have that strength of group, strength of mind, you're playing Belgium. You're playing Croatia. Croatia, let's not forget, they were in the final not too long ago. And Belgium yeah, for the last three finalists. World, for the last three World Cups, Belgium has been considered the favorite or one of the favorites, and it, it will still be the stiff, uh, same. It's just yes, and we're talking about Kevin De Bruyne, but we're forgetting and then Azar, who's kind of we forgot about him because he's been injured, but he can still turn a game in a uh, in a in a turn of a hat because his style of play is in the final third, and and you don't have that type of players. Uh, or you haven't met that type of players when you were in CONCACAF. So you may have been able to shut down Pulisic, but when you're going to play Belgium, you'll have Kevin De Bruyne, Eden Hazard, yes. Lukaku. Yeah, there's a several <laughs> players, and then players coming off the bench that could change the game also. Man, Patrice, speaking of the qualities of Canada while also denigrating the U.S., that was well, oh, that was elite saying, stuff hey, there. I didn't gotta, denigrate. No, you're said, playing both ways. Pulisic is center a center mid. The U.S., let's admit, the ways. U.S. We could talk U.S. The U.S. <laughs> Midfield, probably the best midfield you have in CONCACAF with McKenney, Adams, and all of them. Pulisic, he's your best player offensively, but who else brings that threat if it's not him? And when he's locked yeah. down, where does it come from? So it's not to denigrate. It's just saying they could stop one player, but now you're going to have two or three players to stop. Even Mexico, they weren't that great offensively in terms of they're still dangerous. But now you're going to have two or three players that are worldwide top talents that were either Premier League top players, meaning not just a good player in Premier League. They were Premier League's player of the year, Eden Hazard, mm. given the Bruin, and Lukaku, top scorer in, in Syria, and Luka Modric, Ballon d'Or. You know, 
Uh, th this is, we're talking about the <laughs> highest end, the creme de la creme, as they say in French, in terms of, uh, of football. So, but that's where you want to be. You want to be at the World Cup. You want to measure yourself against those countries and say, you know what? We've arrived. We are a soccer nation because what do people talk about Canada? Hockey. And now th this team is putting uh, Canada on the, on, the, on the map in terms of soccer talents, even though there's always been talents that we know. But uh, you need to be on the world scene to be able to have that respect. Um, let's talk uh, attack. Let's show a highlight here. We have the, the highlight of the goal. I know a lot of people having trouble getting the game on. So we're going to throw on the Uruguay goal here uh, on our stream. If you are not watching, is Milan Boyan way out of his goal, but able to make a big play. But I know we told you not to watch us. Just the chat so you can go on now and watch uh, this free kick. But you guys, you talked about it. Execution, Kalen, this is, this is pretty world class here on this finish. Yeah, I mean the finish uh, top drawer up in the corner. I don't. I don't think Borjan could have done much to to get over to that. Um, it does look like in the match that he's gone down now. I don't know if on that uh, slide where he came Ooh. off his line, he he picked up a knock. Um, but it, I think it goes back to what we're talking about as far as the the posture and the way that the team opens the match and the aggressiveness. And it's the this Canada team we like doesn't back down from anybody. But at the same time, there needs to have some moment of uh, pause before making a tough tackle around the box like that. And it was one where you say, if you're going to make a mistake, if you're going to, if I think he had help there, maybe it doesn't need to go in. It's tough to tough to rethink it now, especially when the ball's in the back of the net. But I think it's going to be something as far as limiting set pieces and uh, limiting dangerous opportunities. Um, because once you get to these higher levels, yeah, you can get hurt with one opportunity like that. Patrice, you played for many years with Milan. He's been the emotional leader of this team, the sweatpants, getting the crowds going back home in Hamilton for the big game against the U.S. What's what's he like? What is he sort of representing this team? And what was it like playing with him? Oh, he's a character, you know, and I think he grew <laughs> he grew uh, well into this leadership role. He was always somebody that would, you know, voice his opinion, uh, not afraid of saying it. And now that in the leadership group that they've put him, you've seen him sometimes in the hurdle just before the game. He's the one talking to the players. He's the one pepping, riled them up, making sure. And uh, and he's grown also as a game, as a goalie. I think uh, at first we always knew him as talented, but sometimes he would over. If you remember Gold Cup 2019, where it's mm -hmm. the ball comes back, you never knew. Sometimes in terms of the play, he he had those moments. And now he's, I think, sound. He's better at that. So still has the character. A fun guy to be around. Yeah, he's a, he, I can't say the party guy, but he's the type of guy who's, who animates the other ones. He's, he, he has a personality that, you know, everybody likes it, gets a laugh when you're around him because Milan Borin is that type of person that, who's loud. I'm not going to lie about that. Who's around <laughs> and who talks, and, and it, but it, in a good sense. And so, uh, and so, being a leader, he's one of those players that you need. He's he uh, he. Uh, as much as you have, maybe some were quieter or a different type of personality. Because Alfonso, I'm pretty sure you know how he is. He's very social media. Uh, he's fun to be around. But is he the one who's gonna tell the others to buzz off or you know they need to step up? Uh, he's gonna grow into that because he's still really young. People forget it. he's like 21 years old. He's it's like we, <laughs> it's because he's been in MLS since the age of 15. But we uh, we forget that he's 21. But Milan grew into that role, like a Samuel Piet, like an Atiba Hutchinson, and those are the guys who've been around for a little while. A Vittoria, uh, and then there's others like Kamal Miller, who are growing, who who are vocal and uh, who are emotional, but control that emotion because we all know we can we play with players that are really emotional, but they can just lose it, and then they're no longer focused on the task. While some of those players like Milan are uh, uh, emotional, but they're able to maintain themselves and concentrate and, and stir the others in the right direction. So it will be interesting to see how they manage this uh, this result right now and the conversations they might have also at halftime if this if result stands after the 45 minutes. Well, Milan... Uh, good enough to stay on the field. And then while you talked about him, he has proceeded to dime like six balls around Uruguayan defenders. Just to prove your point, Patrice, that's a good teammate. Yeah, no, no. Uh, like I said, <laughs> Milan is a fun, fun guy. 
I just heard a goalkeeper. Like all the every goalkeeper yeah. I know is goalkeeper always like, Union. Oh, yeah, always yeah. Say different. <laughs> There's cats. always like something a little different about them, uh, but in a good way. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. But always, it, you always laugh when you're in your locker room. The first thing you say, ah, now I know why he's a goalie. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> their personality, the way you are, uh, it's a goalkeeper union, which is a uh, they're good people to be around. But you know why they are at that position also in a certain extent in terms of the mental approach also. Uh, shout out to all of you in the chats, by the way, on YouTube, on Twitch, Stay Verde. Uh, loving the defensive work from Milan Boyan to come out and, and put his body on the line there and make some big plays. Kalen, 25 minutes in, though, the goal, but Canada, they've looked equal. We saw Jonathan David with that shot just moments ago. They've looked comfortable playing through Uruguay's pressure. They've sat in defensively for a few moments, haven't been broken down. I think you'd have to say a really good start to this. Yeah, I mean, it, there hasn't been a ton. It hasn't been a ton of opportunities either for um for Uruguay either, Ooh. where it's just been that they have. Patrice, you're ahead of us. I don't know, but I just saw uh, they did nothing. Nothing. It's the change, score didn't change, but it was an attempt by Uruguay. Okay. <laughs> Which minute are you saying, guys at? Which games. minute are you guys I'm, at? We're at, I'm at 25:24. Okay, uh, Let, at? let's wait for the next 10 seconds. You'll see what I. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they tried to chip him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just to show. Did you see in the midfield how they turned? You yeah. know, a lot of teams probably will play the one-two touch, play it around. But you have players who are able to break the line by just turning like he did and then spurt of the thought, try to lob the keeper. So these are things that you you probably didn't see or, or uh, occasionally in CONCACAF in Canada that is, is facing those types of players that are able to change the game in certain aspects that you weren't are accustomed to because you could be really well uh, organized your block but then you have one player who dribbles one or two or, or turns well, and then that block is broken. What happens? And then it's a transition or counterattack. And that, that opportunity just shows you that those types of teams, Uruguay, Brazil, especially South American, they have those types of players. Or even Belgium, when I was talking, Eden Hazard, that can turn on a dime and change the nature of the game and make it unpredictable. A lot a lot of pressure there on Piet and Eustachio as well because mm -hmm. – you had that back five there that were all in a line um, pretty far back. But then, yeah, those two have to protect them. And if you allow Kevin De Bruyne to get them to make that run cutting through and he's running straight at you, that's a big problem. So yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on on Piet and, and Yusaku to, to try and cover that. And if Canada gets into trouble, it will be more that they have a line of five and then maybe two and then three up top and it gets disjointed and they get a little bit stretched and it leaves those two guys on an island to cover the entire midfield. And that's where you need a little bit more from your outside backs pressing up or a little bit of tracking back um, from some of your other players up top, from these three up front. Um, but I think ultimately there is going to be the way this system is set up. There's going to be a lot of pressure on those two in the middle. Yeah. But yeah, again, because we talk about the players, but I think also John Herman's going to be challenged here also because the, the Canada's been accustomed to playing 3-4-3. Three, three. They've changed different tactical, but they've been more reliant on the 3-4-3, three, three, having those three guys when they have them in camp up front. But as you mentioned, Kellen, you're playing a midfield. Estacio Piet maybe have to have a more defensive role. So you're going to have maybe a void there in those lines. So are you going to maintain Davies, Laren, and David up front or are you going to add an extra midfielder because if i remember when we played the usa and now you're going to say oh patrice is pounding the usa but you know they had jonathan <laughs> ozoro jonathan ozoro playing a kind of a false number 10 to out to outnumber or to out match the us in the midfield because we all know the midfield in the, uh, in the us greg Bar berhalter likes to maintain the ball have numerical superiority in the middle and so will john herman maybe change things to uh, match up or bring something different that Uruguay is not accustomed to or the other teams they're going to play against uh, because they're playing Japan, which I could I saw against the U.S. won't be easy, and they're quite good in the transition. So it'll be a challenge also to see how jo John Herman adjusts the situation at halftime or during the game so that Canada can regain uh, the upper hand during the game. Patrice, you are former captain of Canada, 
The U.S. just got smoked 2-0 by Japan without a shot on goal. You are allowed to denigrate the U.S. and jump all over <laughs> us. Now yeah. is the time. Because I, I, I still bitter from that 2007 Gold Cup, guys. I'm still bitter yes. from that. That was a it wasn't call. A, it was a pass back for Gooch. Come but, on. Uh, but no, no. It's just to show because, of course, why am I saying U.S.? Because U.S. and New Mexico are what the the standard bearers of CONCACAF. Yeah. So it's just to show that the things that they've been able to do against those teams and now other teams are going to bring something even more uh, to another mm -hmm. level. To an, uh, so this game just shows you how comfortable you were guys on the ball. They don't panic. They get the ball. They turn around. They play it back. They play one, two. They get that foul. And, uh, and I would say you don't play USA or Mexico every game. And a lot of the times Canada dominated most of those teams in CONCACAF. So this is a good challenge for them and see how they come out of it right now. One of the things I love about this Canada team, and uh, you're seeing it in person a lot, Patrice, yeah. is Alistair Johnston uh, and Sam Arcube and Kamal Miller, but especially Johnston and Miller, their ability to both play as fullbacks and center backs. Like we're seeing in this game, Richie Larea has been almost as high as Kyle Laren for half of yeah, this yeah. first half. And Johnston's playing as a right back, but then he can come back inside and play as a center back and defend at a high level. He's, he's grown, it feels like, this year coming to Montreal. Yeah, Alistair Johnson, like Kamal, we've seen it from last year. I think the fact that he was a mainstay in terms of starting 11, that he grew in confidence. And uh, I'm not going to lie, he was a profile defender that maybe was lagging in Montreal. Athletic, can match for pace when certain teams have that pace in MLS. And we know a lot of teams have speed. Uh, Alistair, what was interesting is we didn't know in Montreal, was he going to be a right back or a center, a right center mm -hmm. back? Because in Nashville, he ended up playing there more often because with the national team, that's where he was playing or is playing on a regular basis. But then uh, Wilfred Nassi allowed him to have that versatility in terms of his tactical elements. Okay, I want Johnston as a right center back because of his qualities. He's a good passer. He reads the game. His football acu or acumen is very high. And then when he's on the right, right back, right wing back, he was one of the first ones when Kai Kamara arrived to understand that, you know what, I have to put the ball in because this guy, he's dominant in the air. <laughs> and and Wilfred Nasi, his game is to play the ball on the ground. But Alistair realized, maybe talking with Kai, hey, look, I got to bring something different. And he brought those assists. And this year he brought even goals. He's got four goals. This is the record for a right uh, defender uh, in the history of the Impact uh, CF Montreal with four goals and Zach Brogiar scored four, also three from coming off from the bench. But uh, Alistair Johnson really, I think, uh, his versatility, his IQ, understanding the game. He could all probably play in midfield. The way I see him play, he, he, he probably could operate there because he's technically sound and he rarely makes a, a wrong decision with the ball and seems very calm, even though he's not built strong or tall. He plays in the 1v1s. He's very difficult to beat. I haven't seen anybody in the MLS uh, play against him and, and really go by him or beat him on a 1v1. So those guys, those two players have progressed being in Montreal and under the stewardship of Wilfred Nassi. But I think Johnson, the factor that he, he operates in different positions, and I just think his IQ allows him to play uh, at any different – he could play in the middle of the, the three – or even on the left, and he would still fare well. Uh, and Kamal, he's grown in terms of carrying the ball. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Not there in that go. moment. There Darwin we go. Nunez. There we go. Headed goal 2-0 here for Uruguay. And this is why this is the test. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but Canada. this is this is the goal. Like, cross. Who is it crossing? Luis Suarez, if I'm correct. If I'm watching correctly. And Nunez, leap, ability, being behind the defender uh, in that blind side. And you're gonna Lukaku. That's that's what he's built for. Mm -hmm. This is uh, this is where you have to learn. Even though they're not the same built, it's the same around uh, area that you're gonna see uh, the ball being crossed. So Canada's being challenged now. So uh, as much I don't like seeing, but you need to you need to face that. You know, Kalen, all the challenges we faced. Either a coach who doesn't play me, a teammate that's in front of me, I have to surpass, or playing getting to the professional level. The adversity tells you where are you, or you, you need to learn, process it, 
and now make the next necessary steps or measures to not uh, make those mistakes again or to grow from that. So we'll see. And I'm saying I'm seeing Junior Horlet probably bring coming into this game or Kone because you need those creative players in those tight pockets. Uh, and necessarily also I'm watching, but defensively, have you seen how many players in the box Uruguay has? They're eight. Yeah. If you're crossing that ball, it needs to be on the dime. Uh, and and you need to have all your four or five elements that are offensively in the box. So, yeah, this is uh, this is good football. This is what we want to see. I can't lie. Is, as much as they're down 2-0, <laughs> this is what I want them to, to face because you, you don't want to go to the World Cup and then get crushed 3-0 by Belgium, 3-0 by Croatia, and you're out of the World Cup and you haven't even scored a goal. And you're like, wait, 36 years ago, we didn't score a goal. Uh, and now... Uh, are we closer to score goal? So uh, this is interesting, really, to see. And but I'm going to see what John Rimmon does at halftime. And also, Alfonso Davies, what can you deliver now? Because the kid is young, but he's got talent and he's got skill set. So can he come out of the structure and bring something different that Uruguayans are not expecting? So and you know, does he have the freedom to go uh, right wing? and maybe operate a bit more freer to use his creativity. And he's got speed. He is the fastest player in Bundesliga. So can he bring that speed and, and, uh, and, uh, and change things and bring something that Uruguay is not expecting or hasn't seen or is unpredictable? Yeah, to this point, we've seen him much more underneath with the ball at his feet and trying to create off the dribble. Yeah. And I've seen at times... Um, when we even talk about the U.S. team, Christian is doing a lot of that. And I think for both players, getting them moving in space, getting them receiving the ball on the move as opposed yeah. to a stationary um, where you're able to kind of get them in, in pockets. And um, they, I, they like to come into those pockets and get touches, but where they're really dangerous is trying to stretch the field, get them behind or facing up with a guy one-on-one -on -one and asking some tough questions of them that way. So. They see no, if they can try and I think just getting a, the ball to that requires someone to get the ball to him in a dangerous yeah. spot. And I think right now they're they're missing that that connector right now to be able to find the pass to to get him on the move. Yeah, Junior Hollet, maybe an Ismail Kone who brings a different profile midfield. But it's interesting because if we were to ask the question, when those guys play at that club, do they do what they do here? No, because no. there's somebody more prominent that's able to deliver. So they yeah. usually stay in the final third or I can't say in their lane, but in their... So when they come to the national team, they sometimes feel they need to do more uh, yeah. because either the ball is not getting to them or they feel they're the guy, they're the main guy, and I need to do a little bit more. But it's interesting, killing because it's true. Sometimes you need the facilitator that allows you to still gravitate at what you're really good at at club level and what your expertise is. For either your Pulisic or your Alfonso Davies, even a Jonathan David, because there's other players who have a skill set that allow you to you be good at what you're good at, which is usually final third for Pulisic. And for Alfonso, he comes from Bayern Munich. He's coming from way back. So he's coming at pace and he's coming mm -hmm. from the blind side from the second wave. And now he's coming at you uh, <laughs> being his back to goal or in small tight pockets where he doesn't have as much room. So it's, it's a challenge for them and it's a challenge for their teams to put them in the conditions to shine how they do in club and be able to do it as a, at the country I, level also. I love Alfonso Davies trying to fake the quick free kick to try and get a yellow in the tents of the ref, trying to get a yellow card on someone. Free kick coming up here uh, for Canada. 2-0 down here against Uruguay as Davies serves this one in. Uruguay able to defend it away. Reminder, we've got the USA-Saudi Arabia game coming up after this one as well with Susanna Collins, Charlie Davies, and Tom Bogert. So you can be here on the MLS YouTube and Twitch pages watching along with us pretty much the entire day, which is a pretty good day and, for all of you. And shout out to everyone in the chats with us. And you're going to see, you're going to see, maybe I'm a few seconds earlier, but pay attention to Nunez when he's moving, how he drags Alistair Johnson out of the way. And a lot of forwards sometimes stay central. And you're, you're, you know, defender you're comfortable with. But then he drags him out of the way, creates open channels for other players to go through. Those are things that not all players do, not all forwards do. And Nunez, I'm just paying attention now that, you know, how J Johnson paid attention to him a lot and he dragged him all the way to the side of the field. 
So those are things that, you know, you you see that they probably weren't accustomed to and and uh, are facing right now in this game against Uruguay. Canada. Good little opening up in there. Yeah. yeah, creating some good chances. Um, I believe we do have a highlight of the second Uruguay goal here on our watch along. So we'll throw that up now and you take a look. You you talked us through it live, though, Patrice, but Suarez. But why are you guys cross. showing this, man? Is this because it's not the U.S.? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We, yeah. uh, well, we it's didn't fun. show any Uruguay goals when the U.S. played them in their friendly <laughs> because they didn't score any goals because the U.S. <laughs> obviously had Sean Johnson in goal. Sean Johnson. But, uh, but it, it just feels uh, – this is me saying it. You guys correct me. It feels like Alistair Johnson probably came too, one step too far inside and wasn't able to get back and get over Nunes. But that's the thing is because – as they're three, it's the factor. It's the factor of watching where the ball is and seeing mm-hmm. your, your your opposition and where the Nunez do. As Suarez was about to cross, he slowly drifted blindside, and it's difficult for a defender to be able to see the ball and see the man. That's where you sometimes have to, you know, Kalen, you have to box the player. You have to make contact with him, and then uh, when the cross, so you jump with him. Now he leaned a bit towards the space. And allowed Nunez to go behind him, and it's a perfect cross and a perfect header and a goal and 2-0. Opportunity coming here for Canada as well. Big save for Uruguay. Um, but, Kalen, as we said 15 minutes ago when it was 1-0, now 2-0. But it does, it does feel like Canada has the confidence to play at this level. Yeah, we, we knew they were going to create opportunities. We knew they were going to create chances. This team has too much firepower to not um, get opportunities. I guess... The tricky part for them has been, and the bigger question was defensively, can they keep a top team out? And I think so far, they haven't been able to do that. I think you see uh, the likes of, you know, the set piece, but then uh, the second goal for me is Kamal Miller gets in a bad spot out wide defending one-on-one and gets tangled up um, almost in the two-on-one situation. And once that cross comes, comes in, it's a tough it's a tough ask to say Alistair Johnson can can really stop Nunez there because it's just once that ball is in the air, I think you can always try and uh, block the service from from happening to begin with. Um, and if you can get a body on him before the jump, as as Patrice mentioned, but they've gotten opportunities, and I wouldn't say any that you say one hundred percent has to be a goal. But they've been dangerous. They've been around the box, and I think we've seen Davies now get a get in space and him being able to exactly what we're talking about um, really drive one-on-one there on the last one and finds a square pass because so much attention comes to him that he can then look to lay one off to, uh, to David or Kyle Laren and, and find that finish, but it hasn't happened yet, but they've got four or five minutes till <laughs> halftime to try and get one back. That would be huge. And then at halftime, I do think they will likely make some sort of tactical adjustment. Um, I'm thinking maybe around the middle of midfield, maybe, Maybe if they bring in um, Kone, he might be a little bit later. Um, they also have Mark Anthony K. K um, in the middle as we well. Saw him come yeah. on last game as well. I do think uh, they. I do th- think they miss Osorio. Just when we talk about those options and Hutchinson, you see more in the middle. Of yeah, the because you know, also he buzzes around a lot. He's always constantly moving, so yeah. he's finding pockets, getting out of pockets, and he's also one of those types of midfielders who likes to make that late run. So. Mm-hmm. When that first wave of fours go, uh, goes, goes he, he comes in second and usually gets those, those uh, cross, those laid back crosses, or, the, or uh, if you could say a defender who miss hits the ball and he's there. So that's why I say a profile is my coning. He is able to dribble with the ball. He's a profile that's completely different than everybody else. He has the speed to go at you with the ball, he's tricky, but. He's lagging experience because this is his first professional season. And now he's about to face prominent t- talent that play in uh, in England or in Spain or a- and elsewhere. Uh, what I'm going to be interested in also to see is we know we're going to create chances as Canada. But how efficient are we going to be? Because how much chances does you agree? How many chances have you agree created? And they're up to zero. So mm. they are able to score two out of like four or five. Are we able to score one or two out of four or five, or does it take? Will it take us six or seven? Because as mm-hmm. we mentioned, we were able to do it in Concacaf, which is not denigrating the Concacaf. It was a reality at that time. But you're going to play against team that defensively 
or astound or even better defensive than you. So they might not give you four or five chances, even though we know Canada will be able to create some chances, but being efficient. Uh, Patrice, we've got a, a big question in here for you from someone named David G. It is not me, but he sounds cool. So we'll ask this question. He said, Patrice, you talk a lot about our players needing experience. Can you contrast your experience growing up with the current development of our athletes? How can you provide them more experience? But when I say experience, it's experience of World Cup. These guys have now experience of World Cup qualifiers, and they're just getting more. We've never been to the World Cup. It's a different plateau when you get to somewhere you've never been. As much as you want to get there, Gold Cup, we play them every two years. I've played four. I got accustomed to playing Gold Cup. I knew the matter. Now playing Mexico, U.S., we didn't play them every weekend or every CONCACAF qualifiers. So when you went to Azteca or you went played the States, uh, the, the, the depth of their teams, the quality of their teams, that's one thing. So I'm not saying they don't have experience. They may have less experience than some of these teams that are accustomed to being at World Cup. The pressure mm -hmm. those countries are under. When you play for Brazil, you're expected to win the World Cup. There's no nothing under uh, Germany, France. Now, in terms of our youth development, the thing is you have to play ex international games. As uh, 15, 16, you have to be in tournaments. And unfortunately, we're not uh, yet customarily at World Cups at the under 17 or under 20, and we haven't been to the under 23 or the Olympic Games. When you're there, your younger players, at, by the age of 14, I went to the U17 World Cup. By the age of 23, I had already played 30 international games at that youth level. That's experience of being abroad, playing in Panama, Ecuador, Salvador, that translates to when you go to the senior team. It's just the level gets better. So as your te teams play well at the youth level and are exposed at not just qualifiers but World Cups, they see what the venue is. Even if it's at the younger stage, mm -hmm. you're playing 30 or 40 or 50 games. And I remember a, a speaker conference where Lucho Gonzalez, now coach of San Jose next year, and uh, he had maintained that for their youth at FC Dallas, they didn't want just for them to play games. They were going to tournaments so that they had international exposure, playing against Arsenal or Flamengo and so on. So as much as they played club-level games, they were playing 30 or 20 or 30 international games. And that's, that's good because you need to be in those situations to live them, to make mistakes or have success. And then that... That applies to when you go to the professional ranks and then you go to the highest level, which is the international and, and now the World Cup. And now you've played uh, 40 or 50 international games even before you're actually a, a senior a national team player. All right, that's it for the first half here. 2-0 lead for Uruguay uh, over Canada. We are not going anywhere. We're going to be hanging out through halftime and all the way through to the second half. And as we've said, then we will switch straight over to the USA versus Saudi Arabia game. Um, big start, obviously, for Uruguay. The free kick, sixth-minute goal, and then Darwin Nunez, the 80 million pound acquisition for Liverpool, scores the second goal over the head of Alistair Johnson. Kalen, I can't even imagine how much allocation money 80 million is. Uh, but it's probably, it's probably quite a lot. Thank you all of there out there uh, for joining us. Tracker in the YouTube chat, shouting out Diego Alonso, head coach of Uruguay, former Inter-Miami. Uruguay coach, so MLS representation. Diego Rossi is on the bench. He is, Uruguay right? and, yep. yep. And Martin Caceres is on the field. LA Galaxy player as of two weeks ago. Getting the start at center back. So some MLS representation on the Uruguay side. And obviously a ton of it also on the... Is Rossi, uh, does he, is he going to make the World Cup team likely? He's on the team right now. Okay. Can't hurt, right? Yeah. Uh, he's gotten called up, I believe, for everything over the last eight to 12 months um, since getting to Fenerbahce and playing there. He's pretty much replaced Brian Rodriguez, who of course just left LAFC for club America. Um, so that's pretty cool. Kalen, that's sort of something new we're going to see in this world cup is some guys, Tiago Amada debuted yeah. for Argentina. I was about week. to mention that he, he he's playing for Argentina in MLS and for it's crazy. He's playing with Lionel Messi right now. And one of the countries that are probably favorites to win the world cup. 
Yeah, it was uh, wild. Did you How guys ever that? think we'd see that? I was looking at the messy chip, right? Where you're like, I'm still looking at that, waiting for him to take a touch. And he doesn't. He doesn't. He just <laughs> in stride puts it over. But, but yeah, I think celebrating we, with Amada. We expected Ezekiel Barco to maybe make yeah. be that player that, hey, he's going right. to maybe go to the Argentina. And now Amada comes in and boom, in season. Yeah, he's in the camp. He's uh, on the roster. And prominently, maybe he has good chances to be at the World Cup. So... Uh, we're seeing that uh, uh, you, to see the rise of MLS, that the talents that are there are now at that level, are now matching themselves with what's being uh, the best of the best across other countries. So exciting for uh, people here uh, across the board, as well as, of course, for USA and Canada fans. We have a random USA question in here. Google random user. Patrice, you played against them. Uh, Kaylin, you as well. Landon Donovan or Clint Dempsey. Do you guys have a, 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 a pick there? uh personally actually i have clint's jer jersey so we play so have it. to say clint uh look i like both but i don't know i think what i liked about clint is uh he like just didn't care and what i mean didn't care is he didn't care who he was playing against and he he had that create creativity audacity to pull out things sometimes i played against him before he went to europe where he refined mm -hmm. his game became more efficient but when he, when he was in New England, like, he would just try to, you know, overstep in the midfield, nutmeg. He, he, I felt like, wow, this American player is different. He's really playing out not just athleticism. He's being creative. He's being, think outside the box, not your, I would say, classic. Uh, while Landon, he had the, he was more positional player, finding space, good finisher, uh, different types of player. Just Clint was my type of player, if we could like. But I still love Landon. It's just uh, Clint Dempsey was a different, different type of cat. I lost, I lost two MLS cups to Landon, so it's an easy <laughs> one for me. I'm going Clint, right? It's obvious, Clint. Go, Kaylin. Let me ask you this one: Atiba Hutchinson or Patrice Bernier? Which oh one's come your on, oh, man. Patrice. You're putting on my spot there, did I? <laughs> no, Patrice. Uh, Atiba, that's easy for me. Atiba's Patrice. right now literally mm -hmm. the goat of Canadian soccer because, of course, yeah. Alfonso is on his way of being it. But uh, Tiba has been dominating the last few years. And unfortunately, he hasn't had the props that he deserved. People yeah. who were in soccer know who Atiba Chins, but even in Canada, Atiba Chitson, hmm? Christine Sinclair was more popular than for not for not any bad reason. She's one of the best players uh, who ever uh, donned the jersey and for women's soccer. But Atiba, uh, I, got, I played with him when he was 15. I played with him when he was 24. Uh, played with him uh, towards the end of his, uh, towards the end of my career. He is right now what I would consider the goat in terms of Canadian soccer players. And let me be clear, because people are like, hey, Alfonso Davies, yes, Alfonso is twenty one. Let him have his career. Let him. He has Champions League and everything. He will become the goat. But Atiba has been what five or six or seven times a Canadian Player of the Year. And so far, Alfonso hasn't that what? doesn't have that. So Patrice, I, I got to ask you because I was hanging out with uh, Dwayne Di Rosario over the weekend. We were uh, Marisa Du held a charity soccer tournament um, yes. match over the weekend in Philadelphia for, to benefit Ukraine, which was awesome. Um, but brought out a ton of former MLS players, um, some guys who had played internationally, Gucci and Yewu. Um, and I, you know, I was talking to Diro on the way on the bus, and we we're talking about this moment in in Canada history. And I, I got to ask, like, for you and for the the sort of generation of guys that came before and maybe, you know, were fighting to try to just lift the level and, and earn some respect. But now to see this team, um, and yes, I know down 2-0 at halftime, but, you know, in the broader scheme why, of things. Why you got to bring the result, man? <laughs> and make, it's not over. We got a second half. But, but looking at, you know, big play, you know, winning the Champions League, whether with Alfonso Davies or... Um, you know, guys bursting through from MLS to Europe and, and playing now and, and representing just Canada at the, at the, uh, the highest level. Um, what, what's this been like for you? Uh, this is a lot of pride because, as you mentioned, with Dwayne, uh, Julian de Guzman, Atiba, you have all these players from before. Uh, you fought. Most likely, it was better you had a dual citizenship to try to enter uh, some countries to play because the Canadian passport was a heavy burden. Uh, and now, because of what these guys are doing now, uh, the, a lot of countries, a lot of scouts are now looking on to, where's the next Alfonso Davies? Where's the next Jonathan David? There's some 
cheaper labor, even in the States, you see it now. There's a lot more players playing in Europe now because they're coming to watch them more often. So it puts Canada on a respectable level, credibility. Not that we didn't have talents, but they never respected the country. They respected what we were able to do when I was in Scandinavia or Germany. Julian was in La Liga. Craig Forrest, Paul Stahl, Terry, Thomas Rosinski were in Premier League or won Bundesliga. Mm -hmm. These things have happened. It's just, do many people know it about it? No, because on the national stage, Canada was not relevant. We didn't do anything great. Our shiniest moment was the Gold Cup 2000. If you take away 86 World Cup and then the 2007 uh, semifinal, as we maybe were robbed, but those are the shining moments we we're living on. And we're not necessarily success moments. They were more, except for the 2000 Gold Cup. And so, yeah, there's a lot of pride to say, look, we worked hard for ourselves, but also to say Canadian talent uh, exists and it's well and alive and that you should, we should be doing better. Our generation should have done better, not going to lie. Uh, we had prominent talent, but now they're doing well. And the pride of the nation and watching, knowing that we're at the World Cup. Now we're going to watch the World Cup. And as I spent, said, said to a friend, everybody's Canadian is going to watch it with a bit more interest. Either mm -hmm. you had your dual citizen, meaning another country, your roots, you were watching it for that. But now you're going to watch it because you're going to say, hey, actually Canada, where I live and reside, where I grew up, they're at the World Cup. How are they going to fare against Belgium, Croatia? in Morocco. So a lot of pride, uh, happy. Yes. Would I want to be there? Definitely. <laughs> that was the career you want. You, you, we worked so hard to try to be there, but you know, I'm really just proud and, uh, and seeing what they're doing and the way they're doing it. They didn't just come in by the back door. They went through the front door. The number one team in the, in CONCACAF in the octagon. And, uh, and then people are paying attention, which is what we always want to do, but now they're doing it. And they've uh, they've opened the door. Now, uh, hopefully, we can sustain this for years to come. Patrice, I, I want to talk about the team a little bit more, but before we get there, you, you've mentioned 07 a couple times, and uh, I'd recommend for anyone out there, uh, Josh Cloak coming out with a book right now called The Voyagers about the Canadian men's national team since the last World Cup all the way through and how we got here. And he spent a lot of time on Stephen Hart and that 2007 team, and then Stephen Hart not continuing and. One of the things that was mentioned in that, and so I'm curious what you think as someone who was there and a part of this group, was he was the first to really entrust a lot of the players and take it away from just the British view of the sport and everything being physicality, direct, defend as a number and start to use sort of the skill sets of players like a Dwayne De Rosario and a Julian de Guzman and yourself with, with that dual national and different backgrounds. What do you remember about sort of his influence on the team and, and, and that time period because it feels like that's how we've gotten here, where an Alfonso Davies and a Jonathan David and a Kyle Laren feel entrusted to be themselves out there on the field. Yeah, I'm, I'm even going to go further. I'm going to say Frank Yallop, who, who had okay. been there for a short period of time. The words he was telling us, like, we should not fear anybody. We have talent. We should be able to go play out there. Unfortunately, Frank Yallop didn't stay as long. And when Stephen R came in, for that Gold Cup spe specifically, the main thing he told us is, you guys, I don't know you know how good you, you are. And, and those words were like, wait a minute, because a lot of the times we're like, man, okay, guys, we're going to have to defend well, organized, you know, uh, Canadian grit, and then hope for the result. Those were kind of what you were conditioned to in terms of youth soccer when you were young. And Stephen R came in and said, what? I got Julian. I got Atiba. I got Dwayne. Mm -hmm. I got Patrice. I got guys at the back. Ali Jerba at the front. Mm -hmm. what, what should, why should I be jealous from other nations? Just go out there, guys, and play. And play, if you could say, the right way. And Gold Cup 2007, the first game, we played Costa Rica. Upset 2-0. Or 2 0 or 2 1, Julian the Guzman, two goals, who rarely does scores, two <laughs> goals, but he was he was doing so well in La Liga and playing so well. And we played, and then that confidence grew. Hey, you know what? We can play on the ground. We're playing, we're managing. We beat Costa Rica. Then we went on to lose to Guadalupe <laughs> uh, that second game. But 
it didn't uh, it didn't stop us. And then we played Haiti, and then we had the results, and we went to the next round. We beat uh, Guatemala, I think it's 3-0 uh, in the quarters, and then we played the States in the semis. It's just Stephen Hart at that time enthused uh, through the team, which was, guys, just play. You are as good as the other teams, as the bigger nations in, in the CONCACAF. And it transpired in the way we played in 2007. That's why we so devastated because of that yeah. goal that wasn't given. Because that game, if you want to rewatch it, <laughs> second half, we were controlling the play. We were playing in Chicago, if I'm correct. We were playing and, and we were 2-0 we, we were down. We came back to 2-1 and we felt we had the 2-2. And then when we got the 2-2... It was taken away, and we felt we could have gone to overtime and maybe done. But it's just to show that on that short period, the mindset, the belief, at what this group has now, 2020, was there. But then uh, Stephen Hart wasn't uh, continued as the main coach. Uh, Dale Mitchell came in, and we felt we didn't have continuity, we, we mm -hmm. stability into a group that now have the belief, and then a coach who enthused that belief, and then it kind of stopped. And then it was changed because Dale Mitchell uh, saw, saw things in a different way. And then we, we weren't able to, the qualifiers for 2010, to, to uh, keep going from the 2007 performances at the Gold Cup and bring it to a World Cup qualifier. Unfortunately, even going to the Hex, we didn't even make it to the Hex at the time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was a fascinating time in history. I remember it. Uh, I remember loving watching those teams. Let's talk about now the continuity, John Herdman. Uh, doing his thing. I, I believe we have a tweet here with some stats from the first half uh, overall in this game. Uh, so if you take a look at your screens for us, Canada, five box shots, zero guys, two, 147 attacking half passes to 40, six total shots to four. Canada were good, solid half. Uh, process is good. Kalen, some people in the chat have been asking you about what you want to see in this second half. What do you think the conversation right now from John Herdman is? And how do you take numbers like that and then put it on the scoreboard? Well, it, some of it comes down to efficiency, right? And Patrice brought this up before, but uh, Uruguay have had less opportunities by the numbers, but have been more efficient. And I think the, the issue for Canada is, I, I think one, you know, it's, it's not a bad half I, because what, what's essentially Canada is being tasked with doing is cramming. You're trying to learn as much as you can in a short window before the World Cup. And based on a number of things that have happened around the Federation, whether it was the protests where they lost a match or, you know, scheduling, trying to find the right challenges for this team, they've had to do this in a very short window for a team that hasn't gotten exposure to this uh, level as of yet. And they passed the, a good test against Qatar in the last week, in the, in the last game. And now you want to learn this tough half now and not in Qatar <laughs> and not against Belgium mm. and not against Croatia uh, or Morocco. So I think they'll be able to say, all right, now we need to make some changes at halftime. I could see um, some changes in the midfield. I think Coilette could be an option. Kone is a name that I'd really like to get a look at. Uh, I think especially against this competition because he's the type of player that you just wonder, is he somebody you can trust in with Taylor, Herdman? Hang on to... one second, because I did this poorly in the first half and we're about to kick off. So I got to do a kickoff oh, thing. Got now. it. Okay. <laughs> uh, so everyone watching with us as Dara Sketa comes on for Luis Suarez, which is not a step back at all. We are about to kick off here between Canada and Uruguay. If you're watching along with me, I can see right now that they are standing there waiting and we just kicked off. But you're so further if you want to be in me, time with but us. You're further ahead than me. <laughs> well, Kalen, go forward. I then... can't go forward. This is the fast. I'm as far <laughs> forward as possible. All right, Kalen. Well, it sounds like you're going to have to listen to my reactions, which sucks okay. for you, great. but great for everyone else. Uh, David Neeson loves your cramming comment there. Kalen continue the intelligent things you were saying before I cut you off. So I could yell <laughs> kick off. No, they, they just haven't been able to play a, a, a bunch of, challenging opponent like really tough opponents to find out ask to answer the question that's in front of them right now which is what happens when you're down 2-0 at halftime what kind of adjustments can I make who do I bring in off the bench to change the game how do I change the picture like they haven't been able to answer these questions yet just because it hasn't you know they haven't been in that situation and so mm -hmm. I, I think it's really important to see what Herdman does um, here in the second half it looks like they've come out with the same lineup at least to begin with um, and I think 
you know, you could make a case to say, I understand that. Don't throw it out. I believe they point. brought in Junior Hoylet at the right wing back. If I'm Did they? Okay. From what I'm seeing. For Larea? Yeah, it seems I have to see who's on the left. I'm pretty sure Sam Adekubo is still there. Yeah, I think Junior Hoylet's now uh, on the right flank uh, in Richie Larea's position. Okay, so he that was the way they went against Qatar, right? Yes, the, yep. this is yeah. most likely, this is the exact lineup as in uh, as against Qatar. Right. But Hoylet's going to give you a little bit more, as probably as far as uh, I think Larea has that you know defensive ability to really make it tough on guys. And Hoylet's going to give you, he can play a bunch of different positions, but um, good on the ball, can help connect, get forward, and, and uh, cause some problems. So, um, And then I think you still have Kay and Kone as some guys in the middle that you might look at as the uh, second half progresses. And Tejan, I forgot about Tejan. Yeah, yeah, so we t- I don't know how his, his level of fitness if he's uh, able to play a uh, twenty or thirty minutes, but uh, definitely I prefer him on a right wing back as much as I love Junior, but I like Junior. I like Junior where he's closer to the forwards. He's he's creative in those light, uh, fi- uh, those pockets. He's able to find that final pass that most players uh, won't be able to find uh, in more involved. But we'll see. Uh, we'll see. Uh, as if he stays at the right flank or if he, you know, he funnels through the middle and maybe interchanges positions with uh, uh, Jonathan David or Kyle Arena or even Alfonso Davies. We're on under some pressure there. Um, Tejan Buchanan, I believe, has not played in a real game since July 11th, but he did play in a scrimmage, friendly, whatever you want to call it, for Club Brews right before he got to the window. And um, John Herdman has spoken about it a couple times, said they're working very closely with club Bruce to make it so that he's available for a couple minutes in this game. And then hopefully for the world cup. Cause I think he mentioned he got hurt in training after coming back thinking he was all the way back. So unfortunate for him, uh, Patrice Kalen's brought up Ismail Kone a couple times. Um, as we do see junior Hoylet has come on, uh, officially confirmed here on Fox Deportes, at least, um, you, I wouldn't say you found him, but you were the first person at Montreal to see him and sort of help push him into the first team. You've now watched him since then. Do you think he's ready to play at this level? Do you think he's ready to start potentially in a world Is cup? he ready? Uh, I don't think so, but you never know until you throw him in there. So uh, mm-hmm. the factor is, you know, his, his rise has been quick. Let's not forget, this is a guy two years ago, he was amateur soccer here in Montreal. And he jumped in, started training, the minute you arrive with the under-23 uh, academy group, you saw something in him. You didn't know, is it going to transpire to what we're seeing now? But you saw the skill set. He has something. Now, the question was, can he do it at the professional level? And he had that whole last year where he was involved with the group. They just hadn't signed him, but he was with them when they were in Florida. And he stayed there until he signed. So a true measure of a player that they saw something in him. And he also was able to be consistent to show that, okay, he signed, I think, in July of last year, August. And this year, he rose to the occasion when the opportunity uh, came because Samuel Piet was injured. Uh, There was a lack in the midfield from injuries. And he came in, and the first 10 games, bam, we we saw Ismail Kone play MLS, score goals, be unpredictable, creative, dribble with the ball, made mistakes, which a young player usually does. And especially, I said, he didn't come directly from the academy spending four or five years groomed. He was at an amateur cl- amateur club in NDG, ended up going to CS Saint Laurent. And then through the ranks, Renard heard about him, invited him to come to the under-23. And then uh, the coaching staff at the time with Will Finassi watched him and said, you know what, we'll bring him to the first team. And... And the story is now that he's an international on the bench, mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe a few minutes away from playing against Uruguay. And uh, and not too long ago, uh, Norwich, Sheffield United teams are bidding for his services, having just played one year, of not even a full year of, of uh, professional soccer here at CF Montreal. You know, uh, we mentioned Luchi Gonzalez earlier. I asked him um, a while back um, before Pepe got sold to um to germany 
how do you know? Like, how do you know when a guy is ready to put in? And it's funny because FC Dallas has done such a good job. And I think Lucci is one of the best at, at youth development. And you guys know him very well as well. Um, and he said, you don't know. <laughs> you just have to put him in and find out. And I think it was really refreshing in a way. And yes, Pepe actually went much more through, you know, through the entire pipeline. I think he's the first player in FC Dallas um, in that youth academy to go all the way through like North Texas and or the Academy of North Texas. He was from the affiliate program in El Paso to begin with and then to the first team. Um, and he, he's he's starting today for the U.S. Men's National Team and a huge opportunity. That lineup just dropped. If you're following along, stay with us for that one. Um, that's going to be fun. But yeah, I, I think there is something to that of just saying you don't know until you find out, until you put a guy in, you see him in MLS for in Kone's example, and you see him being able to meet that challenge and yes, make mistakes, but kind of work your way through that. And um, yes, I, I just think that's important to keep in mind as far as you don't actually know until you give somebody an opportunity, but you can get a little bit of a sense of, of, uh, of somebody and how they might handle that because you also want to be careful not to throw somebody in a bad position um, or, or give them a bad sort of platform to, to move forward. So it's a tricky one, but I, I really like um, what I've seen from Kone so far, especially in his time with MLS. Uh, so that USMNT roster did drop. Hopefully I won't lose all uh, bids for a PR card in Canada if I bring this up during this stream here. But you mentioned it, Galen. So just for everyone out there listening, Matt Turner in goal, uh, Aaron Long, Walker Zimmerman, two center backs. It looks like Serginio Dest on the left, DeAndre Yedlin on the right, Kellen Acosta, Tyler Adams, McKenney in the midfield, Pulisic the captain alongside Pepe and Reyna up top. Um, that's based on just reading it in a list because why wouldn't anyone put out a formation when they announce a team and sort of let people know what it'll look like? Kalen, initial thoughts? Uh, I saw, so I was just kind of looking as I was going through this here. So yeah, we, I mean, Christian is back in, um, which is positive because we mentioned um, just, you know, you, for the U.S., Canada has another game after this. They're going to get a chance to play against uh, Japan. But due to the scheduling with the World Cup, this is the final match for the U.S. men's national team until we see them against Wales. Um, so that is important because uh, he's one of our most important players. Um, I like the midfield three uh, with you don't when you don't have Musa. Um, I, I like Kellen Acosta. I feel like it's a very solid pair with him alongside Adams and McKinney. Um, and I think that's going to need to be an important core for us um, going forward. But I, Kellen Acosta, I think, already has the trust. Um, but it really is, for me, I, a lot of eyes for me are going to be on Ricardo Pepe. Just, I spent a bunch of time talking about him just a minute ago, but I think that number nine position is still wide open. Uh, Jesus Ferreira, I think, is going to be on the team, but I don't know if has locked down the starting position. I know Greg really likes him. Uh, but at the moments where I think the U.S. men's national team has looked maybe their best in World Cup qualifying, that has included... Uh, Ricardo Pepe and he Ooh. got a goal for um, in Holland now for his club team. Um, he's got a little bit of confidence going. So I want to see if he can kind of carry that forward into um, a relationship with the other attackers, especially with Christian, um, but then also and Gio Reyna. And then also to see how they, uh, if he can just take his opportunities. Cause ultimately that I think if he scores a goal here today, um, it's uh, one, he'd lock down his place. I think for the, for the, for the world cup. Um, so just high stakes. Um, yeah, but I, I, I've always liked him as a player and I think he fits this, fits this team well. Um, but it'll be ultimately down to goals. And here he is. Ismail Kone on the field in place of Sam Piet, the guy you guys both sort of called for. We talked about him a couple of moments ago. So now he gets his opportunity in the 55th minute here to make something happen. And Patrice, I questioned if he was ready because uh, you mentioned it with Kone. There's, there's giant highs and, and there's big lows with the way he plays, but it feels like zero doubt that if you are losing in a game, he is someone who can come on and just make something happen against the run of play. Yeah. What I like about him is he seems to brush off pressure. Like if you've seen the games, if I, if you don't remember the game against Atlanta three, three over there, mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, the first game before their first streak of eight games uh, without a loss, he lost the ball to the goal where Atlanta was leading. And usually sometimes young players, it can uh, 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 balance them. Like they'd be shaky a bit. They might be playing safer 
And what he did the next play around, played the ball, played a diagonal, made a deep run, ended up scoring a goal also, getting an assist. And it's just like you sense, like Kalen was mentioning, there's certain players you just know. You don't know how far they can go, but you know they're going to move forward because their personality, the way, not just their tool set and their talent, it's just their character tells you they're able to go above adversity. The obstacles they're going to gonna face are going to they're going to be able to maneuver through them and then still shine. And he's Malcone, like I told you, I saw him a year ago and I said, man, this kid has something. I just know how I don't know how where it's going to go. But this and I don't didn't know him at the time. He but you know what I like about that, Patrice? And when you mentioned that he wasn't coming through the academy system all the way through and wasn't identified early, I was like, oh, that makes a little bit of sense to me in a way because not because of his talent or anything, because I, I, he jumps off the page. But I, I like players sometimes that have taken non-traditional paths or you look at it speaks to what you're talking about, the character or the mentality of them. And you know, we mentioned Clint Dempsey and his attitude on the pitch. But he, he had a very different path as well from someone like Landon Donovan, who was ID'd very early, he went to college and then the draft and New England and then ended up um, getting to play in the Premier League um, and being really successful there. But I think it was I think that players that sometimes and even Pepe, I think, you know, comes from El Paso and, you know, had to kind of find his way. Um, he was ID'd very early, of course, but I like guys that sometimes have had to, um, you know, especially deal with adversity already. Yeah, but I, what I like also about him in the same sense, the uh, same vein of your ticket, Cal, is I don't know how it is in the States in academies in Toronto or Vancouver when kids don't make the academy of the professional team. Sometimes that could be, a, you know, man, I'm not good enough to be at the academy. And for, in his case, he was seen as just a question of school and everything uh, that made it a bit uh, more difficult for him to come to the academy. So he had been met, seen or me, uh, mentioned about, but he still made his path and still stayed through his game, still grew and still grew enough in his game and his personality to be able to be at the professional ranks and to be confident in what his abilities are and what he's able to bring to the table. And now you see him, he goes, he plays at the international level and you wouldn't say, wow, okay, uh, you 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 don't see he's hesitant. You see in his game the confidence that he'll lose. He has the ball. He'll go at the goal. He might try something not too fancy, but he'll try a pass that maybe you'd say, oh, 18, 19 years old trying that. But you need that confidence. Sometimes you could say that cockiness a bit uh, when you're on the field. And uh, yeah, to the Clint Dempsey, that's what I liked about him when I played against him. He just you just feel like. He didn't care who was in front of him. I dribble. I'll be able to dribble. You doesn't matter. And then boom. And you know, unfazed, if you could say, if that's a better word to choose. And uh, but yeah, he's Malcone. Like I said, people forget he went from amateur to professional. And when I mean amateur, it's not the academy route. It's literally club soccer to professional soccer in a span of a year, and become a prominent talent that now European teams are interested. And are vying for services for millions of dollars or millions of pounds if we talk about uh, English uh, English uh, currency. It's my Kone, one of the bright stars, part of a number of bright stars here for Canada. Trying to uh, scratch their way back in. I thought uh, Nikhil in the YouTube chat made a good point when we talked about the halftime stats. This is a Uruguay team that does want to sit a little deeper and give possession, but Canada has been dominant again in this second half. They've earned a number of corner kicks. They've had most of the ball in the attacking half as my buzzer goes off here to warn me that I am being correct. So you guys talk about that while I walk away. Yeah, but this is where I'm, I'm interested because uh, even though Croatia is a very good team, I don't think they're known to be a very high pressing team. So they might be low block, low block. Of course, they will be able to maintain the ball, but they're not the types. This is where European football are, if you could say higher level football, it's interesting because not all teams are going to high press. A lot of teams are going to stay compact and they're going to take a little bit more of their time and they're going to be efficient when they do have a chance. And now that Uruguay is leading 2-0, they want to show that they can, they can maintain a result. And now forcing Canada to be uh, even more creative in terms of their ball movement and uh, their uh, positional rotation 
and John Herman to maybe see where he tweaks a, t a thing or two to put players in positions to uh, create problems for the back line or at least the offensive line. So that's why, yeah, Uruguay, they're not known to be a possession team. They're known to be fast on transition, transition and counterattack. Uh, as we have seen them to Diego Forlan, Cavani, Luis Suarez when he was at his peak. Uh, so this is interesting for Canada because, yes, they do are dominating with the ball, but are you creating you – know, they, they did create some great chances. It's just are you efficient? You need to score those one or two chances you're going because you might not get as many or the other team is able to score on low, uh, low probability chances, uh, goals. Ugarte on for Betancourt for uh, for this Uruguay team, so it doesn't get any easier. Sporting Lisbon starter, and then Darwin Nunes coming off uh, after his goal, the second goal of the game, one of the top strikers, especially prospects, but already quality in the world. Uh, so a big test there for Canada. Canada you now know, on the attack. You know who I'm surprised I would have thought, but this is purely because of uh, – Uh, it's an emotional attachment is Lucas Cavallini because he yeah. played in Uruguay. So he knows the mindset uh, the Oof. way over there. So oh. big chance there for Johnny David. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big opportunity. So, and I would have so, thought maybe he would have been brought into this game or start this game because, you know, he probably has a somewhat wanting to prove that those guys that he's maybe played against or the country that raised them in a certain sense in terms of soccer, Is soccer acumen because he played there say, when, for, from a very young age. Uh, that would have been interesting. And he's a body that's different also. He's a, he's a physical player uh, different from Larin and, uh, and Jonathan David as a striker. So it, let me ask you about Cavallini because he's suspended right now in MLS because of the red card violence, yeah. whatever it was, in that play. He has not scored a ton, has not played a ton. For Vancouver, it feels like from an emotional point of view, he's going to make the World Cup roster because he's a leader and one of the talkers in this side. But uh, I think a lot of people feel like Ugbo has passed him and maybe some other options. Do, would you have Cavallini in your rotation as a guy that you'd want to see on the field for Canada still? But uh, Yeah, because in terms of the profile, because yeah. like I was mentioning, he's a different type of striker. He's a bit more physical. He likes to... Uh, he has to have that contact, that physicality with the defenders. He's a bit more uh, aggressive in that, that aspect in terms of the box. Might get uh, a foul or two. Uh, he plays on that edge. Uh, maybe that one of the reasons why he, maybe he got that uh, red card and he's got suspension. He kind of plays on that edge. A bit kind of like when you look at Suarez, not to the same extent, but I mean, Uruguayan playing with that grint. That, gr that grit. So, but the thing is, there's some youth that are coming through. There's Coliocho, there's Ukbo. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, we, were talk we talked about Kone. So, are you going to make the choice to bring somebody who's youthful and probably going to be here in the next four years? While Cavallini, will he be in the group in the next four years? You don't know. Maybe, yes. Uh, so, those are questions that when you're a coach, oh. you're going to make that choice for Okay, profile. Uh, do we have too many similar types of players so we might need somebody different? Or youth, exuberant, audacious who might come and for 10 minutes able to change things because he's not going to care if he's playing at the World Cup. He just wants to shine and prove that he, he's the best player out there. So uh, going to be into interesting choices uh, uh, in the final stretch for John Herman. But he's shown that he's gonna, he leads with the confidence of the people who have led him here. That means most of the players are still there, players who have been in the octagon or who've been with the group for the last two years and a half. Yeah, we've heard Herdman talk about loyalty a lot. Um, and it was, let's be honest, because Patrice, you lived through it for years, but like it has not always been considered glamorous and special to go to play for Canada. And so I think Herdman's been trying to respect that loyalty. And when you think back to the beginning of World Cup qualifying, playing the Cayman Islands at IMG in front of no fans, with, you know, in the middle of COVID, it was Cavallini, it was Kamal Miller, it was Sam Piet, uh, over and over again, who were traveling to those camps. And so it feels like they are all at least safely on the roster. Question yeah. then, how much but, they would then play? Uh, I think like for Sam Piet, but he, he, you've seen it now that Atiba's not there and also is not there. 
he steps in right away. So you, mm -hmm. you see the confidence that John Herman has in him as a leader of the group and as a player and a skill set of what he brings to the group. I think also it's just every coach. Kaylin, you know, how many teams have you played? It's always been the same 11 or 12 or 13 or 14 players who play uh, because the coach trusts in those players of their, what they bring to the table or every time he's used them, they've proven him right. Yeah. And so the coach goes, and this is not just John Herman. I think most national team yeah. coaches, when you look through the squad that's chosen at the end, there's usually one or two or three players out, out, but the rest, it's been the main player. The same players have been called in because you know, the players, you have stability, you've created a bond with those players. You know what they're going to bring to you. And then also it probably knows the personality of those players. Some <laughs> of them know they're not, going to be main stars, but they're part of the group and they bring something to the table and he's engaged them to believe in, in the path that they led them to make into the world cup. So I think you're going to see maybe one or two, three tops, but I don't see that many changes. And now there's 26 people on the roster. So you have three players extra you can put in compared to before was 23. So, but I don't see many new, I don't see many new faces. Some might not be there for in not being in form, and they're not 11 starters, uh, not, uh, starting 11 regular, uh, or others who like Joe Waterman, who I would say if there's a conversa conversation, Donnell Henry has been there for quite some time and is a player that probably John Herman trusts because he's used them mm -hmm. against Mexico to bring the physicality. But this year, difficult to get the minutes. Change from LAFC to Toronto. While Joel Waterman has been a mainstay in Montreal, one of the top two defenders utilized by Wilfred Nassi and shown that he's not just a depth player, he's now a starting 11 LS player. So is that somebody John Herman's going to say, you know what, maybe he's an informed player that I need to bring into the group and I keep. And I know he plays with Miller and, and, uh, and uh, Johnston. Right. So in case Vittorio or Kennedy were to go down, I can trust that he's in sync with those players mm. and he, he can play the part. So those are questions that John Herman will have to uh, to answer and fill in. I think Shout that's out. a really good point. The chemistry, especially if you're looking in the back, um, having that relationship where you're getting minutes playing week in, week out with these guys that are fixtures into the team. And I think about that even from the standpoint of the U.S. of like, building relationships and i i always used to approach it where i was like if i'm with brian ching or if i like uh if i want to be on the field and i'm with brian mcbride or cuatemoc blanco like i need to play well with them <laughs> so i was Ooh. trying to keep the manager happy but i was trying to keep the star on the team happy so i knew that if i built a good relationship i was going to become essential and then ultimately when it came down to some of those conversations or tough choices you have somebody else who's also working on your behalf in a way. So I think uh, being, I think Paul Ariola and smart Jesus man, Ferreira, Kaelin, yeah. smart man. <laughs> hang out with, hang out with the, <laughs> not all strikers are just completely self selfish <laughs> <laughs> or selfish Kaelin. in a different type of way. Maybe. <laughs> Kalen's a businessman. So yeah, he, he's always thinking, Oh, no, but it's the game. Also you, you, you create uh, cohesion in sync when you play with players, like take example, uh, us and Canada, uh, you're not going to base your national team on like certain countries where you have most of your players from FC Bayern Munich or FC right. Barcelona. And mm -hmm. why are, why is that? Because they play in and out together. They play high level football together. So the coach knows when I'm going to put them together, they know each other. They, they don't even need to talk. They have nonverbal communication. And that may be something that Joe Waterman uh, for him to make the roster, not being a starter, but make the roster goes, you know what? I do believe in Donald Henry. He brought me in. But right now, Joel Waterman is in form. He's performing. He's going to go into the playoffs. That means he's playing soccer even further down the line in October. And he, he, he connects with players that are already in the group where if I have to put him in, I might not have too much complications of a guy who's going to have to adapt to the group and, and, the, and the style of play of the players around him. He also plays in a back three, which I think goes for him. Exactly. As well. So the things and he, he can play in the middle group. of the back three or right center back. Right. So and he's comfortable on the ball in terms of how Canada is 
in terms of a ball type playing team now. Uh, we have a graphic of this, the lineup right now that's out there for Canada uh, that we're going to throw up. If you haven't been paying attention, the substitutes, we, we've sort of brought you them as they've come along. But Junior Hoylet playing at that, that right wing back position now. Ismail Kone at center mid as well. And then the rest of the pieces the same, just the two changes so far. Six available for, um, for John Herdman in a friendly. I don't know how many windows. He's allowed to do them in. Obviously, the Hoylet one won't count as it was a halftime sub. Uh, Ustakio has been in some physical battles the last few minutes here. Um, yeah, he, Kalen you know, and, and I always thought he was going to be a, a offensive player, but Ustakio, he likes to be involved in the mix. He's a, a player that I thought would be a final third player because, yeah. you know, he's good on the ball, but he likes, he's got that greediness also. He, he doesn't present himself as the type of player, but when you look at him play, he gets stuck in. He uh, he passes. He wants to be on the ball consistently. He doesn't just want to stay forward and say, "Hey, you get me the ball." He wants to be the main guy dictating the play. So Estaki was a really interesting player that I like, and I'd love to see him more offensive. But uh, he he has not good. had the easiest game here. It feels like he's kind of been on an island a lot of hey, not the touches two- he wants. Yeah, that's why I, I'm curious. Me personally, I would have loved to see Alfonso go wing back, get the mm-hmm. ball, go at people, or use his pace like he does uh, uh, against uh, with Bayern Munich, and get Junior with Ostaku in the midfield, and then those guys connect because the midfield dictates the game. And if yeah. you don't dominate that midfield, no matter how you see it in terms of recovering the ball or playing the ball. You, you you don't create enough or you suffer in terms of running uh, against the ball. So. I, I think that's where some of the depth questions have, have hurt Canada if you look at this match where you don't have um, the depth in center midfield and then even at wing back. So you use Hoylet maybe in a spot that um, Tejan Buchanan, if he were a little fitter, maybe he could go yeah. from the beginning in that position, but he's not quite ready yet. So even for a halftime substitution, probably not ready for that. So then you use Hoylet in that spot as opposed to in the middle. Um, and then you're also going deeper down into the reserves when you don't have uh, Hutchinson, you don't have um, Osorio as well. So um, I mentioned, you know, cramming for a test, but it's it's tough when you don't have all the chapters of the book. You know, you, you're, mm-hmm. you're missing some pages here to, to be able to pull out. So um that was for the guy who said he liked that. that yeah, uh, it was. Yeah. Kaylin, was, uh... I appreciate you leaning on your successes. <laughs> uh, I like that. Um, with you, what you mentioned though, Patrice, would you, in, in that scenario, do you push Adekube in as a center back, quote unquote, or are you dropping? No. Uh, are you I, dropping no. him? You're dropping Miller. Why not put uh, Alfonso right wing back and just put Junior inside the mix in the midfield? Got it. Got uh, it. And you know, sometimes the, the factor is I've always been curious in that because I know coaches have their main frame idea and then they don't like to change it too much. But sometimes you need to have improvisation in your tactical elements because yeah. the other team won't expect it. And you're putting Junior Rollet in a scenario where he's going to be more involved. And uh, Fonso right now has not been so much of a threat. But at Bayern Munich, he plays wing back, and when he comes from a deeper position, you're using his pace, and then he comes at you, and then that's dangerous. So that's where I'd like to see some little nuances or changes that are not part of the playbook, because the playbook is 95%. Uh, I always like Zidane, because he said, I follow the script 95%, but I leave myself a 5% gap, because sometimes the games, the game tells you this is what Mm -hmm. it needs. Yeah. And uh, and in this moment, I'm like, Junior Olet, he's a good player with the ball in tight spaces. Get him into the tight spaces. Get him around mm-hmm. the ball. Let him make those flick passes or nudge through players because he's got low center of gravity. So uh, that's just me. Maybe I play too much football manager or whatever. But that's <laughs> <just me. laughs> uh, reminded of everyone out there, final 15 minutes or so here of the Canada-Uruguay game. 2-0 lead right now for Uruguay. Uh, We will stay on here on the MLS Twitch and YouTube pages and just a quick changeover between the Canada game and the U.S.-Saudi Arabia game, which is coming up in 25 minutes. Susanna Collins, Charlie Davies, and Tom Bogart will be on that one for you. So you don't have to go anywhere. Uh, You just got to keep your screens up and stay in the chat 
talking to us. What do you think so far about this counter result? What do you want to ask Patrice and Kalen about? What do you want to hear them talk about? Uh, put it in the YouTube and Twitch chats. We're in both of those. Um, so keep it up, guys. And we are, fingers crossed, hoping for a Canada goal. It would be a nice way to sort of close this one out, whether it's a 2-1 loss or not. But it would be nice. Yeah, it would be nice. Just give them the confidence to know that, look, you know what? We, we maybe took that early goal from a free kick. But generally, if you take those details out, it would have been a 1-1 game. That's yeah. what the, the, you could come out of it and tell yourself. Because uh, we mentioned at the beginning, it plays on the details of free kick right now, and uh, yeah, the goal of Nunez. But if Canada scores, at least they know we can score against these teams, and we need to, you know, fine tune these other aspects of our game, especially on the defensive uh, defensive end. But it tells us what we we ex we had the questions of, okay, they're gonna play a team that will give them more problems or verticality that Qatar didn't bring, and uh, and we we're seeing that now does feel like the guys who are new to it, Kamal Miller, Alistair Johnson, guys like that, their game's elevated as this game's gone along. It's Junior Hollette, a little half chance there to get it in the box. There's been some good opportunities for Canada in the second half, a ton of possession, a ton of push. They've turned, uh, they've turned Uruguay over a couple times as well in the attacking half. Yes, hey, now the thing also is can't, Uruguay's leading 2-0. So, and they're the type of team that will defend like this. They mm -hmm. have that grittiness to be able to protect the lead. So this is what's, what's really interesting because Canada, you know, they're getting uh, frustrated because now the first half they had clear cut chances, but now the second half, it's not as clear. They're pulling five at the back, Uruguay. They're, you're just seeing Alfonso Davies, what we wanted to see from him. Take yeah, there off you people, go. Break the line. Final, final pass. And just look at the body language after the pass. This is what they need to go through because before they'd have success. Now they're not having that moment of success. And uh, as we're seeing, uh, Tejan Buchanan will make his appearance. So let's see what he brings to the table in this game. First game since July 11th for Tejan, dealing with a couple muscle injuries, trying to come back. Uh, looks like Theo Corbinu as well yeah, coming on. Too. Some young talents coming in, so... So Adekube is one of the players coming off. He will come off in place of Tejan. Um, wing back for wing back swap there, although a little bit more attacking verve from Tejan. And it looks like Steven Vittoria is the one to come off for Corbino. So a back four, at least. Maybe a back two. <laughs> if you have Hoylet and Tejan as two of them, as John Herdman pushing for that goal, trying to go attacking here. Yeah, I think the, the reality is the good thing is you've seen that John Herman, the principles and the concepts of play are in, are in two, uh, the players, they know it. So mm -hmm. no matter where he brings a player in, he knows what he's supposed to be doing. Now the talent or the skill set of a player brings something different. Uh, as you mentioned, they're playing two, but they know they have to cover the gaps. They're playing a two, three, five. So if I'm uh, um, completely out wide or I'm in the pockets or I'm playing – in the three in front of the defense. From what I've heard also, they've been working very hard tactically to be able to be unpredictable or be able to uh, to have more flexibility, mm. meaning they can interchange during the, the game and that he can bring players in and they don't, you know, Kalen, we've seen coaches, they put players in, but then the whole system goes apart and then <laughs> players are just playing off uh, intuition. And now he's maintaining a structure so that the players there are not too lost when it's time to defend, especially because sometimes we had coaches who, yeah, we're putting four forwards on, but then we lose the ball and nobody's defending or nobody wears, knows where to defend. And then you get caught on the counter and you lose the ball. So you have Leo Corbeanu on the field, Tejan Buchanan, uh, Ostakio still there, Hoyle still there, Laren, David. You know, Potentially they have six players that are offensive players mm -hmm. on the field. And they'll be able to maintain shape, which is, uh, is something inter inter uh, good that uh, that you can ma you, you can manage that with all those offensive players on the field. We came in saying the question mark was, can they scale their game up to this higher level? We've heard, um, you know, Herdman uses the line tier one is the term yeah. he uses a lot for top five league, best 
you know, best players in the world. Uruguay, yes. he called them a tier one team. Um, Diego Rossi coming on the field, by the way. At where we sit right now, let's say it ends at 2-0 um, with, with 10 minutes left. Kalen, it feels, we've talked about it a bunch, that Canada has shown they can play at this level. They will lose 2-0. How do you take good things from this while not being okay with losing? Well, here I well, can we go into this uh, tier one comment a little bit from yeah. Herdman? Because I, I thought <laughs> you want me to was, explain it. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to hear what Patrice has to say about this because it sounded to me like a little bit of like managing expectations or trying to lower some of the. Uh, um... No, I'm gonna explain it to you. Is John Herdman is is very methodical, plans everything. He has studied everything, and he has studied teams that gone all the way to the final. Mm-hmm. And what has he come out of it is those play teams that go all the way to the end, they have a significant amount of tier one, meaning Premier League, Bundesliga, Serie A, La Liga players in their starting 11, not just in their squad, in their starting 11. And uh, knowing that when you're playing those types of teams, they have those players that are not all difference makers, but they play at that highest level. And he's he looked at, you know, because if you look, Canada, who are the top tier one players? So can I just ask that? Is is a FC Porto starter, an Ajax starter? Do those count as tier one? No, nah, tier one is you're playing Premier League. Plus those five leagues. Champions League, meaning okay. you're, you're in the top level of football at club level and at Champions League level. Yes, there's certain teams you're playing for Ajax the top level teams, but meaning that, you know, you have Alfonso Davies who's at Bayern Munich and he's playing Champions League and he's playing uh, title every year, number one and playing in Bundesliga relatively in the top three leagues in the world. Sure. And those are tier one players. Uh, if you could take uh, Pulisic, uh, McKinney, all of them, they're tier one players. They play in the, they play in the highest level possible at club level. Um Okay, so I would say that Canada has three tier one players because I would put Ustakio in that combo. Yes, I know you just explained in. it to me. He's now but... jumped into that, but he wasn't that before he got into Porto. Yeah, and then you have I also David, yeah Davies and David, and then you have a, a, a you have a, that would be yes, it. Ustakio. Those would be the three. Yeah, I also think the World Cup has the power to change that because if Canada goes out and yes. plays well. Suddenly you see the way we talked about how teams go out into the market. And you saw, I remember in past World Cups, like Senegal in 2002, where suddenly you saw all their players, they beat France and every, everybody went and bought all the Senegalese players. And we're like, wow, they're all playing in France right now. Why are they, uh, why are they not in the Premier League or why are they somewhere else? So I could see Canada having that type of moment where if they do well in this tournament, recognizing some of the talent, whether it's guys already in Europe, um, playing but now can they get a bigger move um because they've scored a goal in the world cup or whether it's um some guys in mls where they recognized co i saw alistair johnson against uh right. you know whoever and i this guy you know held strong and so i think i think there's a possibility to change that and i i think that you're right though i hadn't thought about it that way but if you're looking towards the future and saying Uh, because the expectations are not for Canada to go deep into the tournament and win the World Cup, right? If they if they get out of the group, it'd be an incredible um accomplishment. Why, Um, why, 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 why? Because it's a tough group. (laughs) That's a tough group. I I think they can do it though. I do, and I do think that these guys will will be able to uh I think there'll be some guys that will make big moves after the World Cup because I think I'm I'm behind it. I'm on the squad, Patrice. You don't need to no, no, but we all know the uh, World Cup is a showcase. Yeah. And uh, you know, Kellen, certain people in the world of football still perceive MLS as saying, okay, some good talents there, but how do they perceive, how, what's their level compared to high level Europe? Well, right. when you go to the World Cup, many players have made big moves for their career or have made a World Cup of their career and performing. Now the great thing is Canada, the team is young also. So now mm-hmm. it's Johnson, a, a Kamal Miller, and so on. They perform well. People are going to say, wait, okay, they did well against Lukaku <laughs> or Luka Modric. Yeah. Wow, wait, maybe they can do this in the Premier League or in Bundesliga. 
because I can see that they managed it at the highest level international stage, which is what the World Cup is. Maybe they didn't even know who they were or they knew a little bit about them before the World Cup. So, yes, it's true. It's a showcase. If you do well in Canada, were to have a good performance, maybe upset one of the perform uh, one of the games, people are going to pay attention to that because they already know Alfonso Davies and Jonathan David. They know a little bit more of Kyle Larian because he's been in Europe or Atiba Hutchinson, Besiktas or Tejan Buchanan. But the other ones who are faring MLS or in other leagues that are not considered prominent, they they're it's it's a it's your you know your 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 showcase moment. So if you perform, maybe somebody's going to come knock at your door and say, hey, you know what? Or knock at your club's door, say, yeah, we would like that talent. How much is going to take to take them out from their contract or their reality of where they are at in MLS or somewhere else to bring them to a bigger stage? And there's a couple guys on this team that feels like I've bet on themselves, Sam Atacube, Kyle Laren, where they could be on free contracts. They could get moves if they perform and are, and are in that position. So it's a really good time for a lot of these players. Um, and an exciting time. So final few moments here. Reminder, we've got USA, Saudi Arabia coming up in just a moment. That game, I believe, on FS1 and Univision 2DNA down in the U.S. Uh, and Susanna Collins, Charlie Davies, and Tom Bogart will take you through that one. So when this one ends, we'll sign off pretty quickly and flip over to them, which means final thoughts here, even though we've got four minutes to watch and fingers crossed, hopefully get a Canada goal. Uh, Kaylin, you first. Sort of what do you what do you walk away from this game with? And walk away from this window with well I, for, you get one win against a world cup team in qatar and a really good performance from the start and here i think you learn a valuable lesson about um you know how small the margins are and how when you start going against the top teams which canada is going to be in a group of, of teams that are of you know uruguay's caliber um one small play a foul on top of the box a slip out on the wing and suddenly it's lights out. And then suddenly you're, you have a tough task in the second half where I think Uruguay has been a lot more content just to give up the ball, make it difficult, bring numbers around da uh, Davies and just, you know, saying, good luck, break us down. What, what do you have? And Canada have created some chances, but have mostly had a lot of the ball, but not been able to create um, enough to, to really um, threaten. And then look, the first half, I think there were some chances that they'll look back on and say, what did we do in those in those moments? How can we be more efficient? Um, because at, at times we've seen Canada, that, you know, they have the finishers, but I think they're used to volume of chances. But the, the higher the quality opponent, um, those chances shrink. And then um, today they weren't good enough in, in those in those moments in the first half, especially. Patrice, for you. Uh, for me, at the end of the day, for one, you see, you show that you didn't get outclassed because mm -hmm. maybe some people say, okay, they're really far from that level. You're not that far, but it's details. This is why this country has won the World Cup. It has the prominent players they have and has fared well in the past in World Cups. I think you, you get the answers to the questions. How do you defensively manage against a team that has guys like Nunez and Luis Suarez that can change the game. Uh, but I could look at it, take away the free kick if they were to score. We create chances. We need to be a bit more efficient because we played against a team that we create chances, but we didn't score. So if we don't score off the few chances we might create, uh, it, it, it will be difficult. Or at least we're making it more difficult for ourselves. Uh, so but at the end of the day, no, I think it's a result I think people expected. But the performance is solid, meaning you're not outmatched and that you can go out there and it's just to bolster your defensive aspects and the details. So Canada, yeah, and think about it. Atiba's not here. So if you add him on to that, maybe Jonathan Ozor also. Tejan Buchanan was, is not at his full fitness. So you mm -hmm. have five, six weeks to tweak things and play Japan and come in knowing, like, wait a minute, okay, we we now we're better at this and that we're, last and match we're, is huge too i think having one yes. more match to know that you have a uh, time to get some of these guys back healthy hopefully um you get yes. your full group again and you go against a japan team that we saw um some real quality against the u.s with so uh they still have some time for her i mentioned cramming but seriously you take every opportunity you can before the world cup uh to to get your group together and uh, they have a big one still remaining with uh 
with Japan um, just before the World Cup starts. Awesome. Hey, by the way, I was going to ask you guys, what, uh, what's the word uh, about US, USA right now? Because the last loss <laughs> wasn't bad. great. It's bad. Uh, so Patrice. I just want to take your, your don't go on the this. internet, Patrice. Don't yeah. go on Twitter. You'll you'll find some terrible things. <laughs> People because <laughs> I like Greg Berhalter. Me, I'm a, a big fan of Greg Berhalter in the way uh, he uh, he goes about things and the way he wants his teams to play. Uh, but I did see the game against Japan. It's just yeah. curious to see uh, uh, USA has even more pressure because you guys been accustomed to going to the World Cup for several years now, several World Cups. Well, we're the best team in the history of the world, Patrice. So the expectations <laughs> are super high. <laughs> I want to see just people. a response. I, I'm interested to see what the response is today because okay. I think the big part was the the questions were asked about their mentality or the personality of the group. So I, yeah. I'm I'm looking to see what kind of uh, response you get, especially early on in this uh, in this next match. But you can I all will... stay here. We've got we've got uh we got a good crew coming on for that. Yeah, in in just a moment, I I'll I'm gonna echo what you guys said by the way in terms of reaction to this camp of uh, we knew the the three tier one players we had talked about, but I think all the other pieces showed they could play at this level, and that's was unknown coming into this camp. So I think that's a huge moment for Canada uh, just to feel that they can be who they are against the best teams in the world, and now. It is those little details. Can they get them right? Can they be sharp? But even, you know, Tejan hasn't played in, what, four or five months? And he comes on and he looks sharp right now and creating some openings against this Uruguay side. So I think overall a really positive window for Canada with the belief that, yeah, if you had a Jonathan Osorio making runs out of midfield in this game or a Tiba pulling the strings from deep, it probably would have looked uh, even better. So uh, a fun one so far in this one. Fingers crossed people out there on the internet feel the same way as us and are, uh, are relative to the reality of, of what's gone on as Alfonso Davies will take this final free kick, probably last chance of this one for Canada. Hoping for that goal. Davies floats it in, headed away. Uh, and as Caitlin said, we've got the USA Saudi Arabia watch along coming up for you as Junior Holette. We'll flash that shot over the top, and that'll be the final there whistle for us. So thank you to all of you out there in the chat uh, for being with us. Nikhil, you are a legend. Stay Verde as well. So many other people out there. Louvert, who was in Toronto when, uh, when Canada clinched against Jamaica. Thank you, all of you, for hanging out with us and watching. And, of course, thank you to you two, Kaylin Carr and Patrice Bernier, for being here with me and uh, chatting this whole time. Always fun to hang out and watch the games. And hopefully... Next time we do this, we'll be at a World Cup, and uh, it's going to be a fun one for Canada, the first one. Well, the USA, side. Canada in the next round? I'm looking for Final. <laughs> Let, let's I don't know final. about the final, but next round, that's, that's already that would be a, a plus. It would be amazing. It would be the best thing that ever happened. I'd be so excited about that. So all of you out there, stick right here on MLS YouTube and Twitch page. And Susanna Collins will be with you in just a moment to take you into the USA-Saudi Arabia game. Thank you all for watching and enjoy the rest of the day.
What is good, everybody? Welcome to our MLS watch along of the U.S. taking on Saudi Arabia. This is the final tune up for the U.S. before they head to the World Cup in Qatar in less than two months. Oh, my goodness. I can't even believe it. I'm Susanna Collins. So excited you guys could join us uh, today. I am hanging with two of my faves, Charlie Davies and Tom Bogert. Tom Bogert getting the call up today. He's filling in for Matt Doyle. But this is like the super sub moment, Tom. We're we're absolutely thrilled to have you. Um, how are you guys feeling? <laughs> oh! Okay. Charlie's always bringing the good vibes. Um, guys, this is, okay, as I said, this is the final tune-up before Qatar. And I will tell you, that game against Japan left a really bad taste in my mouth. That is not, that's not the lasting impression that I want to have of this team as we gear up for the first World Cup that the U.S. will play in in, in eight years. So I'm just gonna, like right off the bat, Charlie Davies, what do you want to see from the U.S. today? A goal would be great. What frustrates everybody uh, in, in that Japan match watching was the lack of imagination. Uh, yeah. We made it very predictable and we didn't really attack. There, there, there wasn't an, enough of an effort and no. an aggression forward to get in behind. How many times did we see Sergio Dest, who's supposed to be a world-class right back, a young world-class right back in the making, mm -hmm. get forward? Maybe once, really, that where, where the cross went to Jesus Ferreira, who needs to finish. But ultimately, there just wasn't enough in the first half. Second half was better, but not to the level and the quality that it should be. So for me, I think it was really frustrating watching this group kind of take two steps backwards. It wasn't mm -hmm. even a step back. It was two steps backward. Um, so I want to see them be a little bit more aggressive and, and test, be threatening, because they weren't in that game against Japan. Yeah, 100%. Tom, you're shaking your head. You uh, in a, a agreement with Charlie Davies here. Yeah, I mean, always that that's part of my contract to agree with Charlie and Hype Man. Uh, yes. But for, for today, I mean, look, we could talk about tactics. We could talk about how disappointing it was that they couldn't play out of the back or by press or deal with Japan's press at all. They didn't create overloads wide or essentially it, it seemed, you know, too vanilla, too slow. Everything was too slow. So even not even talking about tactics, though, I want to see more intensity from this group. I want to see more desire. I don't even mm -hmm. care how clean it is necessarily. I, I want them to win 50-50s. I want them to be you know on the front foot for all these duels uh like charlie i was going to kick it back to you for from throughout your career whether it was at the national team or at club level i'm sure that there have been games where you guys have you know had low intensity or, or whatever the coaching staff was upset about effort or, or whatever you want to call it what is that like in the days leading up to the next game after that is all the training sessions just competitions to try to get everybody back into like that competitive spirit or like what what are those team talks like well I, i've been kind of in both situations where you're coming off a game where you lacked intensity and urgency and it wasn't good enough. So you have guys that are angry. They, they approach mm. the training anger with, with a kind of desire to get the next game because they want to make up for the mm. performance in, in the prior game. I've also played in a game where you were just out competed by a better team and it just wasn't good enough. So your your the trainings are, ma'am, I want to earn my spot. Maybe there's an opportunity for me to slide in and, and I wasn't a starter. And we're seeing in this game alone, DeAndre Yedlin gets into the right back spot and he's oh. a veteran. So instead of of being, you know, a, a backup right back, he gets an opportunity where Dest is your right back and he's moved to the left side because they trust him over a, a Sam Ooh. Vines or a Scally. And then Kellen Acosta comes into the team. And I don't think anyone expected that because I mean, a, a lot of people would not expect to see Brandon Aronson on the bench, given that Eunice Musa isn't in the squad, given that mm. Timo Weah is not in the squad. So it, it's a it's a risk, if you will, for a friendly, even though there's nothing on the line, except for uh, kind of support and, for everything. And, and, and confidence and, and everything going, <laughs> going into <laughs> Qatar. So uh, this group needs this game. And I think in particular, the players who are getting their opportunity need to take it. Yeah, 100%. Um, for those of you watching along with us, just if you want to sync your your clocks, I am at a minute 15 right now into oh, uh, into this too. game. I know. We already had a uh, a Saudi shot on goal. Turner had to make save. Just, you know, we're, it's, it's, it's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> also, guys, we are we're monitoring both the YouTube and the Twitch chat here. So 
whatever you see. If you have questions, comments, thoughts, um, please let us know in the chat. And uh, I will do my best to stay on top of that and uh, get those get those into into this stream. Um, Tom, I want to throw this to you. We um, the, you had it. You you had an issue with. Uh, some of the the, ish, the the starting lineup. There was a there was one thing in particular that you said you were a li- that what did you you said you dubious. used the word dubious dubious, <laughs> and I was so impressed with the use of the word dubious. But can you um, elaborate on on what you saw here? Yeah, I, I, I dubious. I don't love invert an inverted fullback and an inverted winger on the same side. I would yeah. prefer one of those two spots on so the left side of the u.s national team right now we have dest who's a naturally right-footed player he can play both sides but naturally his right foot's going to take him inside christian pulisic is a natural right-footed player and in addition to that when he plays left wing he plays super inverted with the national team because he's getting on the ball a lot he's the captain he's the best attacking player um so there's going to be a lot of uh, reductive qualities between those two and there's not going to be a lot of natural wit so i don't love that i think that an inverted fullback could work fine but I'd rather it be a, uh, somebody with their dominant foot on that side. I don't, I'm not sure if the national team has any left-footed wingers to begin with, so maybe this is a non-starter. But I, I like. I think this really highlights how much this team cannot deal with Anthony Robinson missing many minutes at all. Mm. In the World what, Cup. what 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 it spells is unbalanced. Mm. Yeah, you look at this group, and you're already seeing Sergio Dest tuck in so so deep, and he's late to get out. Oh. That was a nice ball. The the attacking players have more space to operate. Oh. Oh, okay. Listen, I'm, you know, it just doesn't take much. What minute are you on? Just so you, so I. (laughs) I'm on three, three twenty right now. I'm on three. Am I ahead of y'all? Okay. You're ahead of me. Charlie, what are you? We're going to have one of those situations. I'm on three, three, two, 23, 24. Oh, my wife, like coming in last year. You hate to see it. <laughs> but I, 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 I like that we got an offside call already. And, and, Pepe, and Ricardo Pepe is towing the line. Like, get him that, behind. That's where the ball okay. is right now, that we're just happy Listen. that somebody ran forward. We'll uh, take un- what un- we can get. Unfortunately, <laughs> four minutes into the game, that is that is where good, the ball I feel like that's is, a good time. Okay. Against Look, life is all about managing expectations. If you keep the bar low, we're going to be happy. Let's go. I love it. Did Tom, did you I'm, just I'm drop the like... name of your podcast into the stream? <laughs> yeah, On purpose. Sure it's one of the things that I use all the time. I saw, I, listen, I appreciate that and I respect it. Well done. Um, if you guys haven't listened to Tom's <laughs> podcast, Managing Expectations, you should. Um, Charlie, on, on the topic of Ricardo Pepe, um, he's getting mm-hmm. the start today up top i mean this is a guy like you think about a year ago like how excited we all were about the prospect of ricardo pepe yes. solidifying that number nine spot in this u.s men's national team roster um he obviously it's it was not um a great year for him at augsburg he now has a goal and assist with fc groningen 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 did Gronin- i pronounce Gronin- it again groningen groningen i tried i tried really you, got, you know really you got hard. it how do you feel about the prospect of Ricardo Pepe, uh, number one, making this U.S. men's national team roster for the World Cup, but also, you know, like being the guy? Is there still time and room for him to take that role? There is just because of the trust that he's built with Greg, Ber- Greg Berhalter, because think about it. Their backs were against the wall. They were on the verge of being in a really difficult. Oh, my gosh, this is nice passage of play. Here. OK, OK, oh, it, it got it was offside. Um, what I like the blue kits, oh. I'm feeling them. I don't know. You guys can't tell me you're not feeling the no, blue kits. No, I, I, Charlie, I was, I was, I, okay, don't even get me started on those warm up jerseys that they were <laughs> wearing because those were just a I like complete them, eyesore. So. <laughs> complete eyesore. Um, I can get down with this blue kit. Yeah, the blue this kit. Is the, this, I, is the I, saving, I like this is the saving, this is the saving grace. But, yes. but I think, um, for, for Ricardo Pepe, you, you are in a great, rhythm and form under Greg Berhalter. You had this trust, but the move to Germany really threw threw him off because all of a sudden you're in this diff- different atmosphere where what you've done in the past means nothing. You have to yeah. build all these new relationships. And in a lot of cases, maybe they don't play a certain style that benefits you and you have to adapt to their style. And you're not given time because of the relegation battle. You what? There are a number of reasons that can alter your play. And in that short amount of time, which you don't have considering you're qualifying for World Cup and it's it's right on top of you and your team needs points now, this move comes at, at the best for him. Okay. A move where the coach believes in him is going to give him an opportunity, which he wasn't going to get in, mm-hmm. in Germany, in his position. In a league that's 
really open for strikers to 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 score goals. It's it's a a very attack minded league, the Dutch era divisie. So I'm excited for him. I, it looks like he's he's starting <gasps> to come alive again. And hey, with when when Ricardo Pepe is playing at his best, he is the best. Life is good for this group. Life is good when Ricardo Pepe is scoring goals. What did you guys make of what Burhalter said? Um, I believe it was yesterday when he said, "Look, I don't need him to score five goals. I just need him to play like a forward." in this system what uh, tom what, what what was your reaction i was, I, was one of those days where i had just had to turn off twitter there's a lot of people <laughs> who were very angry about it. i thought it was a really benign quote i, I thought it was yeah. like a, a nothing quote you know what i mean and there was yeah. a lot of people then you know obviously turning it about p folk or turn it into whatever it's like oh where where were you when what you oh you needed his goals against honduras and it, it's like i don't think he's saying he doesn't want him to score i think he's 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 trying to point out that there's more to playing center forward than just scoring and, and it being binary of you play well if you scored or he didn't so i thought yeah. he was trying to take the pressure off of him rather than i don't know i think people either read too much into it or or got a little too worked up yeah, yeah i also think this was coming on the heels of a very terrible performance yeah uh, and where they literally did not have a shot on goal and so it was like <laughs> no we need goals greg like what are you talking about like have you watched this team um i just want to give some love to a couple guys on the chat stay verde has been with us all day we love you and he agrees with me. He oh, said you got the, real New York right there. All he said day. the blue all day. <laughs> the blue, the blue kits are better than the white. Paint splatter is trash though. So he was he's stay verde is with me. And also, guys, we have a question from uh Kev Brew. What's up, Kev Brew on the Twitch chat? He wants to know he says, I know it's early, but what are you guys sipping on? And I will start. I have um an iced coffee that may or may not have a little Bailey's in there. Okay. Okay. It might. We got a shot yeah. on target. We got a shot on target. Oh, you're ahead of me. We we uh we we made some uh, quick adjustments to get ahead of this race. That's what happened. Okay, Weston. That's better. That's better from Weston. It is. Are you guys? Uh, so, am I alone? Am I the only? <laughs> am I the lone person here? No, you guys, solidarity, I, I, please. Yeah, I. I uh... I was coaching kids all weekend, so <laughs> my my levels dropped, and I think I I you know I'm drinking orange juice and and emergency and uh, and, and tea. You're and, recovering. And, yeah, recovering. I'm, I'm recovering. Recovering. Uh, I know your immune my... system, unlike right. Doyle's, that, that's a, he could have used some of that. I have I... a lot of kids, and you know what <laughs> you, you know what kid I'm coaching a youth a youth soccer team in my town, and I'm coaching mm -hmm. a youth football team. And these are all first graders. Can you imagine? Oh my a lot Lord. of high fives. <laughs> what are, you know? you're, you're, co you're coaching a youth football team too? Yeah. What, what is, is there any different coaching qualities to Charlie Davies, the soccer coach, <laughs> for Charlie Davies, the football Great coach? Great question. Actually, I, I want to say they're very similar because <laughs> I played I played Pop Warner football. It was like my first love. And so wow. I, I have a good – sense of of how to play the game especially at this age and teaching them like mm -hmm. angles and um and kind of jukes and hitting 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 the hole so you're it's teaching actually, jukes at first yeah. grade yeah <laughs> damn so it's it's awesome i and i have where awesome were you when i was a me. kid <laughs> yeah God. i just make it fun that's, i would just run right into do. people like i was just like ah! <laughs> it's fine they called me crash it's, it's call it. that's a pretty cool nickname <laughs> Does anyone? Oh, uh, what? what how do you uh, feel about if they win this game one zero? Are you? Yeah, I, oh, honestly, okay, it's Pepe? better. It's better than than nothing. Honestly, I just think they need a positive result here. Like, I I want mm -hmm. to see a goal. I want to see some. There has to be progress. There has to be progress from the last game because that cannot be what we are left with as we head into the last two months before Qatar. And it's just, you know, it's concerning if they are not able to make adjustments because in a World Cup, guess what? Like, you're going to have to adjust all the time, quickly, mm -hmm. on the fly. And so if they can make some adjustments and and put together, create some chance. I just, like, Charlie, like you said, creativity. You know, like, it's just, that's what I need to see. And so I, if that if, if that's a one-nil win, then I will yeah. take it. Yeah. No, I, I, what, I was, what I would say is, it's clear that Japan are be are a better team than Saudi Arabia. Clear, mm -hmm. just in, in terms of an identity, the way they defend and, and the way they press and attack as a team. Clearly, better. It's mm -hmm. it's much more organized. Given that in the first twelve minutes, 
Huge improvement from the U.S. Just playing balls in behind. Midfield runs from Weston McKinney starting deep and just, mm-hmm. just saying, hey, let's go. And so when they're run- making these runs in behind, you can see all the space it's creating in the midfield. So mm. this is this is a big step forward considering where we were against Japan. Now, this yeah. is something we should be doing all the time. Oh. And a team like Saudi Arabia, with our quality, we should we should run them. It should it shouldn't be it shouldn't be literally it shouldn't be, not be a competition. We should dominate. That yes, that that's the norm, right? That should be the baseline. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. However, considering where we were against Japan, it's I I still feel like it's a work in progress, which I think is why everyone's like, "What the hell? We got a World Cup in mm-hmm. two months, and it's still a work in progress." Mm-hmm. I get it. We're we're missing Chris Richards, who is a, a late I'd say a late bloomer in the sense that. Now, all of a sudden, we're looking at him as our starting center back because he's at Crystal Palace. No Yunus Musa, who, for mm-hmm. me, is 100% a lock-in starter, no yeah. matter what. He's yeah. that good. Timo Way is another one who, he's just so different than the other players that we have. He's so different than an Aronson, a Reyna, Pulisic, just because he, he has more pace. He's a little bit more aggressive going mm-hmm. north, right? And, and that's where we need a player who can stretch a, a back line just with pace alone. Mm-hmm. And oh. then I'd say Anthony Robinson at the left because now you know what you're getting from him. He's been so consistent. Oh, we're playing out of the back. Good Lord. Oh, um, oh God. Great. So oh, given no. that, I, I still feel, oh, God. And that's that's what I'm talking about. Oh. Hey. Now, okay, so what what happened there? Where was the breakdown there? Like, uh, um, So Serginho Dest, which Tom talked about, mm-hmm. is a right-footed. He's going to come inside naturally, always on his right foot. As whereas a left back, Anthony Robinson is going to go to the end to the touchline. That that's you use that as as a, a shield almost. You use that to your advantage because you know, at the end of the day, you're either going to get a throw in because it's going to come off him, or it goes down the line and you're into a channel. You use that as as kind of a wall. You're you're set. Whereas if you come inside, now you're giving the advantage to to the to the to the attacker because he's going to come in and. and kind of either put, push you to his teammate for a trap, or you can just get a toe poke and boom, you're they're in on goal. Uh, mm-hmm. So he comes in, he makes a sloppy pass, lose it, and, and guess what? Saudi Arabia goes in on goal. Yep. The fortunate that- thing for us is it's Saudi Arabia, and that's not Harry Kane or Sterling or Mason Mount or Bukayo Saka, who, or the <laughs> top English player, um, even a Gareth Bale. So you, you can get away with it. But that is concerning because that should not be happening at yeah. this stage. Yeah. And and leading into that moment, it was th- the United States just gave Saudi Arabia numerous pressing triggers. Like right now, they're kind of recycling the ball from center backs and, and mm-hmm. Saudi Arabia aren't pressing. And then it was it was one under hit pass to then one slightly misplaced pass. And then all of a sudden, Saudi Arabia took space up and then, OK, this is a trigger that we're going to press. So by the time it got to Dest, Dest didn't have any options. And as you said, he's kind of leaning in towards the middle of the field onto his dominant side. So, yeah, it like. It's, it is such a clear difference in the game styles that is happening right now with Saudi Arabia versus Japan because Japan were kind of just pretty much setting up their press at every opportunity. Saudi Arabia, like, they just gave oh, – and I'll give away by Aaron Long. Um, another they, – they're giving them yeah. triggers to press, which will be more like whales because they're going to sit in more and maybe press when the opportunity is right like that. So I think it's mm-hmm. a good um, – a, a different style and a good another good rep for this team to have. And those things – make it much more difficult to play out if you're giving the other team clear opportunities to press. Let's talk about Aaron Long because um, I know there was a, a, a lot of folks that weren't terribly excited to see him back in the starting 11 today. Um, not a great game for him against Japan. Um, mm-hmm. I think, you know, we're still trying to kind of figure out who is, I think we can, I think we can all kind of agree that it, Walker Zimmerman is a, is a lock uh, to be a, a starting center back for the U S but like, you know, did Aaron Long like? It, it, how big of a test is this for him today? To uh, what? Do, what do we need to see? Or who is what? Who's the answer? Like, who is it going to be? I can tell you right now. In watching, Mark McKenzie deserved the start with okay. his performance coming in as, as as a substitute. Aaron Long is still making the same mistakes he made last match. Mm-hmm. I know Aaron Long was a better option than Walker Zimmerman before his injury. But then he has not recovered since that injury. He was Greg Berhalter's number one defender. And and Mm. I think Greg still thinks of him at that level. 
that he's not there and he's trying to give him every opportunity to get back there, but he's losing possession when he has no pressure. Put in a World Cup, the pressure goes from zero to 100. Yeah. So it's hard for a player to trust a center back when they're giving the ball away so easily. And you would have thought that he'd learn his lesson lesson in the last match against Japan. So it, it's it's only going to get worse for, from here on out if you keep losing possession and in, in these parts of the field. Oh, okay. Pulisic just uh, had a chance there uh, using his head. We see him back in the starting 11 today. Um, you know, what, how, mm. how, do, how are you feeling about, about Christian Pulisic and, and where he fits in this, in this team? It, it brings me back to the days when I was playing with the U S and there'd be, there'd be times where some of your better players weren't necessarily getting all the minutes they were, uh, they should be at their club. Mm-hmm. And so you're using the national team to get your better players fit and yeah. confident. And typically they are rusty in the beginning. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I'm seeing from Christian. I, and I would expect that from Christian that you, you just don't have a rhythm, no matter how fit you are, you can run by yourself. You can run miles and be fit and do all these extra sprints. It's not the same mm-hmm. as in game moments and, and the sharpness. And so it's going to take him a while and I don't know if he's he's even going to get that opportunity at Chelsea. I mean, how concerning is that? Because the, he's the captain of mm-hmm. this of this team. Um, he wants to be the guy, you know. Like when when you go, you are on a different platform. You're on a different stage at the World Cup, right? The the global soccer world's eyeballs are on you, especially having missed out in in 2018. Christian Pulisic wants this, and so I mean, how? From a mental perspective, especially like Charlie, from a player's perspective, like how do you how do you kind of overcome that? You know, the amount of pressure that you're probably putting on yourself, and you're not getting minutes at your Combat club, play. and like this is this is what you these are your moments. Like how do you how do you navigate that? You you just have to push through. That's the only way that I've ever dealt with with these adversity moments and and these lows is just hard work. As simple as that sounds, yeah. You just have to grind. And you know those times, the tough times don't last. They really don't. The the bad form, it comes, but it goes. As long as you can stay healthy, you'll get that opportunity. You keep yourself as, as fit as you can. Injuries happen all the time. Suspensions happen. You get an opportunity, and you run with it. And mm-hmm. Chris, we all know how gifted and talented mm-hmm. Christian is and his mentality. He has the right mm-hmm. mentality. But he he's, he's facing one of those moments that all players face where yeah. coaches – for whatever reason, don't see you in the same light that you see yourself. They don't give you or trust you. And, uh, and so you, you have to wait. And he's in that, that waiting pattern of is Graham Potter going to give him a proper chance to claim his spot in the starting line yeah. for Chelsea and, and get playing time? Or, or does he feel the same way Thomas Tuchel did and say, ah, I'm not going to trust him or I feel other players are better in his position. Mm-hmm. He's looked pretty good today. Like he hasn't looked rusty or, or anything like that. Like he seems to be moving like like normal, like the Christian Pulisic we're used to seeing and everything else. One uh, kind of smaller note, I thought that Kellen Acosta was the preferred set piece taker if didn't, no matter who's on the field. I thought he was ahead of Pulisic in that kind of grouping. Uh, but Pulisic has taken the first few uh, set pieces here. Hmm. Yeah, that's all about that deserved. That's fair. Um, oh, we've got a good question from um, Foodie Cards in the YouTube chat. Thank you for this. Um, he wants to know how how much a goal would do for Pepe's uh, confidence today. It if would Ricardo be Pepe's massive. Was, it like would how, be massive. Yeah. He's already going to go back to Holland with a pep in his step. Yeah. <laughs> because he, he's get he's involved with the national team again, and you're seeing all your friends. But to to go back to Holland with a goal, um, you know, in your in your first Ugh. first start in the national team in a while, yeah, it, it is. Oh man, we're we're giving the ball away. Mm-hmm. Good ball, Weston. Let's see, let's see, let's see. I don't know how Tom got ahead of me, but he is. <laughs> I know. He's been refreshing, refreshing. Literally. I know. 
I keep on trying to pause it so I can try to catch like be more aligned <laughs> with you guys, but it's not it's not working. No, every, it's then good. every time I start playing it again, it, it I'm ten seconds ahead again. Okay, so we are over twenty minutes into this one. I mean, do you guys feel in in general better about how the US are are playing today than you did on Friday? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, yes. it, it'd be it'd be difficult to feel worse than than it looked on Friday. Um, That's true, Tom. It's there. They. It seems like they're kind of buzzing around a little bit better. It seems like they're much quicker to to second balls again. Like Japan was really great and really structured at that. It seems like they're like attacking with impetus again. It's it's early in this game, but I think that those signs are all positive so far. Again, like as we were joking before, we got a shot on target. It's a good start. <laughs> so everything's already kind of looking up from the other day. But again, as you guys pointed out before, Japan is is vastly the superior opponent than Saudi Arabia is. So it's comes with a grain of salt. Uh, we have a question from Nathan Maynard on YouTube. He wants to know, how concerned are you all about our inability to keep possession? Which does seem to be very concerned. An issue. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, concerning because we are far better than Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, this is and, a team that, yeah, like we should, you should, like Charlie, you said it, like we should beat this team handedly. Handedly. And it's not, it's not that they're pressing us and putting mm -hmm. us in bad, bad mm -hmm. situations. It's we're just giving the ball away. Mm -hmm. That Yeah, we, that's the most kind of disappointing part is that it, a lot of these giveaways haven't been under a ton of pressure. And, and I, and I, it, my mind naturally goes to Iran playing Iran in the last group group stage game in the World Cup. If oh. they if they watch and just say, "Ooh, Tyler," mm -hmm. if they watch the, the the past two games with the U.S. Men's National mm -hmm. Team, and they were going to drop anyways and defend, they're going to say, "Let their center backs try and make the game. <laughs> They'll just give us the ball." Yeah, those are the pressing triggers. <laughs> Take take away their options and force them to dr to drive with the ball forward, and they will give us the ball. The, and that's exactly what the U.S. have done. It's almost they panic mm -hmm. when the center backs uh, have time and space. Um, I think this is also showing just how much this group misses Yunus Musa. Um, Tyler Adams' best qualities are kind of in transition defense. Weston McKinney is great at a lot of things. Building through possession isn't exactly one of them. I think Doyle's mm -hmm. made this point numerous times about that. A lot of times for Juventus he's playing as a more advanced midfielder like he kind of is today for the United States it, it there we don't have somebody kind of dictating the possession from deep that that'd be Yunus Musu is always the kind of pressure release valve given the ball he's not going to lose it and then he's going to progress the ball um that's just not happening so far with this midfield of Adams Acosta and McKenney, which con uh, compounds the issues that the center backs are having with distribution when they're under pressure so there just hasn't been that release valve in this group so hopefully uh, Musa stays healthy for the next couple months oh god How much onus did you put on Greg Berhalter for uh, the performance against Japan? Because he kind of came out and basically said, like, we were just, like, not prepared. He kind of, and he pointed to the coaching staff. Like, we didn't. Is that the first time he's done we that, didn't, we didn't. We didn't prepare them. Like, they didn't know what we wanted. Like, they they weren't prepared for our expectations of what they wanted. And I thought that it was, it was one of the first times. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, okay. That's very, it was very candid and transparent. But. You know, is that is that a, a case where a coach is kind of like trying to deflect the blame, for, you know, from, from like a perhaps just, you know, a lack of effort from his players. And he's like, no, this is on me. Or is there something to that? I, I will say I respect Greg mm -hmm. for taking the blame because mm -hmm. he should take the blame. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a deflection. He set this team up. It was his tactics trying to build out of the back given giving your center backs that much freedom to and and play in that manner and and try and build the game and then not adjusting making the necessary adjustments within that first half yeah so for me it, it does yes we it does fall on him but you also can't take the blame off the players yeah the, you expect I know there's no there's no World Cup veterans on the pitch, and there's there's not that big personality and leader on the pitch, but that's what you you that's kind of what you went with. That was your decision to go with the young group. So you expect the most experienced players out of this group who have played Champions League 
and Tyler Adams in particular. I mean, Matt Turner has has been playing professional soccer for a while. Mm-hmm. As a as a a backup at Arsenal, a club like Arsenal, you expect those two Campbell? players to say, "Guys, enough. We're playing long. We're playing into the channels." So it just was it was poor all all the way around. And, yeah, and that I think at least we get it out of our system and everyone's aware <laughs> we can't play a certain way. <laughs> and again, look at this. This this is that transition moment. <sighs> Oh, correct call. Take that back. Yeah, it's a foul. Uh, Iran. Oh, yeah. Wales, even England. The nine fans this, in attendance this, are going wild. Is, They're abusing this, the this referee. Is they, this Must is be where, difficult. This is where they make you pay. <laughs> why? Well, I, I understand why it made sense to play these games in Europe. It's so disappointing to look at empty stadiums again. I in know. The last two games before that, like, I, I was making fun of the crowd that was in Dusseldorf. That looks like, you know, the Rose Bowl compared to this now. Like, this is a closed door friendly, it looks like. I really don't like it. I know that it's just part of the part of the reality of, of some of these friendlies uh, pre-World Cup when they're not being played in either of the countries that are playing, but it still sucks. <laughs> hey, look who uh, look who is in Spain, though. Look who made the trip. That's Eunice Musa. Musa. All right. Taking it in. I feel like that's a good sign. I like that. You well, know, he, he plays in Spain. He we can, a... if they, if they pan out, we can probably find him in the crowd <laughs> by process of elimination. <laughs> oh Lord. Let's see what. So I was watching a little bit of Uruguay. We're playing, I believe Iran or uh, the other day. Um, I, I, it was another one of those that was in Europe. There was literally there was just a flag on on the stands that was like the TV was facing. Like I don't know if there was like a single person there. That's uh, just unfortunate. That's very triggering. You're right though, Thomas. Like I, we got so used to seeing empty stadiums. <laughs> yes, and it's like, that, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah, that was a, that's a, probably that's probably the you know unconscious bias that I'm having there. It's like I'm scared. I'm scared to like going back to like that time. I was like, oh my god, there's no fans allowed again. I think, I think you diagnosed that pretty well, Sus. Right? God. Well, Outrunner on the Twitch chat agrees with me. He says, how does an empty stadium help prepare for a World Cup? That seems like a, a big miss. And it's I okay. have to agree. I have to agree. Because the World Cup comes around and I mean, it is going to be it's going to be madness and insane. And that and it can be a factor. It absolutely can be. Somebody hurt. Who's hurt? Don't say that. We don't need any more injuries. Why did Des just put the ball out? What? We got a substitution. What? Who's what? Ho! Oh, hey! Oh my God! Don't tell me it is who it Gio is. Gio Reyna. No! Oh, no. Is it Gio? Oh. Maybe. Oh boy. Maybe this is precautionary. <laughs> He's Geo. Okay, according to Twitter, Geo is going straight to the locker room. That that can't be can't be good. Can't be good. Oh my god, that guy just cannot stay healthy. And what about the substitution, Ariola instead of Aronson? Yeah, that's interesting. What do you think, Greg? Is what's what's what do you think the rationale behind that is? Maybe the trying to get minute. Maybe the plan would have been for Ariola to come in after sixty or seventy minutes or halftime, whatever the the pregame plan was. Yeah. And I don't know. Aronson has had a heavy load with leads. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty nailed on what he is and and how important he's going to be to this group. So I guess it just comes down to whether you wanted to get him more reps or see if Ariola is going to get one of those final roster spots. So I'm not saying yep. whether one's right or wrong, but that's probably the rationale. Yep. That makes sense. Oh man. Oh, uh, that's such a downer. It really is. Um, guys, if you are on Twitter or Twitch and you find out if you, there's any updates on geo, please let us know. I'm trying to, I got a bunch of chats open here, <laughs> but I need the Intel. You, you guys can, can help me out. I've, I, 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 I didn't see him 
you know, grab. I didn't as, either. That is at yeah. anything or a limp or anything like that. So maybe it was a, a planned substitution. And I again, mean, going, go, well, I don't minutes, know, man, right? going straight down the tunnel doesn't. Yeah, and why would you, why would you start the game and play 30 minutes? Like I, 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 that, I, I don't know. The, uh, I'm trying the, not to speculate, obviously, I, but well, the broadcasters seem very perplexed by it as well. So I, yeah. Yeah, this doesn't seem like it was a uh, a planned a planned thing. Oh, hey, we've got um, Rusaki Rusaki on YouTube. I th- are you at the game? You said M inside. I'm wondering if that means you and are. And then he at. said, "How's the game so far?" Was his next, okay. was their next one. Oh darn it! <laughs> I got all excited. I was like, "If you are literally there and watching this stream, like that is next level <laughs> MLS loyalty, and I appreciate you." <laughs> well one of the guys who actually played well one of the the lone uh bright spots against japan was uh matt turner who we've talked a little bit about today i believe he had six saves on the day um it could have been a lot worse for the u.s um had it not for, been for him i mean at this point, like, how comfortable would you feel if Greg Berhalter named him our starting keeper for Qatar, Charlie? I would be very comfortable. Yeah. He is an incredible shot stopper. Oh, my mm-hmm. goodness. <laughs> don't Mm-mm. don't tell me, Tom. No, nope. don't. No, nope. don't nope. tell nope. me. No, get it out of there. Oh, my Lord. Oh, oh, my goodness. It came from. Our left side. Oh. Didn't, didn't love that. That was very nervy. And. Oh, wow. Lord. <clears throat> okay. That was the best chance of the game. Mm-hmm. That's for Easily. sure. Easily. Easily. And Saudi Arabia is a team that does not score a lot of goals. No, they like, don't. They, yeah. Yeah. So that's it. That is a concern. Um, guys, if you're watching, we have a graphic up now. This is the lineup now with Ariola inserted in there in place of uh, Gio Reyna, who we believe came off injured. We're kind of waiting to hear an update on that. But this is uh, this is what we're working with. There's one of three things that has happened. Okay. He got injured. Mm-hmm. He was always planning to come off at 30 or – or Greg just didn't like his effort because he wasn't all that involved in this first half and subbed him for that reason. Mm-hmm. And he's mad. And that's what would cause him to say, all right, I'm going straight into the locker room. Mm-hmm. That's the, that, those are the only three scenarios that I can think of. Yeah. And, and I'm, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping it's I'm, one I'm of ho- the latter. I'm hoping he's healthy. Yeah. Okay, so apparent so stay verde. Thank you, stay verde. I appreciate you. Um, he's on the Twitch chat. According to Grant Wall on Twitter, he said he has seen Reyna leave games through the tunnel like that too many times. So You're coming off with injuries is what he's this, saying. Like we're, yeah, like this, like you know. Um, there's some more people that, that are in in the stadium say that he point indicated for the sub and then pointed for it to go out of bounds. That's uh. not good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we are speculating right now, kids, that um, Geo took. <laughs> don't some let kind don't of nap. nobody record this. <laughs> speculating, total speculation. But man, boy, boy. Oh no! Now Tyler, no, no, no. Oh my God! This is a whole world of no right now. Oh my lord. Okay, so if you're watching the match, Tyler Adams is down. Um, looks like he is he grabbing a hammy. I think he took a, took a knee. Maybe. Okay. It looks like he was grabbing the back of his leg. I don't know. Maybe it was his knee. But this is that play. Oh. Uh, I mean, Sergio Dest is walking the the whole replay. He's walking. What poor defending. That's really abysmal. Oh, boy. Do we have to reevaluate where we really are? 
Where do you, do you start, remember, Charlie? Do you remember 13 minutes ago when we were all <laughs> saying, know, like, things are going well? <laughs> it's taking a turn. It's taking a turn. Guys, I'm going to need something stronger than Bailey's. <laughs> this is not good. Okay, so, Charlie, where do you start? You say, like, we have to reevaluate. Like, where, what, what's, what's top priority at this point? Based on, we are, we are in the 37th minute mm -hmm. of the first half of this match. What concerns me the most mm -hmm. about this group is our defensive shape and and the way that in the way that we defend and how we have given the ball away with no pressure. That that is such a concern to me. It's not so much the goals, it's not so much us creating chances. It's you have to have a strong foundation to be successful, to give your chance at being successful in a World Cup. This so far, 37 minutes in, has not been good in mm -hmm. every facet of of the the game. I mean, we're, we're giving the ball away. We're making bad decisions, not defending, not – you talk about urgency before the game. Sergio Dest is walking as, as the ball gets by him. What? What? Yeah, what? Uh, to piggyback off this, stay Verde in the Twitch chat. Said, Our defensive shape is panic. I think that that was a good piggyback to what you're saying there, Charlie. <laughs> um. Tom, I've got one for you from Nathan Henderson James. Um, <laughs> can we now say that Dest does not belong on the left, which is you know pretty much I, in line? I've with... said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's like like I said, I, that's been such an issue that's been lurking in the background. Like, what if Anthony Robinson misses a few games or a game? Mm -hmm. Honestly, like Sam Vines, I thought was going to have another chance to start today. I understand why the coaching staff would go with Dest or, or Scally if that was kind of the other thought. But I I had a lot of hope that Vines was going to look competent, fine enough to be a like-for-like -like backup left back because things change too much when it's not Robinson out there. And mm -hmm. Vines is the closest thing to like-for-like -like in that position. I mean, I you're so right, though. I mean, like the first I, – I, I was feeling so um, encouraged for the first – 10 12 minutes mm. of this match and it's just been pretty much erased <laughs> yeah at least uh tyler adams got up and wasn't injured so <laughs> if we're looking for more positives that's great thank you thank you tom <laughs> thank you thank you uh. in a game like this where you should be dominating possession I disagree with starting Kellen Acosta in the midfield. Okay. If Why? this was a game that's a track meet and you you are going to rely on second balls and and maybe defend more, then then I'm okay oh. with Kellen Acosta because he's got this engine and he can get all over the place and he's he's better defensively than he is as an attacker. Mm -hmm. In this game, you're going to have the the ball more. You're going to need someone to pop up into those gaps and find the passing lanes, be good on the dribble. I thought this would have been a game that really was a, appealing to Greg Berhalter in, in finding arena in a spot to succeed, getting mm -hmm. on the ball more. So I'm a, I'm a little perplexed that he was in, in the wide areas because he didn't, he didn't get involved all that much. It's hard. It's hard to find the ball in, the, in a game like this, where in the midfield, there's a lot of space because Saudi Arabia is not as disciplined as Japan. So they do leave the openings. Um, Real quickly, an update on Gio Reyna. Roger Bennett, Men and Blazers, says, U.S. soccer tells me that Gio Reyna's substitute was not planned. So okay. that, that puts that to bed. Okay. Thank so you, it's Tom. So an, it's an injury concern for um, Gio Reyna, which is Thank really you. brutal. Thank you, Twitter and Tom, but not for delivering the <laughs> upsetting truth. That was a truth bomb when I didn't enjoy that. Um, Doyle Doyle uh, put up this graph. We've got this tweet from from Matt that kind of uh, basically illustrates Charlie like what you were saying about Kellen Acosta and this and this sort of formation. I mean, I don't know. Like my, I have an issue. Like the depth of this team. You know, like you need depth on a on a World Cup roster, and I'm just very concerned that there's just not enough pieces we're relying too much on on certain guys like a Yunus Musa and there's just no there's not enough if he if he's injured what where do we go what do we do it doesn't seem like this is a there's a lot of uh room for <laughs> for things like injuries yeah I mean for me it's like it's been difficult for me to 
ex- have a lot of expectations for Gio Reyna just because of his lack of availability. I don't think that he started one game in qualifying due to injuries because in those final windows when he came back from injury, that it was supposed to be a month in September, and it, it took until whatever, February, March for him to come back, unfortunately. He, he just hasn't been available enough. That mm-hmm. I, My assumption has been whenever we talk about potential starting 11s and everything was either Wea or Aronson or however you want to kind of bend with the players around. Like, I don't, I don't know how much I personally was counting on Reyna just because we hadn't seen it very much. It would have been – we keep hoping for it, and it's unfortunate that he's picking up another potential injury, and hopefully this is just precautionary. There, mm-hmm. it, there would be no reason to push him through this game if he felt anything, so maybe it's something light. Um, again, if we're trying to be optimistic, but – like I, I like I, it's more difficult now because Wei is not here because Aronson's on the bench. Like they have some options in those areas. Um, it just doesn't look great right now. <laughs> it doesn't. It's oh, two it's months. I mean, we're we're less than two months out. Like, I mean, is that enough time for these guys to get fully fit, though, Charlie? Like, yes, it is. If if not all. Some mm-hmm. of them, Yunus Musa. I think who is the cool. who is the must? Who is the who is Yunus the guy Musa. that yeah. Yunus Musa and Anthony Robinson mm-hmm. are, are absolute absolute must. I would throw Chris Richards in now, given that Greg Berhalter still is preferring Aaron Long over Mark McKenzie. Mm-hmm. And and you know it'd be nice to have Timo Wea uh, because of of what he can offer. It'd be nice to have. You know, a, a healthy Zach Steffen and Cameron Carter Vickers, but right now, oh, I think Musa is a must-have. He mm-hmm. he needs to be on this pitch to give this team a little bit more creativity and and someone who isn't afraid to get on the ball. It, it seems yeah. like now players are afraid to get on the ball. Oh. Looks like, I don't know, there's only temporary. I was going to say it looks like Areola and Pulisic swap sides, but I think that they're swapping back now. Okay. Oh, boy. Kind of took the air out of our sails here. Really did. Guys, come on. I need you all in the kind chat to, uh, to lift us up. You know, like we're... I feel like we we've gone down the Debbie Downer. <laughs> at this stage. I'm usually really good at keeping things positive. And this is You're struggling uh, to find the Well, it's just here. honestly, I was like I watching the the Japan match was just so disheartening. Um because mm-hmm. there, there had been so many, there had been a, I felt like there was some momentum. I felt I felt really encouraged after oh my God. the last camp. Um and that was just, it was just such a letdown. And so I just really, especially against an opponent. I mean, Japan is a good opponent. Saudi Arabia is a team that they should, they should be able to it's dominate. It's still a World Cup be, team, to be fair. Still, it is a World Cup team, 100%. But we are in a group with Wales and England mm-hmm. and Iran. Like, I, this, you know, I think Japan is a, you know, that's a formidable opponent. And if you want to go toe to toe with the likes of an England, like this is not what you, this performance is, is, is it's just not going to hold. It's not going to hold up. It's not going to agree. Completely agreed. I like their kits not to, not to get on, on a tangent, the Saudi Arabian kits. Oh, they are fresh. I really, really like them a lot. Really like them. They look great. <laughs> that that whole that whole minute, they just played right through us. <laughs> they, they literally the played YouTube right through chat. us. Chat, Josue Hernandez. I love rage, uncomfortable silence, <laughs> the laughing emoji. Yeah, I think you hit that on the head there. <laughs> oh lordy. Your expectations are too high. It's a young team with talent, but still lacking experience. This is a team for the future, sadly not for today. This is according to Ruben Leon <laughs> in the YouTube chat. And, um, you know, Ruben, you're probably not wrong. Um, but we have been starved for a World Cup for, a, you know, years now. And so, yes, there is expectations. And I would agree, we are not where we want to be. But. It would be nice if to have a team. I think one of the things that we have seen in the past with 
these U.S. teams that have competed in World Cups is that there is an element of of That's fight fun. in them. You know, like there's this like there's like a, a, a they rise to the occasion. And this what we have seen these last two games, it's that it doesn't generate that feeling for me. I don't know. Am I wrong, guys? You know no, I mean? I'm, like, I'm, I'm with you there. I'm, t- I'm totally with you there. I, I okay. think that's that's like at the top of the show when we were talking about what we wanted to see today. That was, you put it better than I did. Just that, that fight, that desire. Like growing up, I was never used to like an, a, a USA team getting like out battled, right? Like you think about mm-hmm. 06, 010, like the, the era of Charlie Davies, all this, like even yeah. after 2014, like, I don't know. The, the one thing that you could always rely on with this team was one good goalkeeping. And two, that like they were gonna fight like hell. Like it was Absolutely. gonna be, it was gonna be a Absolutely. battle. You're gonna have Dempsey in somebody's face. You're gonna have. They were not an easy face. opponent like, for anyone. The yes, U.S. was yes. not an easy opponent for anyone. And that this is this is what's concerning for me is that that it's that attitude. It's that I don't know that presence that just did, it seems to be lacking right now. And I don't know if that is you know I just think about like a guy like a Michael Bradley or a Jermaine Jones or a Clint mm. Dempsey right out on the pitch. And these, these guys that just sort of elevated the whole team is like refused to go down without a fight. And there mm-hmm. just doesn't seem to be that right now. And for me, that's a little bit concerning as you head into a world cup and a, that type of tournament where it's a knockout. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, you've got to, you've got to find ways you have to find ways. And there's just a lack of there's a lack of creativity. And right now it feels like a lack of kind of like a, a rallying cry or a, a leadership. And I hate that. Uh, Sorry, uh, I am really dark right now. This is not... <laughs> there's no there's just no identity. I know that that's what really hurts. We're, we're two months away and there's no identity. It, we, we we don't know our strengths. Uh huh. It's clear when I watch them play. They do not know what the strength of the team is. Mm-hmm. You know, you talk about the 2002 team, the 2010 team, the 2014 team. We knew how to play because we played to our strengths. We said mm-hmm. when we were playing a, a team that we were better than, that we're, we felt was inferior, we knew we were going to dominate possession. They were going to sit back and we were not going to let them win second balls. We were going to grind. We are going to make them chase the game. And then when we got set pieces – we knew, okay, this is an opportunity, an area where yes. we have to excel. We, we're, we're probably going to have to win off a set piece today. That's fine. We're gonna, we'll win one nothing or 2-1 two, two one or 2-0 two mm-hmm. because this team is just going to defend and it's going to make it very difficult. It's going to be an ugly game, but we're going to win. Play away in Trinidad in 2010 World Cup qualifying. We win 1-0. It's ugly as can be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but mm-hmm. we win. We win off of Rico Clark. It I will matter. take – Ugly wins any day. One hundred percent. I and then love you play ugly at home, wins. <laughs> you, you play at home. Always attack. You know. 100. Always. You can. You can. Usually get opportunities where you use some flair, some one v ones. They they try and, you know, try and push numbers forward at certain times where you can take advantage on the in the transition and the turnover off of turnovers. I just don't see that this team says this is what we're the best at. This yeah. is this is how we're going to move forward. Because it has to change from game to game, opponent to opponent. And I'm not seeing that, which is that that's what I, I think most fans are getting upset with. And Woo! you know, this watching one included. the game, it's man, where it's where fun. where are we going to excel? What what okay. where can we put our where where can we say, you know what, <laughs> I can put my hat on this this quality. I just want, so Mark Wright in the YouTube chat has, he's like, just to point out, and I appreciate this. He says the U S have won everything in their federation. This team is able to win two finals against Mexico with a first team and a B team. Don't let friendlies overshadow too much. So Mark, thank you for keeping us in check right now. Absolutely. I, that is, that's a hundred percent true. Um, we also uh, not to, mm, but you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm, listen, we're trying, um, we have, I think we have a video actually of uh, Gio Reyna walking through the tunnel right now. I think we're going to put this up. This is courtesy of The Athletic. They tweeted this out. It's very small on my screen, so I can't, can't really, see much. <laughs> I can't really do so much. It's not helping a ton, but um, yeah, if you have your phones or you're watching on your phone, just go ahead and zoom right in and see what we're seeing. Did you guys see anything? I didn't see anything. I'll be I honest. That. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, so guys, first 45 in the books, it is nil, nil. Um, Charlie, 
we mm -hmm. have um, a question in here. Where did I see it? Was it Stephen Moore? He wants to know offensively what this U.S. team needs to change in the second half. I feel like that's a very like broad question, but it, it is broad. Yeah, there were some moments where you, you you liked what you saw. They got into the attacking third. You know, Weston McKinney's taking a shot. Tyler Adams is taking a shot. Ideally. It would be a Christian Pulisic taking a shot. It'd be a mm -hmm. Gio Reyna. It would be uh, Ricardo Pepe your scores taking shots instead of your defensive midfielders or, or your midfielders who have defensive um, uh, attributes. For me, they have to figure out ways to combine more in the mm -hmm. attacking third. Christian Pulisic, how many times do we see him? He's got a dribble, and then you got one Saudi defender coming, another, and another. It's got to get to his foot. And and he's got to play off off the ball. It's it's about his movement, getting on the ball, playing one touch, two touch, and and making moves. He's he's most dangerous when he's on the run, and you're playing to him, whether it's in between the lines, or over the top. But that's where you're going to see him excel and, and kind of be the bright spot for the U.S. Women's National Team when he is in areas uh, in the final third where it's one v one, or he's going into an open space and the ball is being played to him. So that's one facet of the game it needs to yeah. get better i think another is finding ways to get your your striker involved in the game yeah how many times have we seen crosses to ricardo pepe or, or put your head up and i've seen him time his runs but the ball isn't coming and, mm -hmm. and the heads the midfielders their heads are down in in 2010 2014 whether it was myself or josie or clint dempsey or landon when we were made runs anytime a, a player in the midfield or the back line especially outside backs got on the ball Mm -hmm. We made our runs, and we expected that ball. We knew it was coming into that space, into the channel. And that forced teams to drop back, and guess what? It gave the midfield more room, more space. So then Landon and Clint could come inside, and, and Michael Bradley had a little bit more freedom. We're not seeing any of that. No. No, we we are not. Um, Tom, <laughs> put on your, your – if you're Triple G – if you're if you're Greg Berhalter, um, I mean, are you? What are you? What what are the adjustments that you're going to try to make in the second half? Like, are you? Put, are there substitutions that you're that you're looking to make here? Like, what? I don't know. What's, yeah, I mean, what do you for, do? For me, I'd like to see Josh Sargent get 45 minutes. See what he looks like next yeah. to Pulisic in front of McKinney and Adams. Like, I want to see him with the first group for a little bit longer. I thought he was going to start today, just based on form. Uh, before Berhalter announced uh, yesterday, I believe that. Uh, Pepe was starting. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I would like to see some real minutes for Josh Sargent to see what that looks like with this group. I'd like to see more creativity, like in the midfield. I, I don't know if that's a Costa out for Luca Della Torre who, or, you know, maybe Brandon Aronson goes into the midfield again. I know that he's a different type of player, but mm -hmm. it, it, it just, I don't know, it's just not been sharp enough. Again, like, I don't want to move the goalposts from where I was before the game because I do believe that they're playing with more intensity. They're They're winning – second ball is a little bit better they're they're kind of getting into duels it's it's again it's been better not great mm -hmm. uh but i definitely not at this point would like to see some more quality some more ideas in the attacking third or the middle third or in transition like charlie was saying everything has been a little a little slower in terms of decision making and and getting the ball going i mean when when was it was it it was last fall was it last fall that uh ricardo pepe came yep. on and like was like yep just scoring goals and had like three goals in two games and everyone was like freaking out. What's the deal? What's changed? Like, why, why is this not? I mean, like he hasn't even really had a decent look. Yeah. We're not, we're not, they're not creating enough chances. It's, it's... there've been th the best moves today. There've been a couple good combinations that came around the left side with pool sick Dest, and McKinney coming over there. But for the most part, I don't know the most times that I've kind of, you know, paused my train of thought or from this stream. And then there's been silences when it's been a lot of, direct balls with midfield runners going in like with uh, Pepe occupying a center back and Pulisic and, and now Ariola on the wing mm -hmm. occupying the, the, you know, further defenders. It was McKenney or Acosta kind of trying to break lines and it's Zimmerman or long playing a long ball over top. That's not what this team has really looked like. I like more directness sometimes with this team, particularly in a group that has McKenney, Acosta and Adams in the midfield. That feels like it should be built to win second balls, uh -huh. even if that first pass doesn't come off. But again, when it when they get to the final third, when Saudi Arabia has been more condensed and structured in defense, it, it's not creating anything, and they're not getting around. So again, that's that's what I would like to see more of. But mm -hmm. I don't know, man. 
Hey, I don't know, man. That's perfect. That's perfect. Didn't stick I, I, don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Mark Wright, um, he says, Aronson for Acosta. This is a substitution he would like to see made. Give him free roll to pester their back line. I mean, at this point, I'm kind of like, yeah, why not? What do you think, Charlie? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we need players who want the ball. And that's why I, w- I would have loved to see Gio Reyna in the midfield because he's not a runner. He's not a track sprinter. He's a player who's gifted with his technical ability to get on the ball, to drag defenders, cut defenders, beat you on the dribble, create a little space. He he just needs an inch of space, and he can play. I mean, we saw at Dortmund, he would find Haaland into space, Mm -hmm. play to his feet, a great passer and a great dribbler. I want those players always on the ball. You're going to get more of the ball when you're playing centrally. That's why I'm I'm confused. Why is he being put in a wide uh, wing spot where – his his natural tendency has to be now to run down the line, and that's not his strength. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can come inside, but Sergino Dest is on a, as a left back, not a right back. It's DeAndre Yedlin. DeAndre Led- Yedlin's best ability is defending and tracking back with his speed and his quickness. He can make late runs as an overlapping right back, and that's where he's probably most useful in the attack is – a late run in behind and a one-time cross, but not somebody who's going to get on the ball and, and stay level with the with the striker to, to provide width. So for me, the balance was off to start this game, and yeah. I think that's what you're you're seeing when they're in possession because players who typically should be checking to get the ball and making the game are hiding. Kellen Acosta is a mm-hmm. perfect um, example of of a midfielder who's a great ball uh, disruptor, a, a challenger, winning second balls, getting off his feet. He's pretty good at, with his distribution, but not someone who will check the ball, dribble his player, you know, look to combine the final third. That's not his ability. It's certainly not Weston McKinney's ability, and it's, right. and it's mm-hmm. not Tyler Adams, who's a defensive midfielder. So your heart of your team doesn't have that, and that's what Eunice Musa provides. So without yeah. Eunice Musa, it's got to be Gio Reyna. Would you put Pulisic through the center for the second half, Charlie? <laughs> I mean, we we all know it, 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 when he's in he's in the the center of the pitch. That means more players are around him. The reason you play him on the wing is so he is isolated mm-hmm. and has more room and space. When he comes centrally, because he takes so many touches, it doesn't work. That's why it hasn't worked. Now, if you said to him, "I don't want you taking more than two touches," you're going to be in the midfield. Occasionally, if you're in the final third, go ahead, have at it. But anywhere <laughs> from the middle third defense, I mean, more is a ten, player, not like, go yeah. right. If he's if he's not going to be playing there in the World Cup, then you keep him in his position. You say, find yeah. the game, change the game from that position because that's what we're going to need in the World Cup. Maybe the first half's bad as it is right now, but it's nil nil. That mm-hmm. you you still have the whole forty five minutes in front of you to change the game and yeah, uh, exactly how Iran's going to play. Literally thirty nine percent possession from Saudi Arabia, only one hundred ninety eight passes at seventy six percent. So that's not great, and they played through us. I, I watched from minute 44 to minute 45. They played through our press, switched the point of attack, got into our final third like it was easy. This is Saudi Arabia we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. They made it look easy. Mm-hmm. And for me, that just goes to show that we are completely spaced out. That the, the, the there, There's not communication. The lines are, are not where they're supposed to be. And everything has got to get better. I just, it's, it's, it's strange. So, um, Josue Lopez Hernandez in YouTube, he, he, he says this, he asks this, are friendly is, are friendly is really a place to measure a team's level? You know, like, yes. is it fair? Yeah. Is this, is yes. it, is it fair for us you to be this critical? In, in, right? you can't in general, trophies. no, but yeah. the yeah. last two games before the world cup. Absolutely. Yes. Wait, okay. You, you, this is the thing. You're not, you're not winning trophies with a friendly. Mm-hmm. In most cases, friendlies are a way to see if a, a new player can can take an opportunity to run because they've been, been developing really well with their club. Okay, And it's another way for the head coach to say, this is the way we want to play. And mm-hmm. that that changes depending on who you have available, who's because injuries happen, suspensions happen, bad transfers happen, so players <laughs> form and lose confidence, new players come up. So every friendly is an opportunity for the coach to say, 
this is how I see us having success. Mm -hmm. So we're going to play a certain style or tactic depending on who we're playing and, and how, what guys I have at my disposal. So in this game, in this case, because of COVID, because of, of the, you know, the limitations that put on national teams and matches, friendlies now have that much more of, of an yeah. importance, especially this close to World Cup where there is no camp. Yep. Games end November 13th. The, the next weekend, you, you got the World Cup. So there's not a camp. These games are, are looked at as the last time to really prepare and see what your team looks like in an, in an 11 v 11 situation that's competitive. So, yes, there is a lot of stock put in these these two matches. And given that, it's been it's not been great. So I'll leave it at that. Charlie, one more tactical thought that might be a false binary again in that maybe it's not even an option. But if we were looking for a different look, what about Jesus Ferreira playing as a 10-ish, second striker-ish mm -hmm. on underneath, say, Pepe or Sargent? Is that something that you'd like to see and, and, and a look that this team could go to? Or is it, again, just not even in the question that this is a waste of time to ask? No, you know, I if you asked me that a year ago, I would have said, yes, let's let's try a different formation. But he's not changing the formation. Now, if you're losing 1-0 and you're forced to make a change, well, wouldn't it be nice to have a, a player like Jordan P. Folk to come in so you can play with two strikers because that's where he excels. He's mm -hmm. not great in a, in a one striker system, especially in this one striker system. But if you give him a, a player who can support him and play off of him, that's where you get the best of Jordan P. Folk. So if that were the case, I would love to have a player like Jordan P. Folk on the bench. Mm -hmm. So I hope come Qatar that that's an option. I agree. Ooh. Oh boy. Um, second half is underway. If you guys are trying to sync up here, I am at 46.07 on the oh, clock I'm right now. Oh, just three seconds off you. Okay. Oh. All right. We're, we're closer. I love this. Hey. Hey, that's a win. We'll, we'll, we'll take that dub. Look, we made our own halftime adjustment. Look at us. Look at us. <laughs> we're not just standing here on soapboxes. We're, we're practicing <laughs> what we're talking about. Oh, God. Uh, now, Charlie, you pointed out that in the Japan match, the second half was better. From it the was. US. I mean, it couldn't, um, couldn't, couldn't be worse. It couldn't, I, exactly. Um, I, so I feel, I do feel like, you know, it really, the only way, the only way is up right now, right? I mean, we're, I'm just, again, I'm just trying to keep the vibes Suze, light here. Suze, I was about to make that joke. Like, I feel like me, me or Charlie or you have said it can only go up or you know it couldn't have gotten worse like numerous times. That's, that's been the best that we've had this for some positive. So bad. You guys, I have been, I've been on a lot of these streams and this is, this is like, you know, pretty much the uh, the lowest I have I have felt. <laughs> but I think that's because you said. I mean, literally, this is it. This is the last, mm. the final tune up. This is it. This is this is going to be our lasting impression for the next two months of this of this team. And that is not again. This is just not how I want us to, especially going up against Wales mm -hmm. in our first match, mm -hmm. who are probably watching this right now. And I mean, like, you've got to be. You've got to be kind of like licking your chops a little bit. Oh, here we go. Um, Greg Burhalter. This is from uh, Jeff Reuter oh, on Twitter. Greg Burhalter told Fox's Jenny Taft that Giovanni Reyna's early exit was precautionary. So I suppose that is good news. Hey, again. Hey, we there got we go. two, two dubs go. in the second half already. Let's go. <laughs> we're, we're turning it around. And, and so the precautionary sub was – not well taken is, is, is <laughs> because typically when you make that sub and uh, it's precautionary, then the player would go and sit on the bench. No muscle tightness is what well, it maybe, is. But, USSF but Gio, is saying now. We have se we have seen this many times from Geo though, so maybe he is like overly cautious. You know, like it's like no, 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 not again. I this is I'm just putting myself in like that mindset you know uh, like, I've, I've been in that been i've there, been in that position. been there done that like it's like oh no like we're gonna so that's 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 what i'm i'm hoping like geo's just being overly cautious greg's being overly cautious and i'm fine with that yeah oh uh, that, yeah. that absolutely the best case scenario because the other ones would have been if it was a pre-planned sub at the 30th minute that would have been really weird i think if mm -hmm. it was say charlie you you theorize that the only other option if it wasn't an injury would be that the coaching staff were unhappy with his output or his energy or whatever. So that's not the case. And that again, it's, it was an injury, but it was a precautionary muscle tightness. 
like I, the best possible news from you guys, our guys. My muscle, I am my all of my muscles are tight right now. Okay, <laughs> yes. I was tailgating for like three days straight, <laughs> and then I went to a music festival, and like my whole body is sore. So like I'm dealing with muscle tightness right now. And guess what? I'm fine. I could go. I could go play ninety. Respect. Put me in. Put me in. I'm ready. <laughs> Gio, Gio, rub some dirt on it, son. You're, not, you're gonna be just fine. <laughs> oh god i'm kidding if he's really injured he should take care of himself <laughs> just, just, don't want to put it me. on the record i was just kidding don't listen to me don't listen to me <laughs> oh you guys Stephen moore who has been very active in our youtube chat thank you very much uh he says yes we are watching this he is from wales uh, wales 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 so uh, we, we, have, this, we have this is scouts. advanced scouting from him we not just watching the game but watching our in stream. The chat right now so he is literally taking notes Besides. good grief I love that. I love that commitment. <laughs> oh boy. That's a foul. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I will say, you know, I've been in the, in that situation before with, with muscle tightness. And if you've had a couple of, of, of muscle pulls or tears and you, you finally felt like you've overcome that mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you start to get, a similar feeling of, of the tightness before it goes, you know, you need to push the, the brakes. So whereas a younger Gio Reyna would have kept going and said, and Oh, I'll play through it. Through. And, and so it's, that just shows growth and maturity from, from Gio Reyna being in those yep. positions. So um, yeah, I mean, that's good. That's a good point, Charlie. You, you have, you have the world cup on the brain and you're going to make sure that you're available, that you're not going to be in, in a position to, to mm -hmm. miss because of a, a muscle pull or tear or strain. So it's smart of him mm -hmm. with any type of feeling or, or, you know, tightness, you, you say, listen, to I'm, your body. Pu I'm pulling myself out now before mm -hmm. it even gets to that point. So well done from, from Joe Reyna to recognize that and not only recognize it, but to, to pull himself off. Do you know what so we have seen from him too? Like this, this guy is one of the most fierce competitors i have ever seen like that dude is just like single-minded soccer winning like that is it there is nothing he wants more than to be healthy and playing in qatar and so you have to believe and i, I also like that like he's got that kind of that attitude that i think that this team needs like i would i really i need geo i need geo to yeah. be healthy yeah need it i'm not quite understanding why the United States aren't getting as much pressure. I feel like, well, Saudi Arabia is just giving the ball away there or almost <laughs> giving the ball away. Um, I, I feel like they're not playing with enough pressure. Um, and this is the kind of opponent that I would have expected. Like, I, th I think against Wales, making them uncomfortable and if they want to sit in deep, don't give them a chance to kind of build out or take breaks and, and regain energy and possession with, with easy possession. I'm, I'm just surprised that they're not higher up the field and, and putting more of an emphasis on pressing. I'm just, I'm, I, God, I'm just so terrified because that first game, like there's going to be, there's a huge amount of pressure on both teams, right? Yep. Like everybody wants to win that opening game of the group stage of the world cup. And if it's nil, nil, and it's like in the 85th minute, and let's say it comes down to like a set piece. Right. And like, I just imagine Gareth Bale getting inside <laughs> that box and doing what Gareth Bale does. And we don't have that. Like we don't have like, that guy who can who can you know is so reliable like that can like <laughs> like come up in those big moments and that's what's what's scary right now because they could the u.s could theoretically like keep them at bay for a while but it just takes it just takes one and and one that's moment. been what oh we got another deandre edlin down now um and that's um, been wales's mo like that's again they've been extremely successful over the last what four or six mm -hmm. years playing like that, playing, being really difficult to beat, being really good on set pieces and letting Gareth Bale, letting, you know, Aaron Ramsey, but again, more so Bale, carry the moments and step up in the moments. And again, that's yep. been their entire MO yes. and that's how they've gotten to European championships. That's how they've gotten on to knockout stage. That's how they qualify for the World Cup for the first time in half a century. Like it's, that's what they're really, really good at. <sighs> uh, Stephen Moore, our whale scout, he says, we will press you from the first whistle. That's what he said. Will saying. you though? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Sure I don't that. know. Maybe I, Steven I, knows I, something we don't know. I think they'll mix it up. I think they'll mix it up. I think okay. they'll be in a, a mid block. They'll press at times. 
Fair if they you just watch the game against Japan, it's it's a perfect way to get at this U.S. men's national team. Oh, we'll, we'll set up as mid block. Sometimes we'll be aggressive. Sometimes we'll we'll wait. Oh, we're gonna have. Hey, Seuss. I saw Hey, Seuss. Who we got? Who we got coming in? McKinney. It looks like Scally and Jesus Ferreira. Jesus Ferreira. Okay. Somebody uh, put in the Twitch chat, League One, Aaron Ramsey. And just to use my air quote insider platform here to give a little value, Aaron Ramsey, who almost went to Charlotte FC. Charlotte FC had an offer out um, to Ramsey, but he chose Nice. And I was talking to people (laughs) at at Charlotte during that time, and they kind of joked like, yeah. It's difficult to kind of uh, to compete, compete with with that city, with the south of France. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> not a not a bad choice by Aaron Ramsey. I have been. Would have been I cool have been, MLS. I have been to Nice, and it is uh, can oh, confirm. Can confirm. Jealous. It's lovely. That very was a jealous. that was a that was a like little flex. I just I love it. you know, just needed to get out. Yeah, get that flex out there. Right, 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 right. Um, guys, apparently U.S. Uh, Twitter soccer Twitter has confirmed that it was muscle tightness for yeah. Geo. So. That's where we're at, y'all. And it does look like we are going to have a bunch of substitutions come on. So we will see how that plays out. Oh, by the way, like about 30, 45 seconds ago, national, uh, the U.S. just won the ball in the attacking third and Ariola tried to put in a quick cross. Like th- Those are opportunities that are generated from the press, particularly when this midfield isn't creating much. That's yep. why the press is so important. As you know, Suze, as a fellow Liverpool fan, you know the the, the famous Jurgen Klopp quote: "Like there is no playmaker as good as as a high press of winning the ball, like in the final third. Like, yeah, particularly with this kind of midfield, I thought that it set up to press rather than possess. Well, that's a fact. Facts, facts, facts. Oh boy. I don't. Can you guys hear the the sixteen fans or Chan? I love it. Let's get let's get into it. I don't know. I have a, a little bit of volume on FS1, so I don't know if either of you guys do. I have it on very low. I wish I would have listened to uh, – well, no, we were having a great conversation at halftime, and everyone should have been listening to us. But I was curious to see what Clint Dempsey had to say at the half because yeah. if anyone was listening, can you tell us what Clint Dempsey said at halftime? Thank you. <laughs> Please do my job for me. The yeah, Edlin in the wars here. What is going on? Okay. This, this, this defender took a, Waiting for a, replay, a yeah. bad challenge, huh? Because I you could see the lunge. Oof. Oof. Ow. Ow. Yeah. It, it's, it's uh, for me, a yellow card. Yeah. Is that our first yellow of the game? Yeah. Yeah. Unless Acosta got one for the tactical foul in the first half. I don't believe he did, but. Well, Pepe did not do much in 60 minutes. Yeah, I'm. Let's not. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so. Not a ton of option uh, opportunities. Not to be fair. a ton of opportunities. You could, you could have said the same for Jesus, other than the, the goal. I mean, he was on an okay. island. I, uh, uh, I know there has been, and th- uh, this would have been the time and the camp to call in like a Brandon Vasquez, who has been, you know, I've been saying that for months. I was really upset that disappointed that he wasn't. In, Tom is a Tom is a, a Brandon Vasquez stan, <laughs> and I respect it tremendously because he is having such an outstanding season at FC Cincinnati. Um, Who, I mean, better like, Brenner or Vasquez, though. Who's better, oh, Brenner? Brenner yeah. or Vasquez? Oh. Yeah. Well, Brenner, but Brenner was so slow to start the season. I mean, he's. I'm not on. talking to start the season. I'm talking right now, <laughs> Brenner. Right now, I think you got to go with the pedigree, uh, an age of Brenner from the Brazilian youth national teams. Yeah. Uh, but again, that's not not even to say anything negative. Is of, he eligible no, to play I, for I'm the? Is he eligible anything. to play for the U.S.? He, he is not. <laughs> Darn it! Um, I don't. But is that? I mean, like, do you, it? Has Greg already made up his mind? Like, is it like, mm-hmm. yeah, no? Like, he's just not. I think in a lot of cases, yes. Yeah. He has. I, I, I'm. You know, sometimes I just find it hard to find a reason for not putting Reyna in the midfield. Mm-hmm. Well, and because he's never available. 
today. He, nice. He's available, you know, and Aaron's in, in that wide right spot, knowing what, what he gives you with his work rate and, and his yeah. press. If, as today is going to be, you're going to be on the front foot. You expect more oh. possession. Oh, I did. Oh, my God. What the heck? Oh, Tyler. Jesus. This has not been crisp. Guys, guys, not the uh, start to the second half that um, Mm -mm. I would have drawn up. (laughs) It just kind of literally looks like they, uh, I don't know what was said in that locker room, but it looks like more of the same. Oh, man. This is the other thing. Like, the inability to make adjustments, like, is very concerning. Ooh, Scally. Oh. I'm glad that we're seeing Scally on the right. Like, I know that it's – that position is Serginio Des 100%. But I think part of the criticism for Scally has been playing, again, on the left as an inver- inverted fullback. It's nice to see him at his, you know, more natural right side. I know he can do both, but – yeah, he he needs to be on on his right side to give yeah. him the best chance to to show what his quality is and, yeah. mm-hmm. and the best like, chance for success. If if there was you know a more defined backup left back, then like maybe Scally wouldn't be you know forced to give his minutes there. Like he struggled. I forget which game it was. Again, it was either Morocco or Uruguay. I believe it was Morocco. Like he struggled pretty badly on the left. Yeah, he did. I was on that. Oh, hey. Shot on target by Hazy. Shot Sparrow. on target. <laughs> okay, Jesus. Drink. <laughs> there we go. Oh my goodness, um, guys. There's um a lot. Oh, Peppy. People are giving up on Peppy. Yeah. In the, in, in the chat. Do you think this is fair? Give I kind of. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't say, give up on him, but like I wouldn't say give up. I, he, I was expecting him to not be back with the team until the first post World Cup camp, just given how okay. Peacock was playing and how poorly Pepe had been in Germany. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't give up on him, but I also wouldn't, I, I would, I, I would understand if they didn't bring him to the world cup. Okay. If you are watching, this is the, uh, the current lineup that you are looking at right now with the substitutions that were, that were just made. Huh. <sighs> Definitely surprised to not see Josh Sargent today. I, you know what? Agreed. Agreed. Because he has been absolutely on fire yeah. for Norwich, um, which has been really fun to see. I mean, this was, I remember like him, I remember talking extensively mm-hmm. about him back in like 2017 mm-hmm. um, as being, you know, like this was a kid that we were so excited about. Um, and then it just, it, you know, kind of wasn't he, playing his proper position, really. Yeah, you know? and he was, he was playing at teams that were, one, playing him at on the wing, but they were teams yeah. like Norwich in the Premier League and Werder Bremen as they were trying to fight relegation and then got relegated. He was yeah. playing as a glorified wing back because of how yeah. much those teams were defending. Like, yeah, And go, going back to, like you said, when he was kind of breaking through, it was pretty unanimous of, like, talent evaluators, how he was viewed, his reputation. It was – he was – uh, the the bigger talent, the bigger expectations in Timothy Weah, like mm-hmm. pretty yeah, easily. 100%. Like Timothy Weah was like viewed as a potential national team guy, but like Sargent was like the can't miss. He's gonna be the the Robin to Christian Pulisic Batman at the 2022 World Cup. Like that was kind of what the whole yeah. thought was. So it, with with Norwich, it's been and here's a replay finally. So this started with a press. Oh. That was, I think, more of a bad pass than a good press. <laughs> that was a very horrendous pass. But those are the moments you have yeah. to take advantage of. Yeah. Um, and real quickly with Sargent, like, he that's something that he knows that – so when Norris got relegated, I was asking around, like, is he going to try to stay in the Premier League or go to another top flight division? Like, does, is he somebody who doesn't really mm-hmm. want to be in the championship? And it was not like he likes Norris. He, he likes the club. He feels settled, like – as long as they give him kind of assurances that he'll be able to play center forward rather than yeah. on the wing, like he'd, he'd love to stay there. So they had kind of meetings to start the off season. Like this was, this was planned rather than like when Werder Bremen got relegated, he kind of wanted yep. to move on from there. 
So I think that that's, again, Charlie was talking about it before with Reyna. Like, that's that's good personal growth. That's knowing kind of what you need. That's why, like, Pepe being open to going to Groningen, like a mid-table or lower-table Dutch team, isn't exactly what we were talking about when um, all of these clubs were being linked with him when he was at Dallas. But, again, like, mm-hmm. having that self-knowledge and knowing that, hey, I need the minutes, I need the reps, I need, you know, all of this for my development, I think is positive. Mm-hmm. Is it too early for us to speculate that, like, you know, perhaps Ricardo Pepe wasn't ready for that move to Europe, that maybe he should have? It's pretty spe- clear. I mean, like, is that, like, is that fair? Or or is it one of these where it's like you have this opportunity, you take it, you know? Like, and there's, and the growth that you will experience, yeah, it may not show up immediately, like, but in the long term, maybe it was the best thing. But is it, you know, I just have to think that he could have benefited from a little more seasoning. Well, I just think it was the wrong club. Yeah. So is that more the issue then? It's, yeah. It's more on his advisors okay. and, and himself. I mean, as a player, you're going to bet on yourself in, in most situations. You'll say, mm-hmm. Oh, if this is how they play. And this is, it's a relegation battle. I bet on myself to, to succeed mm-hmm. and I'll make this team, you know, I'll put this team on my back and score all these goals. Yada, yada. Mm-hmm. But ultimately you look at Josh Sargent as an example, and he was at a bigger club. If you're not playing in, in on the front foot and have most most of the possessions and create chances, and you're fighting relegation, it is just a def- you're just defending the entire mm-hmm. time, and it's all about a fight. And that's not Ricardo Pepe's game. So you, you didn't put him in a in a place to succeed, really, in, in terms of a young player getting opportunities and, yeah. and you know having having chances to to score. So. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like Ricardo Pepe, he's 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 got the ability, he's got the quality, he's just of not course. there yet. And get with yeah. his departure, allowed Jesus Ferrer to to thrive. Mm-hmm. I think it's a little bit of both that you know maybe he wasn't quite ready, but also I understand why you take that chance. Like uh, when Dallas, absolutely, and, like Dallas were firmly wanted to keep him for another year. Like that was mm-hmm. their plan. Like unless they got blown away with these bids, and when these bids were coming in, I think right before Augsburg had a bid accepted, there was one that came in from Wolfsburg that was, you know, really large. I think it was like 16 or 17 million. Um, and they they were up in the air. They left it on the table to, to kind of consider it further. And Ricardo Pepe's father went to the went to the front office, went to his, uh, technical director, Andre Zanota, and, and the rest of the staff and said, look, like, our family is one of opportunities. Like, you can't promise us that this opportunity is going to be there in six months or 12 months. Like, he has to go. He has to mm-hmm. take this opportunity. So mm-hmm. again, like I understand it from that. I'm sure that he got a big pay raise in, in the move to Augsburg. Of All of these things play into it. Um, but, but Charlie, like you said, maybe it wasn't the right club. Um, but again, I don't, I don't, I don't blame him for, for doing it. I don't, I don't blame him for trying. Yeah. As a young player, it's, it is, it's one of those where it's like, you just don't know when those opportunities are going to, to come around and you take them. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can't, I, I don't, I don't blame him, but, uh, it's just been so frustrating. There was such, so mm-hmm. much excitement. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I mean, Drask on, uh, MLS, our, our Twitch chat here, he says being a center forward in a team that's never going to give you service seems like such a nightmare. And Fair. I would say that Josh Sargent would agree. So like, yeah, that's <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Guys, you've been great in the chat. Thank you so much uh, for everybody that is uh, participating and hanging with us, even though this has not been um, (laughs) the most enticing match to watch. We're very grateful. We're still having fun. Hi. (laughs) Did you just hear Stu Holden? What is I did hear that. He goes, if you're a fan at home watching, you're you're just hoping that they give you something here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yep. Uh, one of Pretty the much, Stu. I'm in. I picked up on my phone to see. It's at least better than the Japan game, but overall still pretty bad. Not that close to scoring, but still allergic to scoring. Uh, still still, still allergic to, uh, to scoring. We also have... Um, Nikhil on the YouTube chat has says that uh, Saudi has made some subs and they have brought on um, a lot of their better players. So I don't know what that means. We'll see if they bring a little bit more pressure here, but we're in the 60, 70th minute, just about kids. Hmm. 
it's a great watch if you're a Matt Turner fan. Hashtag and any revs from David Tompkins. It's a good. That's a good spin. We're we're looking for positivity here. I think that's smart. We always try to keep it positive, even though I've had my moments today. <laughs> They're really, really testing me. And Charlie is like the most positive person I know. Yeah, so and I, I felt I felt like filling in for Doyle. I had to come in with with a dark cloud. A little, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> although you don't have cats, Tom. So that's true. You know, we could have done with a a cameo from Taquito, but it's okay. I have my, my dog. I think he knows when when I watch sports. He, um, I was like watching the Giants game last night. He was very, uh, oh, he was ready <gasps> for for outbursts, and oh god, and I think was ready to go into the other room. That's what he yeah. did today. Charlie, where's Nala? Oh my gosh. Um, she's, she's chilling on, on the rug. She's, she, likes, she just like lies around baby girl. Yes. Okay. Mark McKenzie with the giveaway and Turner again, but that, that Perry almost went right into the path of the yeah. Saudi Arabian winger. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Charlie, you were, um, singing the praises of Mark McKenzie saying that he should have gotten, uh, the opportunity to be in the starting 11 today. Outrunner mm -hmm. on the MLS Twitch chat. He says, Mark McKenzie just ain't it. Is that, I feel like, is that unfair? Uh, or are we just kind of throwing our hands up in the air at this point? Well, yeah. I mean, he, he comes on as a substitute and is just too casual for, <laughs> yeah. for my liking at, at that in possession. You know, he wants to come in and kind of establish that he's mm -hmm. confident and, and has grown and he's not going to panic and rush. But th that works against you in this in this situation because of how the U.S. is playing and how this game has gone. Mm -hmm. So. Now center back should be saying, I'm playing it right into the channel. I'm playing long diagonals. I am playing quick. I'm playing through the lines. We're not taking time. That's where Tom was talking about the urgency early mm -hmm. on. Play play like you need to win this game. Oh, thank you. Yes, that's that's what's upsetting to me. Charlie, I know you and I I I know the type of player that you were. And like you would have been if you had not started this match, you would have been there like, put me in. I am like ready to go to war right now. Like, let's oh, just, in. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it tire. just doesn't seem, it just like, I'll talk about it. smiley like, put up too. That's perfect. That's what I mean. Like we need a team of Charlie Davies out there. Like it's just, there. there's just something missing. There's just this like instinct that's like sort of killer instinct that's missing. Um, Rahul Kumar on the YouTube chat, he says, what's most frustrating is you never feel like the U S is going to score. And that is a hundred percent true. Like yeah. I don't see, they're just not generating anything. Um, and that's, it's, it's just so frustrating. It's so disappointing. Go back to the last game of world cup qualifying against Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. They just lack ideas and, and execution. Mm -hmm. So, it, I don't, should we be shocked? Because it, it, we haven't seen any improvement. Yeah. And you thought playing in this window, Saudi Arabia and Japan, I, I was underwhelmed. I think most people are underwhelmed. We were hoping to see an Argentina, a Brazil. Oh, my a, gosh. A, a France, a, a Belgium. Some of the top teams in, in the world in terms of FIFA rankings that are really going to put you under pressure, really test this group. So from that standpoint, I thought, okay, Japan, Saudi Arabia, maybe they are, are more similar and, and comparable to an Iran, to mm -hmm. a Wales. Fine. I want to see us, us clearly dominate and, and have a lot of chances, whether we win five, zero or one, zero. Yeah. I just want to see those plays happen and, and our, our ideas and our vision there's zero. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Michael Garabedian. Oh, our good friend. We love him. He says no identity. And Charlie, you said that earlier. Like there just really seems to be, this team seems to be lacking um, any sort of identity. I think that is, uh, that's true. Ooh, Gunnar Wes in uh, the Twitch chat. Tim Ream might be it. And I will say I have been a, a Tim Ream critic in the past. I may or may not have said some nice things about him in the past because um, he's had some moments, but I'm not actually opposed to that. 
Tim Ream getting the call up. This, this is the thing. Like, like with with some other players in in this group or that could be in this group. Mm-hmm. John Anthony Brooks is another one. Tim yeah. Ream. If you're going to play a certain style that would benefit them, which is sit back, defend. If mm-hmm. teams drop off, you can allow your two center backs who are good on the ball with distribution to make the game. That's fine. As long as yeah. you don't play a high line with those two as your center back pairing, mm-hmm. you you they they will be difficult to beat, especially in the air. John Brooks, Tim Ream, we've seen him in the Premier League playing against Liverpool. He puts himself in good he puts himself in good positions tactically. Yeah. He knows he knows his strengths. He knows he's not he gets pulled to the to the touchline, he's going to get beaten. He doesn't have pace, mm-hmm. but he does have a brain. He's smart. He can anticipate plays and he's good on the ball. There's there's a reason why he's the captain of Fulham and there's a reason why he's playing every week in the English Premier League, which is the best league in the world and he's facing the best attackers in the world. But if you're playing a high line, you're not setting setting him up to succeed and he will get burnt. Same with John Anthony mm-hmm. Brooks. What I've seen in these two games is a system where John Anthony Brooks and Tim Reeve would excel. Mm-hmm. When teams drop off and they're not playing in behind, yes, allow those two to make the game. They can ping balls. They're great at pitch, uh, pinging those long switches, playing into the channels. They can do all of that. They can organize. You're talking about leaders saying, this isn't good enough. Let's switch it up. They're, they're not afraid to speak their mind. Yep. But – that's not the way Greg Berhalter wants to play. And so therefore <sighs> he's taking them out of the equation. They're not even, you know, you could say they're not even being considered because they yeah. would be in this camp. At least, at least Tim Ream, because he's playing every week. John oh Anthony Brooks yeah. is not. Also Malik yeah. Tillman and Brendan Aronson in for McKinney and Pulisic here. So things are changing. And, and Aronson is the one playing centrally with Tillman out wide. I've been curious to see where the national team views Tillman's best position because he can play in a lot of different positions and they list him, listed him as a midfielder rather than a forward. Usually the guys mm-hmm. listed as forwards are playing as wingers. And we're getting too deep here, but him coming in on the wing with Aronson in the middle. Is, uh, oh, he plays in that role point. With, with Rangers. Huh? He plays in that, that left wing role yeah. with, with Rangers. Yeah, that's why I was confused that they listed him as a uh, oh, good run from Dest. Oh, hey! Okay. Scott, oh, are you flat footed? Okay, no. I know. Come on. Oh. Come on, son. Oh, no. That wasn't it. Uh, yeah, that's why I was just kind of confused <laughs> that they listed him as a midfielder. And again, maybe that's just me looking too much into the positional stuff. But Oh, boy. That's pretty good. That was a little better. Like. That was, be- that was, that was all right. That was, that was better. We <laughs> Let's see what they got here. Come on, Brendan. Good ball. Wow. Good transition defense. So best case scenario, guys, let's say, let's just say that uh, the U.S. are, they find a goal somewhere. Maybe it's off a set piece. I don't know. Maybe it's on a counter, whatever. They find a goal in this game. Say they're able to win this one, one nil. Charlie, at the beginning, we were like, yeah, I'll take it. Like, totally. Uh And now I'm kind of like, I, I, I'm just, I don't know. I think the, the totality of this game has been. A win pretty is not disa- going to do anything. Pretty disappointing. A win in this match will not do anything. Yeah. People expected a, a win, but mm-hmm. I think realistically the result wasn't important. It was is the patterns of play and, and the connections on the pitch and the ideas and, and the, the ability to threaten a Saudi Arabian team, which we haven't really. They've had the best chances. They've, they've had the best chances. They've been... It, in the, in the most dangerous situations. And mm-hmm. that, the, that's going to sit with everybody watching mm-hmm. this game. Con- especially considering you're coming off a rebound game where you just got pummeled by yeah. Japan and you, you expect, okay, <sighs> time to turn on. Now this isn't, we we're not in cruise control that nothing. We're not taking anything for granted. And this is, this is what we get. Preach Charlie, preach Charlie. 
This is, I listen. I need Charlie to uh, get in front of this, this whole team in the locker room. <laughs> I, I will give them a pump up speech. I, tell you. I know you would. I you have given me pump up speeches before, and like it has it has helped. Let me tell you, to be on the receiving end of that man it makes a difference. Anders knows. Oh, that's a really great delivery. Anders oh. knows that pump up ability. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. On uh, that chance and the one that they kind of flubbed from with six. Oh my god. That, that was perfect. Saudi Arabia have created the best two chances in this game. 100%. That one and the one in, uh, in the first half. That's really disappointing. 100%. Ariola lost his mark. Oh, my God. All right, y'all. We got, we got 10 minutes. 10 minutes left in this match. Um <clears throat> What uh, what are we hoping for? Like, what what could happen? What are positives that could happen in the next ten minutes? Outside of a, you know, just beautiful scoring chance for the U.S. and putting it in the back of the net. That's that's about it. That's, that's about, about it. it. <laughs> like it's like I, but like, but even then, like I'm still gonna walk away from this yeah. thing. Like, ugh. like yeah. I don't feel great. I don't feel great. And I hate that. That's how I, after the Japan match, I was like, well, at least there's, you know, another game to like, yeah, get this yep, like bad yep. taste out of my <laughs> mouth. And now I'm like, oh, no. Like, this just isn't, this ain't it. This Offside ain't it. Referee. I've always said with, with a national team, less is more. Mm -hmm. Simplify things. Mm -hmm. Don't get it. Don't make it uh, so difficult to 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 play in, in a in a unique system that most players maybe don't play with in, in their clubs. Oh my gosh. <sighs> and so we 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 look at this 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 team and I say what's our strengths? You look at Yunus Musa, Christian Pulisic, Jill Reyna, attacking players, not players that typically thrive on just running, it's yes. more about getting the ball and playing quickly, and they can beat their players one v one. But it's more of the short bursts, and not and not so much the long bursts. So, how do we set this team up to to play at their best while also keeping a solid foundation? Mm -hmm. And we don't we haven't we haven't had a nine yet that said you know I'm going to score the goals for this team. Just rely on me to score, not necessarily having to. to you know, defend first because mm -hmm. typically you don't think of strikers and think of their defensive abilities first. You think of, are they scoring goals one and then, okay, hold up play. Do they create space for others? Can they create space for themselves running the channels, those things. And then if those aren't working, how do they still may have an impact in the game? And that's when you can yeah. think about, okay, defensive, how do they press? How do they make it predictable for everyone behind them? And, and those qualities that, make you a well-rounded striker uh, other than scoring goals, which is the main objective as a nine. And I don't know if this, after watching a whole world cup qualifying campaign and, and now seeing where we are now, uh -huh. clearly this system is not working for this <sighs> young group, you know, not to say that it couldn't work in the future, four years down the line, if they continue to do this. But I think at the moment it's just too complicated. I don't want to hear about 2026. Like, I'm, yeah, even, like, no, I know. Neither, neither do I. But like, I'm this just is, saying right I know. now, would you like, say that this system, after having no. the, the whole cycle be with Greg Brawler, would you say they get it, they understand no. it, and, and they're playing to the best of uh, of that system's uh, capability? No. 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 I mean, does I is it as I, like does it, should Greg Berhalter just be should he be a little more open minded should he be a little more flexible i mean we always talk about like especially like in mls it's like the best coaches the coaches that get the most out of their guys are the ones where like the guys know exactly what their role is on the on the team they are empowered um and it just it, it, it a lot of times with this system it feels like it's like square pegs round holes you know mm -hmm. like it's just and 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 he's forcing it and yes, but I would say the players do know 
their roles. But they don't have enough time. They don't have enough, yeah. you know, you get these, these, these windows and you don't have a ton of time to play with each other and figure out these roles. And it just seems like yeah. it's, it's being forced right now. And it's not, it's not working. Like, I mean, we're watching it. It's not working. It's very frustrating. <laughs> uh, Gunnar West in the Twitch chat. The X Psy stats on this Twitch are record breaking. That's, that's, that's up there for comment of the day. What, what happened, Tom? The X Psy stats on this Twitch are record breaking, <sighs> and that caused me to lean away from the microphone while you guys were speaking because I might have there might have been some ambient noise coming from me from the frustration. <laughs> well, listen, I think we're entitled. It has been. It's been incredibly frustrating. Um, leave. Okay, there, we've got a, a question in the YouTube chat from Levi Edvilson. Thank you. And I did miss your question earlier, and I'm very sorry. I apologize. I'll get to it right now. Um, but I want to ask Charlie Davies this because he wanted to know about um a guy like yeah. Eric Williamson who I know you love Charlie Davies, Eric Williamson. I do. Um, is, is he somebody that could potentially make this squad and be a difference maker at any point? I think he could make the squad. Mm -hmm. I think what's working against Eric Williamson is he's just getting into his, his, his best right now. It's yeah. taken a long way, a long time from his injury. And that's normal going in and yeah. out of, out of form and, and figuring out your body taking the right that the, the necessary time to recover but also push yourself i'd say over his last oh. four games you're starting to see okay this is the eric williamson that we we know and oh yeah and we mm -hmm. and we appreciate with this group he is he's not going to play over tyler adams he's not going to play over west mckinney he's not going to play over Eunice musa he's not going to play over brian aronson or Gio Reyna if if Gio Reyna's fit i could see him being useful if there's an injury and you bring him in, but he's not going to be an impact player in this, in this team. It's, it's far too late in the process. You mm -hmm. know, if, if we had another year before the world cup, you could say, okay, I could see Eric Williamson maybe making uh, his way into the first team and given the opportunity, maybe he excels, but it's, it's almost too little too late. And it, mm -hmm. time's working against Eric Williamson, even though, I, I love I love the player he is and, and, and the person. Ugh. Stu Holden <laughs> just said he's like some of the reaction that he's seeing is like, well, are we are we glad is it a good thing that we're getting punched in the face now? Rather than and I'm saying no, no, it's never it's never good to get punched. We, we got punched in the face in the World Cup qualifying. Yeah. Uh, on the on the road. Uh, yeah. The last no. game against Costa Rica. That's that's all the punch you need. You don't need yeah. any more punches. No. Have yet to score a goal from open play. Stu Holden from the words of Stu Holden. And that is um yeah, this is it's it's troubling. It's troubling. Which goes I will tell you, I'm the listening. System. The Fox crew are as as uh, Debbie Downer ish as we are. So just <laughs> okay. <laughs> misery, misery loves company. <sighs> oh boy. Yeah, this just this isn't this is not good. This is not what we wanted to see. I felt like I really felt going into this match, guys, that like there needed to be there needed to be progress and there needed yeah. to be a, a a positive result. And a nil nil draw against Saudi Arabia is not it. With very, what what did we have? Two shots on target? Two today? It's got to be because we we made a point of celebrating them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> two. It's seven shots, two on target. Seven oh shots, two on target. God. Like, <laughs> and both shots were pretty much straight at the goalkeeper. And yeah. Saudi Arabia has nine with two on target. And the one, with, and both that they didn't put on target were six yards out. Two of them. I mean, so Thrask this on the Twitch, Twitch chat, he says, "A huge, where where did the goals come from?" I feel like we have been asking this question for the last like year, basically. It's like, where do the goals come from? Where does the chance creation come from? I think where does the chance the... creation come from? Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, exactly. Like, we know that like Jesus Ferrer can finish. We know that Pepe has the capability of finishing, but like, they have no service. 
it could be one of those moments where you just say, this isn't working for this group and we're going to change the system. But, but at, without any games before the World Cup now? I know. Like, what Like what do you do? This is such a hard situation because they're not going to have the opportunity to try out anything new. I mean, this is literally going to be like, brutal. throw your hands up in the air. Like, literally prayers up. Like, prayers up. <laughs> that's where I'm at. Honestly, that's where I'm at. Um, guys, just a reminder for everybody that's uh, tuning in right now, we are going to do a little bit of a, a post-match um, post-mortem. I guess you can call it that. Um, so if you want to stick around, feel free to join us. I think, you know, there's not going to be a whole lot of good things to talk about, but. Just going to be a lot of sighing. Little little vent sesh, if you will. <laughs> <sighs> That there, that was it. I just sighed. <laughs> All right, cut. Send it. Send it to the site. Put it up. Put it on the <sighs> social. That, that's the post game analysis. That is. That is my post game analysis right there. That's it. Yeah, that's we'll all keep, you need we'll to know. We'll keep this one short and sweet. I think so. I think. I yeah. think that is the move, Chuck. Oh my goodness. I mean, what is Greg Berhalter going to say after this? You know, like we he he put the he put the blame on himself. Um, after the Japan match, like, is he going to do the same thing? Like, I mean, this is pretty, this is pretty damning. Like it's, you're trying to get your team ready for the biggest tournament in the world. And you show up this flat for the final tune-ups before it. Like, I just, I don't know. I, I don't know what he, it'll be very interesting to hear what he's going to say. Yep. Yeah. Are you mad at the players? Are you mad at Greg? <laughs> like where, where, where do I, where do I, where do I, where do I, where do I focus my my frustration? This is like where where am I going? The the players, you you can't ever excuse the players. Yeah. And put it all on them. Mm-hmm. They've been yeah. disjointed. They mm -hmm. they haven't been put. They haven't been put in. I think the right system to get the most out of these young players. Yeah, you know, they're good enough playing in a in a system that hasn't really fit them, and they've yeah. still been, managed to get to a World Cup. Great, but I I, I think it's great tackle. It's it's not. It's just not working. And so, I think tactically, it it falls on the coach. Mm -hmm. But then the players, when you have nobody on you and you pass the ball to the other team. That, that's not the coach's fault. When you play, pass the ball out of bounds, that's not the coach's fault. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of it has to do with the quality too from the players today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, there's not one person that can say, you know what? I, I had a great game. And I, I mean, and I, did, I did me. Matt Turner's still playing with the ball at his feet. He's gave, given the ball away and it put his teammates in some bad positions and he's given the ball away too. So he's not perfect. What you want from your goalkeeper is shot stopping. You know, we spoke to Tim Howard yesterday and Timmy was saying, just, I would say I'm playing long. Like we're, we're going to be playing long. That's it. And we're going to drop deep or we're going to push and stay compact, but we're not, uh, it's not working for us. And mm -hmm. there's nobody on the pitch that's saying Greg might want us to do this, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm telling us right now we're getting into a group huddle quick. We're changing. We're, we're yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go higher or I'm gonna come deeper. You're gonna come deeper, whatever it is to get this team going. We're not seeing that. And mm -hmm. and yeah, it's it's disappointing. It, that's just how it is. So you just hope I'm hoping, I'm hopeful that things will get better mm -hmm. yeah. before the World Cup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I I think that this particular the last two managers, I, I think reminds me of what we're missing from the Bob Bradley era, which was it, everything was kind of designed around Dempsey and Donovan. Yeah. Like the system was, all right, how do we get our best players in their best situations? And I think that that's been lost both under Klinsman and Berhalter. So I yeah. mean, I know that that doesn't do a ton of good right now when we're talking about what happens going next, but I don't know. I think that that should help for anybody who forgets what Bob Bradley did with the national team or even Bruce mm -hmm. Arena before that, rather than just, the fact that he couldn't rescue that 2018 World Cup qualifying cycle. So, yeah, good little history. 
Oh man, is there anything positive? Nick Dunbar wants to know, is there anything, any any glimmer of uh, positivity? Uh, yes, yes. What is it? That this is not a World Cup game. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna say that the final whistle is <laughs> That the final whistle is imminent. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. That, that, that this just, I think this just puts it on Greg to think outside the box and no matter how, how much you've trained in this system and, and that's kind of been what you've preached for the team for the past you know, two years, mm-hmm. may, maybe now's the time to change some, some things. Maybe it's mm-hmm. the, from, from being a high pressing team to we're going to defend now, we're going to sit lower and we're going to look to counter and try and find some of our better players in open space in behind uh, the the midfield line in those low blocks and try and wow. expose them that way. That, I think at this point, you just have to reevaluate everything. Not that yeah. you have to change, but you got to reevaluate everything. You got to reevaluate everything with less than two months before this team is going to be. And what a week time. of training <laughs> and a week of training. Mm-hmm. I mean, to me, this is, um, yeah, this is pretty, this is so, this is very worrying. And I, I want to go back to, I mean, at the beginning, I mean, somebody had said in the YouTube comments, they were like, you know, your expectations of this team are too high. And I think like there, we've had moments over the past year where we were able to get really excited about what we were starting to see, especially last summer with, you know, winning two finals against Mexico, especially the, um, like with a B team basically like out on, on the field. And so I think that it did inevitably expectations get a little bit loftier at that stage. And you say, Oh, they're playing in games of importance they're playing games of matter. And they're able to get these results and find ways to win. And it just seems like since then, like we kind of, we were like, okay, this is a team that it is at least going to be competitive and can, can qualify for world cup and, and potentially get out of the group. And now it's like, I, Charlie, you said it, it was like, we've taken, so many steps backwards since those moments and it just I'm with less than two months again it just doesn't feel like there is enough time to kind of write this ship right now I'm just I'm hopeful I'm going to stay hopeful because that's in my nature (laughs) and anything can happen at a world cup we know that but I'm just yeah this is not this is not how I wanted to feel um after this there's no, there's After no support. There's no support for the nine, no matter mm-hmm. who it's been. Mm-hmm. Ferreira, mm-hmm. Sergeant, Pepe. You can play P. Fuck anybody. There's just not enough with the nine, which begs the question: Do you play a two striker system, a withdrawn mm-hmm. striker, or two, two out and out strikers? Maybe because right now there's nothing, and at least you'd have a an opportunity where one goes, one checks, and you you always have that. Mm-hmm. to kind of be your, your fulcrum when you're yeah. attacking and then your outside backs can can kind of just be, be a pendulum as as the ball shifts from one side to another at least you'll have more options because right now it's just one up there and it's yeah and you look at all our options none of them are uh, a phenomenal holdup player none of them are super strong they can hold off two center backs let alone one so at this point maybe you you, you have to think about playing with two strikers because in, in the attacking third, you don't have anything. You're hoping for mm-hmm. set pieces at this point or a mistake from a, a bad pass from a defender to give you a, a 2v1 or, or some of those situations. So it, it it's lacking right now, and we're not we're not finding any answers to, 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 to these problems that we're having. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tom, yeah. gut reactions. How you feel? Like like I said, I think this whole post game show is just going to be like a little, a little like therapy sesh, a little event yeah. sesh. Yeah. Um, it's, it's defeating. Like what Charlie yeah. just said. I, I like I expand on. We didn't get any answers. We didn't. We didn't learn anything new. We didn't. We didn't get anything overly positive at all. That's two games where the attack was impotent. Like yeah. it, it, it was just brutal. Like nothing was being generated through the press. Nothing was being generated through possession, nothing being generated going direct. It was, they did, particularly in this game, I thought against Saudi Arabia, they, they tried numerous different ideas of how to attack and none of them looked good. When was the last none time we saw good. Christian Pulisic at his best for the national team? When was the last yeah. time we saw Gio Reyna at his best for more than, you know, a, a cameo against Mexico for the national team? When have we, like, Weston McKinney was in the form of his life before he got hurt 
against Juventus in the uh, for Juventus in the winter. Um, it, it's just been a, like Serginho Des since uh, one of his recent goals. Like it's almost like I think that there was good work that happened against Morocco and Uruguay. Mm -hmm. And you know that's not even to say of, of the Nations League games that I, I kind of already discarded because they weren't against World Cup quality opposition. And whatever good that we got from that June window, completely out the window right now. This is it, it was. It's hard to over, or to un overstate how truly bad these last 180 minutes were. Again, I, w I wish that there was more positive to take away. Charlie hit it right. The only positive is that these weren't World Cup games. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yep, yep, yep. Greg Berhalter is currently talking to Jenny Taft right now. Said, literally just saying, well, you know, it was tough for our strikers because they didn't get much service, which is what we had been saying all along. His message to the team is uh, he doesn't want this. He he wants this team to just um, you know kind of put this behind them, be at ease, like don't have don't have the the nerves. Um, but he he said he can't fault the effort from this mm. team, and I'm kind of thinking, yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> like I watched the whole thing, and I think I can kind of fault yeah. Yeah. the effort. Yes, I, I can. I, I, like I honestly like they'll they'll do game tape on this. They'll they'll break it down. But like there there might be an argument for just let's move on for this. There was there was yep. not a lot to take away from this. We'll call it a bad a bad week or, or however long they've been together. Um, yeah. Which again is not ideal. But for me, I I don't <sighs> really know what you're gonna get out of this. Okay, I'm gonna um I'm gonna. It's switch it around november november 9th is when the 26 man roster is going to be announced for the world cup um having you know based on the last two matches that we have just watched um is there anybody that you think that was not you know maybe m not called up to this camp but like needs to be needs to be on that roster for for a chance that for this team to have any kind of hope of getting out of a group stage like who are the who are the kind of x factors i guess Musa well, and Waya. i'm gonna let i'm gonna Musa let charlie go because i know he's got a, about two thousand words on this but it's Musa yeah and Waya. what i what i would say is we didn't put enough stock into what a out of confidence christian pulisic looks like yeah what, what someone who a christian pulisic isn't in form and playing because that makes a big difference if christian's thriving at Chelsea and he's playing every week, he comes in sharp. He comes in motivated. He's he's more involved in the attacking third. There's times where he's dropping so deep trying to look for the ball to, to try and create the game because he's yeah. trying to find it because the the striker is on, is on an island. They have nothing. No matter how many runs Ricardo Pepe made, he wasn't getting the ball. They weren't even looking up. They were so con uh, concerned with pass a, a five-yard pass. Yeah. And I look at the center backs, they, they get on the ball, they sit there, they look, they wait, they look, they wait, then they play a five-yard ball. What? Who are you moving? It, mm -hmm. What opposition are you moving with that five-yard pass? You make it easy. We're making it easy. We're making it predictable. People can read everything we're doing. There's nothing creative. There's nothing yeah. that would, would cause you to say, oh, I'm getting out of my seat for this. Like I, I can't wait for this attacking play. There's energy and a liveliness to it. It's not. It looks methodical. It looks boring. That's what is really eating at me right now because I watch every game with this burning fire when I when I watch the U.S. Men's National Team, and when it's great, I'm pumped up. When it's bad, yeah. I'm I'm really I'm really low because I care that much. And when I watch this group, I know how much potential they have, and they're not yeah. playing anywhere near it. Mm -hmm. And so. Yeah, there, there's a lot. I think Christian out of form. I think uh, obviously Brandon Aronson not really having a position in this in this team because yeah, you know Timo Weah has has really I think locked down that right spot because of yeah. what he offers because he's so different and you can see that they're missing that player. Uh, Gio Reyna has been injured, so that's another thing. But Yunus Musa is so important in this group. And the fact that he's now playing in that central role at, at Valencia has is, is only going to help him with the U.S. men's national team. That's why I was so excited for him yeah. to be back with this group and not be injured. So that's a big blow. And then we just saw how important Anthony Robinson is yeah. to, the, to this team because Serginho Dust can't play left back. 
He can't. He comes yeah. inside every single time. And then when he comes inside, he leaves this big gaping hole on, on, the, on the left side where teams are looking to punish you. They see it every time. And if you lose the ball ever, because you can't be perfect in mm. possession, when you do lose it, that's the first place they hit you. Yeah. And and he's not a, a great defender to begin with in the first place. So, yeah, there, there's a number of, of issues, but I, I'd say those are the biggest ones. Yeah, I think uh, I think you kind of nailed it, Charlie. Um I don't know. I just overall, it's this is it. It just feels really deflating. Um, mm -hmm. It's unnerving. I know it's not the way that I, I can see how much Charlie cares. I know that about him. I know how much he cares and and um, is invested in this team. And it's just, yeah, it's just you know, it's a bummer. It's a bummer because we all wanted to. We all want to feel good about it. Um, I haven't lost all hope. This was not a World Cup match, as Charlie pointed out. Um, but it's going to be really interesting. It's going to be really interesting to see if Greg is uh, going to kind of step outside the box, perhaps, um, and kind of look to make some some changes, whether that be, you know, roster moves or uh, formations. Um, I just think that this this isn't this isn't it. This can't be good enough, Tom. Like it's just not. No, you use the word defeating. That's perfect. The the, the lower third right now on the screen, uninspiring draw. Like these are words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that compl like perfectly delineate the feeling and, and just the deflating the size like that's mm -hmm. the visceral reaction to this. Th there wasn't a lot of. All right. Well, there was a couple bad moments or, or hey, maybe this was an individual breakdown. It was just the entire thing. There wasn't chances created. There, there, Saudi Arabia could do mostly whatever they want. Like the United States had more possession, but that's yeah. kind of what Saudi Arabia wanted. Possession, them to do. Yeah. Possession, yeah. Possession, I mean, possession doesn't matter. Possession is saying. completely it, irrelevant. Yeah. It, it, it was, it was the United States did not dictate the game on their terms. Like no. what Japan did to the United States, the United States should have done to Saudi Arabia. Um, it's, it was too easy. It was, it just wasn't enough. It, it's really, really disappointing, deflating, uninspiring. I keep on going back to these words because there yeah. isn't a lot more to take away from that. Again, we can talk about tactics or whatever it is. It's just, it, it, like you said, just, it, it, it can't be like this. It can't yeah. be like this. No, it can't. And I really, really hope um, it isn't. <laughs> Ah, guys, um, I just want to thank everybody for um, hanging yes. out with us. Shout because out to everybody. Listen, you guys really hung in there. This was not the most fun match to watch, but um, we appreciate all of your questions and your comments um, and just for, for hanging out with us while this uh, match was going on. Um, a reminder to everyone, too, we're going to have an all-new episode of uh, Club and Country. Um, and it's going to be Weeby, Goss, Doyle. Charlie, I think you're on this one. Um, you're just gonna kind of, kind of, kind of wrap up the <laughs> wrap up this window. Not gonna be. Yeah. I mean, it might be more of the same. Honestly, I'm not gonna say that it's gonna be a real, you know, lighthearted uh, chat, but the pro definitely some good insight from from all of those guys. So um, you can find that on your extra time podcast feed and on YouTube. Um, but guys, thanks for thanks Thank for making you. this tolerable. It's always fun to spend time with both of you. And I'm glad that we, you know, at least we're together for this <laughs> fairly miserable experience. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, guys, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. And uh, yeah, we'll see you all very soon. You got it. Peace. <laughs>